Sup you sinister folks. This is what if Deku's cursed blood could you know reverse death part 10, chapter 27, sinister confrontation in the south wing of the Totoraki household, one Fuayami Totoraki could be found in her room stretched out on her bed, chewing on her bottom lip as she watched her little brother's participation in new a sports festival on the modestly sized television mounted on her wall. The peppermint-haired young woman felt a sinking feeling the longer the broadcast went on. The youngest Totoraki's behavior much different than she'd anticipated. Shito. Fuayami murmured sadly, eyes glued to the screen as she lamented what she was witnessing. What's happened to you? Didn't you say you'd never be like father? It really was worrying. While she hadn't known how Shito would take losing after a lifetime of it being drilled into him that he was the best, that he could. Never fail, Fuayami saw his actions in the second event, both before and after his team literally mutinied against him, as beyond frightening. Ordering his team to attack a clearly unknown threat while completely focused on his own goal? To completely shut down when those same teammates forsook his leadership? That wasn't Shido she'd seen. That was Endeavor. Fuayami broke her laser-like focus on the, television a slim hand absently finding its place right below her stomach. Was her family really cursed? Was this mania, this madness somehow genetic? Would, hey. The sudden baritone call made the troubled peppermint-haired young woman jerk in surprise. She'd been so focused on Chito. The abrupt reminder that she wasn't alone made Fuayami's stomach tingle. Hey. You okay? Did it work? Fuayami, chuckled unable to help herself. She honestly hadn't expected this when she'd asked for help, desperate and feeling so alone in the face of her father's depraved pursuit to topple all might. Who'd have thought for once, poor Fuayami, the weakest of her father's failures, would hit the jackpot and stumble upon someone with such a heart of gold. Someone who jumped to help her. Despite all the, ramifications of her request. Fuayami looked down glanced at the hand still on her lower stomach, then to the other one. More specifically, she examined what it held. For the hundredth time. Yeah. The peppermint-haired young woman whispered, suddenly feeling a surge of tears burning at the back of her eyes. Damn, she was getting overly emotional again. Yeah, it did. But. I, I think I should keep, it a secret. Just. Just for now. You know? Looking up, Fuayami realized she really couldn't see her visitor too well with the way the lighting in her room worked. A passing emo phase had brought pitch black curtains to her windows when she'd been younger, and she'd never found the drive to replace them after it had passed. As such, her room was pretty dark even in the middle of the day. I. C. R. You sure you're feeling alright? Don't hesitate to tell me. You know I'll get you anything you need. Fuayami rolled her eyes, a teasing grin stealing across her often harried face. She'd thought it would feel nice to be spoiled, but it'd soon come to her attention that instead she felt it was. Too different to enjoy. After a lifetime of being treated like a burden, an object only good for, bartering away, suddenly becoming the central focus of another was discombobulating. She felt out of place. A fraud. But, the peppermint-haired young woman supposed she should have expected such things to occur. Her guests had always been like this, worrying about others even when they swore they didn't need it. Being around her so much would of course only worsen such behavior. It's too early and, you know it, Fuayami said, snorting before squinting into the dim shadow cloaking her visitor. What? Are you feeling all responsible now? Yes. It was an odd feeling. Fuayami noted, to feel guilt gnaw at her stomach at the same time her heart traitorously fluttered in her chest. With a heavy sigh, the peppermint-haired young woman wondered how they'd suddenly gotten to this point. Her plan had, been simple. Her execution, while rushed, had gone off without a hitch. The rather, enthusiastic help of her friend had actually made it an unexpectedly enjoyable affair even. Now, she all she had to do was waiting until it was safe to act, when there was no going back. She'd tell her father that for once his plans would be for naught. For once, she'd escaped his grasp. Her. Fuayami. She'd even, 
saved up enough to rent a small apartment in the event she was kicked out or disowned for her disobedience. I know you said not to worry, that you'd handle things on your own but. I can handle everything on my own, Fuayami agreed, forcing a fair bit of false confidence into her voice. The longer this went on, the more she felt she'd falter if she didn't put her foot down with this. You really, don't need to further involve yourself with my troubles. The tall figure of her friend bent down, retrieving a pair of underpants Fuayami was embarrassed to remember she'd personally removed and sent flying only hours ago. For just a moment, the light of her bedside lamp glistened against something in the gloom. Oh, the bracers were on already. I don't like the idea of you doing this all alone, came the baritone reply. A quick shuffle, and toned legs slid into specially designed pants. I think. I think we should go somewhere and really plan for the future. That damn fluttering again. Where was this warmth coming from? She knew to expect care and concern, but had she really left that great of an impression in the six? Seven, oh fuck, ten times they'd met up? Fuayami felt her face catch, fire as she remembered more of what the two had done during those get-togethers. Maybe she didn't need to do this alone? Damn her volatile emotions. This was not the time to be a swooning schoolgirl. She'd expected some attachment, but this was ridiculous. So. What? Fuayami asked, pushing her quickly wavering resolve behind sarcasm and wit. Less drinking and more singing next time? Maybe let me, lead after? A solemn blue gaze met Fuayami's blustering turquoise. What was? I want you to meet my family. Fuayami froze, her breath caught in her throat. Her heart was all of a sudden a thundering in her chest. Everything had just gotten way more intense than she'd thought possible. She didn't even know how to respond to that. And why was her stomach fluttering so much? Was that normal? A large, hand clearly visible even in the dark of her room, reached out and placed itself on the hand she'd kept, even then, on her stomach. Oh, somehow between now and then the whole suit had come back on. Huh. I know it's sudden, but I really do want to stay by your side. Fuayami felt the telltale signs of a panic abruptly awaken and begin to claw at her insides, rising from constricting her chest to, filling her already overactive mind in seconds. The peppermint-haired young woman began to shake as the reality of what was being asked hit home. This wasn't the plan. A warm Fuayami was ashamed to admit she'd always been desperate for growing up enveloped the young woman as two solid arms wrapped themselves around her. And just like that, the panic snapped away like twine in the wind. All, because of a hug. A hug from. Fuck. It. It is sud sudden. Fuayami warbled through the tears she hadn't realized she'd been crying and the slowly easing shakes still racking her body. This. Was this what she had to look forward to for the next few months? Oh joy. I I I need time to prepare for something like that. You you can't just say stuff like th that out of the blue. Laughter. A rich. Deep laughter that vibrated through Fuayami and set her skin on fire rang through the air. The arms around her tightened once, twice, before releasing her. She couldn't deny she was sad to feel them go. The now fully suited hero stepped back and walked over to the room's balcony doors. Fair enough, the hero said, dipped a helmeted head. Standing tall, strong arms gently opened the balcony doors, out of sheer habit. How about this? The team and I have a mission in Hazu starting this afternoon, I'm actually headed there right now. When it's over, why don't I take you out, for real, and we talk? Good. That sounded good. Really good. Fuck there went her head again. Pull yourself together Fuayami, you were just going on about how you could do this all alone. Just because you were being, offered heartfelt love and care didn't mean you, oh okay, deal. You be careful out there okay? Fuayami froze as the words slipped out to a figure already waving and jumping over the balcony railing. She was already too far gone. Wasn't she? You're really lucky, you know that? Fuayami said, caressing her still flat belly with an honest smile. Looks like your daddy really is one of the good ones, better than I'd given him credit for anyway. 
as she got up to open her curtains and let some light in, Fuayami looked at the pregnancy test still in her other hand. Positive. The sight of it made her smile even brighter. Sure, she'd originally been happy enough that her rebellion had borne fruit, but now. Now the idea of finally being free of her father wasn't all she had to look forward to. For, once, Fuayami Totoraki was smiling at the idea of family, and the prospect of finding a new one. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. After somewhat recovering from having his impulsive proposal broadcasted for the world to see, Izuku had managed to straighten up and look around at those who'd remained after midnight had cleared those disqualified from the third event. This was it. The moment the green-haired boy had been dreading was coming. How would those bigots screw him over next? Now that those disqualified teams have left the stage, Midnight crooned as she sashayed across her podium while lying the expectant students below her, it's time to start the third and final round of the first year sports festival. That's right, it's the tournament, a bomb going off wouldn't have been loud enough to hear over the frenzied cheers that burst from the arena's stands. The gathered audience of civilian and pro hero alike had been waiting for this the entire time, the traditional tournament where the best of the best faced each other in combat. Children fought and bled to make their names known. All for the entertainment of the masses and the profit of us sponsors. Having been awakened to just what went on behind the curtain, Izuku had to say he honestly hated it now. While it was true that on the surface the tournament was still the talent showcase of power and skill that it had been conceptualized to be, closer examination revealed just how barbaric it had become. Over the years a clear pattern could be seen to have emerged to the discerning eye, only those with combat prowess were glorified, the heroic potential of all others was completely ignored. It wouldn't have been too difficult to add measures that would have given those with quirks that were mental based or better suited to rescue or support an equal opportunity to shine. For example, Class 1A's battle test earlier that semester would have been a perfect setup for this. If each competitor played like the other was the villain, and they were the hero who had to rescue civilians while fighting off an enemy, then the two could battle while still showing they could focus on what really mattered. Saving people. It would go a lot farther in proving one's heroic worth than just beating each other into the ground. That completely missed the point of being a hero, in the first place. Excuse me. The unexpected interruption almost caused Midnight to lose her momentum and stumble off her podium, the Ravnet caught completely blindsided by the shout. Quickly covering her near faux pas, the R-rated heroine looked down to see Jiro de Shishida with an arm raised straight into the air. I'm sorry, the gentlemanly beast of Class 1B said curtly, I hate to disappoint my classmates, but I do not feel it in me to further participate in the festival at this time. The formal declaration caused everyone present to reel in shocked surprise. Those from Shishida's class knew the animalistic teen was probably one of their most athletic and combat-ready members, the race hardly denting his incredible stamina and the team he joined barely making a strenuous effort to qualify, so they couldn't begin to understand why he was giving up now. Shikun. Why? Shiyazaki asked. The vine-haired heroine in training taking a step forward looking almost betrayed by the beastly teen's decision. Shishida turned, bodily facing his questioning classmate but found himself unable to return the forest green gaze penetrating his soul. Ibuchan I. Shishida visibly, struggled with himself. The animalistic hero in training snapped his head up, a smattering of gasps erupting as the young man's watery gaze finally met that of Shiyazaki. It's... It's a matter of honor. Please accept my decision and I swear I will explain myself later. Please. Shiyazaki looked as if she wanted to argue further, before thinking better of it and solemnly nodding to show her acceptance. Shishida sagged, his giant shoulders sloping in relief. What a passionate appeal. Midnight cut in, the 18 plus only heroine wrapping her arms around herself as she wiggled in place as if trying to contain herself at the display before her. I wish I could see more, but we don't have the time. Shishida has forfeited his place in the tournament, and will now exit the field. Doing as, Midnight said, 
Shishida turned his back on the gathered competitors and walked stiffly toward the tunnel leading out of the arena floor. The entire march, the beastly teen kept his back straight and chin up, a true display of integrity. Anyone else thinking of dropping out? Midnight asked, dropping her salacious act for a moment. There were no replies as the sixteen remaining students were too, busy watching the towering figure of the beastly teen walking away. As Shishida made his way out of the arena, Izuku tried to connect the dots, solve a puzzle he was missing pieces to. Unfortunately, all he could deduce was that the animalistic 1B member had been upset by something and most likely felt that his participation any further would be, as he left unsaid, dishonorable. For a split, second, Izuku considered dropping from the tournament too. The Verdanet had no desire to feed this ravenous audience's thirst for blood and violence, or to fill the pockets of sponsors who despised him. Hadn't he shed enough blood, sweat, and tears already? If he stopped now, maybe he could keep the extent of his abilities under wraps for a little bit longer, not have to face the fear and scorn, from all the idiots who'd be too stupid to understand the truth like he knew he would if he kept going. And hadn't he done a lot already? He'd won the first event through teamwork, like a real hero. He'd won the second by using his brain and trusting his team, like a real hero. He could be happy with just that. But even so. What? Is. Thy. Desire? The blood in his veins knew very well the true, desires of his heart. I want. Izuku paused almost hesitating to take that final step into fully committing to his path before stealing himself. Apostrophe. I want to prove them all wrong. Then. Fight. On. Realizing no one else was going to drop out, Midnight cleared her throat and turned everyone's attention back to the jumbotron-sized display that was still showing the faces of those moving on to the third event. Shishida's face had been shadowed out, leaving. Well, look at that. Sixteen competitors, just a perfect number to sort, Midnight exclaimed as the picture on the huge screen began to move. The faces of the remaining students faded away, leaving only their names. The names, flashing a bright yellow, began to scramble and shuffle horizontally, lines zigzagging into existence to form four distinct blocks of A, B, C, and D. Watching the display go on and on, Showing no signs of stopping, the R-rated hero grit her teeth before pasting on a smile and raising her mick again. It almost looks like it's trying to decide the best matchups, doesn't it? Midnight's words earned chuckles from the spectators, the civilians and pro-heroes both waiting anxiously to see who'd be pitted, against whom. In their press box, Eraserhead and present mick exchanged a grave look. Without a word. Aizawa leapt from his seat and darted out of the small room. Snapping forward, Hizashi whipped out a hand and clicked off the second mic before it could begin to broadcast static and feedback. The blonde nodded to himself as he didn't hear the cursed sound wailing from the speakers. He'd succeeded, in covering up his friend's departure. Back down in the arena, Midnight frowned as the Jumbotron board finally slowed down to display the brackets for the tournament. Immediately the Ravnet could tell something wasn't right. These matchups. Izuku Midraya Hitoshi Shinso Mashai Rao Ojiro I Barashi Izaki Mina Ashido Ojiro Kirishima Tenya Ida Testu Tetsu 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 Momo Yerazu Itsuka Kendo. Fumikaj Tokoi Ami Mai Hatsumo Kako Yor Erakit Sadasu Ishito Totoraki Kya Ukajiro Midnight wasn't the only one who reacted negatively to their revealed placements. Motherfuckers. Izuku screamed into the void of his mind. Growling, the Verdana failed to keep his thoughts entirely to himself, they're rigging the whole tournament. Being as close to him as they were, Su, Fumikaj, and Kyauka, heard the young necromancer's words just fine. Izukun? Karo, Tsu asked, concerned. The frog girl wasn't about to doubt her brilliant boyfriend, but what he just said was concerning to the extreme. Side by side, Kyauka and Fumikaj silently exchanged glances before turning back to their enraged friend. Seeing all eyes on him, the green-haired teen took a deep breath and laid out the truth, he just realized. There's a favorite in each block, Izuku said first, motioning up to the jumbotron screen. 
The matches are set so that these favorites have the best chance at getting to the finals and then, of course, winning the tournament. Kyauk gave a low whistle as she looked at the brackets. As much as she wished her friend were wrong, or at least just paranoid, upon closer inspection, the placements were more than a little suspect. Well, at least it wasn't just shitty luck on my part then, the punk rock girl quipped, noting who'd be her first and, likely, last match. Some nearly face palmed, only just holding on to her usual deadpan expression as she looked at the board again as well. Just like her musically inclined friend, it looked like she'd been pitted, against an emitter type to get rid of her as soon as possible. And even if the first match failed to eliminate her, there was no way she could even try to overcome Totoraki. At least, not without putting herself in serious danger. Any way she looked at it, the amphibian teen realized she'd been set up to fail. My friend. Fumikaj spoke up, worry evident in the avian teen's voice, pray tell. How should we combat the conundrum of these dark machinations? The raven-headed hero in training understood all too well the situation he and his friends found themselves in, especially as Yuku. Set up against an unknown, who if defeated led only to a match against either a martial artist or a member of their sister class who'd shown time and again she had an axe to grind against the young, necromancer. Even winning his block would just get his Yuku into more trouble. The other half of his division was full of heavy hitters from their class. He'd have to win against the likes of Kirishima or Rashido, and then most likely Ida, just to in all unfairness face Totoraki at the end. Against all of this, Izuku smiled, and it wasn't a cute grin at all. We're going to fight, that's what we're going to do, Izuku declared, deadly serious, I'm going to prove them wrong. And this time, I've got backup. The Emerald Necromancer turned and flashed two thumbs up to his undead partners, giving a faint nod at the girls. So the board wanted to bury the monster of UA well then they were going to need far more firepower, than the classmates he'd studied extensively since the first day of school if they wanted to even have a chance. Before the three around as Yuku could question the meaning of his words, Midnight cleared her throat once more and called for attention. Now that the brackets have been filled, the 18 plus only heroine began, a hand shooting up to her ear as if she were using a radio bead, wheel. Give our, 16 remaining competitors a chance to catch a second wind. Due to a few technical difficulties with a couple of drones, I uh, will be taking a full hour break anyway. We hope you understand. The announcement was surprisingly well received, both by the expectant audience and the tense students. With the third event so close, no one wanted to risk getting thrown out for bad behavior. You heard. The lady. Present Mick's booming voice blasted through the air, audible even beyond the limits of the stadium, TikTok people. Grab some grub, hit the john, you do but remember. Once the rumble starts there's no going back. With that rousing speech delivered, the voice hero slid effortlessly into a more subdued, for him, tone while making more normal announcements. Apparently there was a, white van that smelled like candy parked in a restricted zone in the parking lot that needed to be moved or else, the business students of classes 1i, j, and k would be setting up mock advertising booths for some of the students in the third event for the public to enjoy, and a new brand of all-natural melatonin was going on sale at Mujudafu General next week. Who knew? Madraya. The angry. Borderline enraged shout caused Izuku and his group to turn sharply toward its source. Shoto Totoraki was marching through the thinning students in the arena, his mismatched gaze burning with suppressed emotion. Yeah, what is it? Izuku asked as neutrally as possible. While the Verdana seemed to be uncaring in the face of the approaching heterochromatic, Su, Kyauka, and Fumikaj all shared looks of extreme upset at the idea of their repeated attacker stomping toward them with impunity. Especially since the scarred teen didn't look at all as if he were in the mood for apologizing. Soon it was too late, and their furious classmate was standing dangerously close to the emerald necromancer. We need to talk, Totoraki bit out, an air of finality to the words. There was no mistaking it. This was a demand, not a request. 
Minutes later, UA Sports Festival Stadium, Tunnel 3. When I said we I meant you and me. Alone, Totoraki nearly hissed as he glared at the greatest obstacle to achieving his goal he'd faced to date. The same obstacle now surrounded by quite the entourage. Yeah. Well, I wasn't about to push away my girlfriend, Izuku said sardonically, receiving an even, tighter hug to his right arm by a very protective Tsu. And it's not like I wouldn't just tell my friends whatever we talked about so. Kind of pointless to tell them to go away too. Totoraki's glare grew baleful at the flippant tone he was being shown. Not only was Madraya proving himself an obstacle, but he was disrespectful as well. Seeing he'd get no further reaction from the Verde net. The heterochromatic turned his glare to the undead trio. You got a problem punk? Saki quickly spat, the blonde glaring right back with an intensity Totoraki had never faced from someone not the bastard before. Unwilling to hold the fiery gaze, the scarred team turned instead to the one place he knew he could glare without reprisal. Tay's empty stare actually proved to be more than creepy enough to have Totoraki return his gaze to Madraya. My partners are a part of me, Izuku snapped, sounding as cold as the grave. I'd sooner rip off my own limbs than order them to leave me. Totoraki growled, realizing he wouldn't win the matter. Sighing, the heterochromatic team gave up, there wasn't enough time to convince the green-haired obstacle to face him alone now anyway. Fine, Totoraki, groused petulantly. The scarred teen closed his eyes, preparing for the reason he called this impromptu meeting. Then, Midraya. Are you the son of a villain or something? A second of stunned silence passed. What? Before breaking to the incensed shouts of those gathered. It wasn't that the accusation was completely out of the blue, which it was. It was that it was absolutely outrageous. Finding children with villainous parentage hidden away at hero schools wasn't exactly unheard of. But the mere idea Inka Madraya would have dated, let alone had a child with, a villain was absurd. There was a more feasible chance of seeing Endeavor attending a charity event dressed as a teddy bear. The fact that Totoraki could think so ill of the woman, however tangentially, was incredibly, insulting. Saki lunged forward, murder in her glowing scarlet eyes. The blonde was going to murder that half and half son. Izuku's hand whipped out and gently landed on the attacking zombie girl's head, stopping her cold. A few head pats were all it took to calm the delinquent back into a semi-non-homicidal state. Your efforts. Totoraki continued as if he hadn't almost been mauled by an angry, blonde zombie, are too extreme for one of your status. It's like you're purposefully showing off to declare you're better than everyone else. Fumikage and Kyauka felt a beastly emotion slither through them in that moment, the gothic rock pair only a hair's breadth away from assaulting their errant classmate for his comment. It was one thing to play rough during the festival, but to verbally, attack someone with no provocation? Amazing. Izuku said, shaking his head at the heterochromatic teen, every word of what you just said was wrong. Totoraki blinked not having expected such a blasé response to his accusation. Where was the yelling? The denial? The admission? I'm not better than anyone else, Izuku continued, vehement emboldening his words. And I'm not the son of some, villain either. I'm just a student like everyone else. A student that has the same rights as anyone else and should be given an equal chance to shine in this festival. You might not be able to see it from up on your pedestal. But people like me have the right to earn a place amongst the heroes too. Tay leaned her head forward, the ravnet resting against Izuku's shoulder in a boneless show of encouragement. Unlike you, whose gift was accepted by everyone but yourself, Izuku continued, verve and intensity making the verde net sound downright heroic, I've had to struggle every step of the way. So I know I'm not better, but I won't let that stop me. Not anymore. I'll show everyone that my power exists to make the world a better place. An unshakable sense of determination oozed from, the young necromancer. It was honestly inspiring. Instead of all, however, Totoraki could feel only seething rage at the Verde net, a single phrase derailing his thoughts. It. Is. Not. A. Gift. 
The scar teen ground out from between teeth clenched so tightly they were close to cracking. Totoraki reached up and palmed a hand over his scar. What my father gave me. It's nothing but a curse. The unexpected vitriol from his mismatched classmate caused Izuku to flinch back, the absolute hatred too toxic to stand. Unfortunately, that was not the worst of what was about to come spilling out of the dual-colored teen. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what a quirk marriage is? Totoraki asked rhetorically. Seeing the slight shaking of heads to confirm, he continued, Whatever you think you, no, it's a hundred, no, a thousand times worse. Someone behind Izuku gulped loudly, but the Verdana couldn't spare the time to turn and see home. Pieces of the puzzle that was Shito Totoraki that had always been missing were abruptly popping into existence, and whatever picture the young necromancer thought he'd see was growing infinitely worse than he'd ever feared. My mother was sold to, my, father. For money and empty promises, Totoraki pushed on, spitting the F word like it was a terrible curse. She had the misfortune of being attached to the quirk he decided to combine with his own to make an ultimate creation, a superior tool strong enough to beat All Might where he'd always failed. Tsu had grown an unhealthy shade of pale, green beginning to come in at the edges of, the frog girl's body. She'd heard about eugenics operations like this from her mother plenty of times, their society almost bred this kind of behavior after all. When the strength of her quirk was all that mattered, why wouldn't people with the means coerce or force others with complementary powers to breed with them? It was a sure way to rise socially in the fucked up hierarchy that ruled their lives. Until recently I don't think I saw my siblings more than 10 times in the last 11 years, Totoraki admitted, pulling more gasps and now frowns from his Yuku's group. I learned to take a punch before I could write my own name. I was forced to eat too much, then too little over and over again to keep my body at peak condition. The scar teen seemed to have forgotten that he had an audience at this point. Even as his mismatched eyes stared into his Yuku's emerald orbs, he was really staring into the abyss. My mother couldn't take the abuse after a while, Totoraki said, the hand over his scar pressing into the damaged flesh. She had a breakdown and... And I was there and she... She saw my left side and she... The unspoken words were loud and clear to those gathered, Totoraki's mother had been pushed beyond the point of madness and had lashed out indiscriminately at the closest perceived threat. The unprovoked attack had obviously scarred the heterochromatic teen in more ways than one. Endeavor sent her away after that, he'd just gotten his perfect tool and then she'd gone and damaged it, Totoraki shook his head and dropped his left hand, coming back to the world and glaring once again at his yuku with a venomous look. The last thing I remember of my mother is that boiling water. And her sobbing. So I won't ever use that man's power. I won't give him the satisfaction after what he's done. The mismatched teen held up his right hand, eyes filling with resolve and determination as he gazed at the unassuming limb. I'll never be like him, Totoraki swore. I'll reach the top, become number one. And I'll do it with only my mother's power. The heterochromatic turned back to stare as Yuku square inches the eye. So do you understand now Madrai? Totoraki asked, forcing himself back into his now obviously fake calm state. I'm going to win this tournament. Forget those earlier setbacks, I'm going to beat you. There's no other way. The scarred teen, expected many things to happen after his declaration. He'd expected perhaps a firm but ultimately futile declaration of rivalry from the Verdanet, or maybe his target cowering back in the face of his steadfast resolve to be the best if he were a lesser man. What Totoraki got instead though was. Are you an idiot? The question may have been thrown with all of the honest confusion in the world. But to Totoraki it still felt like a kick to the balls. When what? The scar teen was so thrown by the response he couldn't even manage to articulate his surprise. Oh boo fucking who? So the candy cane dickhead had a sad childhood. Saki taunted, arms crossed as she snarled. Guess what prick, there's a lot of people whose lives are more fucked up than yours. Get over yourself already, whatever cap on his fuse Totoraki had managed to put into place blasted off at the blonde zombie girl's words. 
instantly he raised his right fist, the air temperature dropping drastically. How dare you, she's not wrong, Caro, some interrupted the rant before it could begin, the frog girl's natural monotone portraying a sense of wisdom onto her words. You've had it bad it's true, but you're, just too focused on yourself Totoraki-san. You're not the only one whose life has been hard. Many of us have also had to fight every day of our lives to overcome obstacles intended to shatter our dreams and break us down. As Yuku reached over and gave his girlfriend a supportive hug, the frog girl visibly drawing strength from the gesture as she exposed her past. I think it's pretty obvious my quirk is a mutant type right? Tsut asked, getting a slight nod from the pissed off heterochromatic. And on the surface, it's not one that lends anything special to the world of heroics either. Here as Yuku had to disagree with his girlfriend, as rare as it was for her to be wrong. Off the top of his head, the Verde Nap could think of a hundred different ways the abilities that came with Frog, could be used to save people and combat villains. He'd have to make a mental note to have a talk with Tsuta later, to make sure she no longer thought so little of her amazing work. If I hadn't decided to take control of my life for myself, and overcome my supposed limitations. So paused to take a breath, the amphibious teen looking much lighter after releasing long bottled up feelings. If I, hadn't, I would have been saddled with a desk job at my mother's firm. I love her, but that is not the future I wanted for myself. Totoraki clicked his tongue, clearly unimpressed with the tale. He could see no reason for the powerless to not learn to accept their place, after all, someone had to work the less glamorous jobs to keep society running. What confused the scarred teen was the, frog girl's description of her quirk as basically non-heroic. She couldn't have really believed that right, with her prowess. Had she not been trained at all before applying to a- Was it all pure innate talent? You claim your genetics made your life hard but I say you know nothing of what you say. Your genetics never drew the discrimination of the world around you, Fumikaj stepped forward, next, his feathers puffed due to his restrained anger. You speak of an afflicted lineage, yet you exist in a society that's praised you from the minute you were born for being the son of the number two. Your abuse has been horrific, there is no doubt, but your stigma now is completely self-manufactured. There are those of us who are forced to carry burdens that are not our own, and would gladly, set them down if only society would look past our outer darkness. I, going further proved too much for the raven-headed boy. Fumikaj had suffered years of denigration and cruelty at the hands of those who saw him as a freak purely for how he looked. It had only worsened when it became common knowledge that he didn't look anything like his parents, where a shared mutation could have made his looks at least understandable. His father's feathers didn't extend past his hairline, giving him 95% of a human body. Meanwhile, his mother looked completely normal, with her quirk allowing her to move through shadows. The fact that his mother was a little obsessed with his father when they were younger didn't help Fumikaj's case. Many who knew the two elder Tokoyami saw the avian teen as some wicked result of some dirty and unholy union. You want to hear what a really horrible childhood sounds like? Kyauka asked, picking up in the silence left by Fumikaj so as to not allow the scarred teen a moment to counter. Imagine trying to save a stranger and getting stabbed for it. And then, you don't even get a thank you in return. Imagine having no way of attacking or defending and still throwing your body over other defenseless people because you can't stand to see others get hurt. Imagine living every day with people just waiting for you to turn into a villain for something that was never your fault to begin with. Think about how it would feel to have everyone against you when you've done nothing wrong. Kyauka shivered as she remembered the days she'd stalked as Yuku, waiting for her chance to show her gratitude to the Verdana who rescued her. The punk rock girl could still see the painful sight of the purest and bravest boy she'd ever met tackling the entire world by himself. In the face of his suffering, all the harsh criticism she herself had faced for her alternate style of self-expression had felt like inconsequential annoyances. The cruel insults and taunts that followed her with words like butch, tomboy, 
or lesbian had felt like paper cuts when she could hear her savior being verbally torn down day after day with accusations of being a freak of nature. Comparing Izuku's childhood to Totoraki's. That was like comparing the punishment of Sisyphus to climbing a mountain. What? She liked reading the classics, Kya Uka-chan? Izuku was. Confused, and not a little concerned. His friend had just described his life, not hers. How did you? Lily thinks Mr. Candy Cane should be grateful he's still alive, Lily said, stepping forward. The littlest zombie wanted to give melting the heart of the heterochromatic a try. As long as you're alive, Lily's knows you can still do good for people, and still make up, with your mommy. Already at the end of his rope, Totoraki didn't appreciate that particular nerve being stepped on, especially in a lecture from a child. What do you know about suffering? Totoraki roared, having enough of all the sharing. A child like you? What the hell? The scarred teen's jaw snapped shut with a click. But it was already too late. How could he forget who he was yelling at, the red-eyed child, the one with the purest smile he'd ever seen but a past so dark he'd literally been too afraid to dig into it, darted away with tears in her eyes to hide behind Madraya. It made sense since he was her creator. Oh God! He just yelled at and demanded to know what a dead kid could know about suffering, and not just any dead kid. For the first time in his life, Totoraki couldn't, imagine how he could know more torment than someone else. Especially this child in particular who'd suffered an agonizing end at the hands of a horde of degenerates. With no salvation in sight. Totoraki's eyes widened and he frowns, but it was still too late. Across from the scarred team, Izuku glared back with a baleful stare of his own that was much, much worse than anything Endeavor had ever, looked at him with. All this time you've claimed you're not your father's tool that you'd be nothing like him, Izuku said lowly, anger overflowing with every word. All I see right now is the spiteful second coming of Endeavor himself, an updated copy who's been using his mother's power exactly like a tool. Congratulations, she must be so proud of you. Totoraki reared back as if struck, the heterochromatic teen's chest aching like it never had since the night he'd gained his scar. His soul cried out in despair as he examined his obstacles hurtful words and for all the worse they rang true. Let's go. Izuku snapped out, turning away from his traumatized classmate and giving his friends, girlfriend, and partners a kind smile. My match is first and I really need to go to the bathroom before I go out there. And just like that, all present turned their backs on the son of Endeavor. Seconds passed but eventually Totoraki was able to reboot his mind after that terrible revelation. When he finally blinked back to the world of the living, the scar teen was seeing red. Meanwhile, UA Sports Festival Stadium, computer mainframe room. What? Happened? Nezu asked, all, cheer gone as the principal barely contained his fury, it looks like the randomizer program was tampered with, Aizawa replied taping away at one of the nearby terminals. Someone fixed all the matches to be in this particular order. I can't imagine why. The unexpected sarcasm fell flat, but then Nezu at least had to give his normally stoic teacher props for attempting to lift the mood. Nonetheless, the quirked animal gave a low growl at what he was seeing from his own terminal. Fixing matches was nothing new. Every festival, in every year, there were two at most that were set up to either increase the hype of the tournament or delay a disqualification. If they didn't, then more often than not promising students would be randomly selected to compete against opponents that completely outclassed them. And that outcome helped no one. To ensure the fights were somewhat fair, at least in the beginning, they'd tweak the placements. That way even if said students still lost, at least they'd have had a chance to shine which they'd otherwise have missed out on. Was it completely honest? No. Was it necessary for the betterment of his students? Nezu believed so. By his orders, only two matches had been approved for preset up in this year's first year festival. Midraya-kun and Shinso-kun needed to be introduced to each other, and Kirishima-san and Tetsuya Tetsu-san needed to realize that they were going to have to expand their horizons if they wanted to stand out. 
Only one of his selections had been respected. To make matters worse, in a complete inversion of his beliefs many more matches had been set up exactly opposite of his, rule of fairness. Found it. From behind the line of massive supercomputer servers that rested in the room power loader popped out, an unassuming thumb drive held between two metal fingers. This little jobby was plugged into the server designated to control the randomizer. No doubt it's got a viral program that plugged right into the school's contingency battle selector. The already chilly air, in the computer room dropped considerably. Nezu had the sudden and all-consuming urge to utterly purge the board with holy fire. We can't allow this travesty to continue, Nezu said, the principal's little body shaking with animalistic fury. Unfortunately. Aizawa drawled as he pulled out his phone and checked the time. It's too late to do anything now without setting off a panic. UA Sports, Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. IT's the first round of the festival tournament. Yeah, uh, uh, uh. present mixed jubilant voice filled the stadium, catching the air on fire with energy and excitement. Those not in back their seats made haste to return with snacks and drinks in hand. They moved quickly but not too crazily. After all, this was, traditionally only the warm-up fight. Every year, the first fight was normally dedicated to the weaker competitors, those who miraculously made it into the third round against expectation. The civilians were happy to believe this was done so they could have plenty of time to properly sit down and get situated for the rest of the tournament. The pro heroes, on the other hand, knew it was arranged this way so that those with less combat-oriented quirks and skills would still have an opportunity to showcase their abilities and determination. All the same, regardless of who won the first match, the competitor in question almost never reached the semi-finals. From opposite tunnels across the arena, backlights burst on in a shower of sparkling illumination. Walking into the light three figures, emerged, one from one tunnel, and two from the other. Instantly, Murmurs began to spread across the stands. Coming through the southwest gate I tease a member of General Studies course. With a profile so low I honestly wasn't aware he'd made IT this far and sporting a face so creepy only a mother could love. I tease Hitoshi Shinso. Midnight sight witched. The R-rated heroine had to call upon all of her years of experience hiding her true feelings to not show her irritation at her blonde friend's words. Shinso. His purple hair still frozen skyward and the bags under his eyes deeper than ever before, stepped out and onto the elevated platform that was the ring. The tired-looked teen scoffed as his introduction echoed through the stadium. Of course he'd make it this far. Of course he still, wouldn't be noticed. But that was okay, this was his way of doing things. If he were an unknown that would make demonstrating he had a power capable of dethroning even those rumored to be invincible all the more impactful. That didn't make the Violette feel any less guilty about how he'd gotten to where he was though. The pretty pink girl he'd brainwashed in the second event hadn't been his first choice. He'd had to target her out of desperation more than anything. When that redhead with the shark teeth had come stomping his way and growled he panicked. And then before he knew what had happened he'd gotten two members of 1A under his thumb. But the beastly guy? He'd been his first choice. The 1B student had been big, strong, and menacing. It had been a rather fortunate accident that, the guy had come closer to investigate why the redhead had been first yelling then totally silent. After the cavalry battle had ended, and he'd missed his chance to apologize to the 1B member, Shinso had made sure to profusely do so to the redhead and the pink head. Fortunately, he was shrugged off when he'd made it clear he hadn't been flirting with the pink girl or planning to make the two do anything illegal. And coming through the northeast gate IT is a student of the heroics class 1A. He possesses a determination so intense that even death itself refuses to touch him, IT is the monster of himself. Is Yuku Madraya. For once fed up with a mix showboating, Midnight tapped her communication beat and called a racer head. Meanwhile, Izuku and one of his zombie girls had stepped into the ring. The Emerald Necromancer didn't wave to the audience, but the audience didn't cheer too loudly for him either so it was a mutual exchange. And by his side, 
The one. The only. The legendary. Teyumada. This time there was absolutely no cheering from the audience, only suspicious and confused murmuring. By now, the public at large believed they were aware of just who is Yuka was and the level of carnage his monstrous creations could unleash should they go berserk. And while none present could deny UA was the best school for someone with a quirk like his, one that needed to be controlled at all costs, many were still wondering why the monster of UA was being allowed such aid. Amongst the heroes watching, both in the stadium and throughout the world, opinions on the match fell into two camps. Those who truly believed in heroic duty and the ideals of heroism saw the fight as the perfect way for both competitors to show what they were made of in a controlled environment. These heroes also found it commendable that someone with a dark quirk was doing his best to become a hero, even against the stigma they knew he'd faced in their society. The other type of heroes. Well, they at least admitted that having a co-worker who could control such dangerous creatures as these zombies had proven themselves to be would be a fantastic asset in the field. For Shinso himself. Just like Hanty told me, the Violet thought as he watched his opponent grow tenser the longer the whispers and murmurs continued. The old fucks really want Midraya out of the tournament ASAP. Due to his upbringing. Shinso had what many would consider an unfair connection to a certain staff member of UA while keeping the information vague when needed. His source had made the Violet aware of how many saw his opponent, even among the UA faculty. He could relate though, having lived through similar circumstances to a degree. In fact, had it not been for his auntie, the insomniac was sure he'd still be facing such discrimination even here, at Japan's premier hero school. Slam. The sound of a door slamming, empowered by the stadium speaker system, interrupted everyone's thoughts. Did you just call one of my students a monster? The normally calm and collected gravel of Eraserhead's voice didn't sound so put together as he spat the accusation for all to hear. To be fair, the notorious teacher of class 1A was justified in being upset. It's just a moniker I swear. Slap. Gah. The antics of the longtime friends were enough to ease the suspended mood of the public with laughs and applause. With that, Midnight took her place near the ring to start the battle. Competitors Midraya and Shinso, Midnight called out, quieting the stadium as if she'd hit the mute button. Before, we begin, remember the rules, no lethal damage. No attempts to maim or otherwise permanently injure your opponent. And, if either Cementos or I call for a stop to the match, you will stop at once. Our word is final. Understood? Both students turned to nod at the 18 plus only heroine. Privately, Izuku snorted. He knew that the no maim rule had been directed at him because of his partners. Shinso, on his side of the ring, took a deep breath to calm his racing heart. The Violet knew what he had to do, and honestly, if he'd been facing any other competitor than Midraya he'd have had no issues proceeding as planned. However, being born with a dark quirk himself, the tired teen knew that the Verde net across from him was probably one of the few who could actually relate to him. The victory, he was about to achieve would leave a foul taste in his mouth. He just knew it. But there was no other way. If Shinso wanted to be a hero, then he had to win today. No matter what. Ready? Midnight purred, taking one last glance between competitors. The R-rated heroine pushed back the lump in her stomach with all the professionalism years of teaching had given her. She couldn't afford to show favoritism here. Not now, begin. Izuku raised his arms, readying himself to take a boxing stance. Before he could complete his setup however, Shinso did something completely unexpected that made him pause. The Violet extended his right hand out, open palm, a small smile tugging at the corner of his exhausted facial features. Hey Madraya. Shinso greeted loudly, causing the young necromancer to blink in confusion at the unorthodox first move, let's have a fair fight, alright? Surprised, Izuku felt himself relax, even returning his opponent's smile. Finding a friendly face in the third event of all places had thrown him for a loop. But the Verdanet would gladly accept anyone non-hostile to his existence that he could find. 
Shinzo felt his stomach churn violently at the trusting smile that had bloomed, across his opponent's face. The tired teen hoped that after this was all over he'd have a chance to apologize to the Verde Net. Who knew, maybe he really could be friends with this other dark kid. Afterward. Sure. Izuku replied good-naturedly, going to stick out his own right hand, sounds good to me. The conflicted Violet sprung his trap as soon as the words had left the green-haired teen's mouth. In the back of his mind he could feel his quirk slither out and take root. I'm sorry about this. Shinsa murmured as Izuku sagged like a puppet with its strings cut, eyes vacant, I really am. Whoa. 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 What just happened? Did Midriya just give up? Is the battle already over? Present mix and credulous announcing echoed the utter confusion of the festival's audience. No one, had any idea of what just happened. If you'd read the competitors' files like you should have you'd know that this is Hitoshi Shinzo's quirk in action. Brainwashing is incredibly versatile and extremely powerful. In fact, the only reason this kid didn't make the initial cut into heroics was because the practical exam is illogical and ill-suited to test non-combative quirks. Ever the voice of, reason and sanity wherever present Mick was concerned, Eraserhead's additional commentary shed a little light onto the situation unfolding in the ring. Now, Shinso said, raising his voice to be heard over the low buzz of the stadium's crowd. This was it, his moment to win the match and take command of his own future. Turn around, take your partner, and walk off out of the ring. It only took a moment for the Violette to realize something wasn't right. Izuka wasn't moving. Hey! Didn't you hear me? Shinso shouted, louder than before. The sick feeling in the Violette's gut now had nothing to do with using his quirk on an unsuspecting opponent. I told you to walk. Out. Of. The. Ring. Silence. Not a twitch, not a flinch. Definitely no stepping. However, no matter how formidable, Shinzo's quirk is. He still made a mistake. Eraserhead's words echoed from the stadium speakers just as Shinzo heard it. Growling. Right next to the brainwashing user aside. GGGGRRRRRRR. Shinzo had been so focused on his Yuku, he hadn't kept his eyes on anything else. And now. Tay was right by his side. Meanwhile, unknown. His Yuku blinked and suddenly found himself in the arena, alone, totally. Alone. Looking around, the Verde Net realized Shinso had disappeared. So had Midnight and Cementos as well. To the young necromancer, there was only a thick fog around him so heavy he could hardly see beyond the edges of the ring. His mind crunched what he knew, and there was only one answer. Fuck. He'd fallen for some kind of trap. Where am I? Izuku asked out loud for no particular reason. His lonely voice was better than the eerie silence of this place. Whatever it was. Inside. Ice shot down Izuku's spine as he turned to see. Himself, eyes blazing an unholy scarlet so bright they glowed like hot coals. Cursed blood. And what does that mean? Izuku asked, not exactly understanding any more about his situation from that non-answer. The only thing he did know was that he, wasn't in any mortal danger since neither Midnight nor Cement Toss had stopped the match. Disconnection. Subversion. Izuku blinked, and a mental image of himself standing, unmoving and dead to the world, flashed through his mind's eye. For an instant, Izuku felt the oily fingers of panic crawl up from the depths he'd banished them to. He didn't know what due to. If he couldn't regain control his, body, then Shinso would surely just push him out of bounds. Even if he didn't, his lack of response would definitely be enough for Midnight to call the match in the Violet's favor. Options. Options. Shit he didn't have too many, control. Izuku came back to himself and stared at the avatar of his quirk. Was that sinister force really suggesting what he thought it was? Surrender. Control. Could, the Verde Net risk such a thing? If Cursed Blood took the reins, then there'd be no doubt he'd win the match. But Shinso. Memories of the USJ flickered before Izuku, reminding him of the ruthlessness of his quirk in battle. 
was sticking it to the board and as sponsors really worth risking another student's life? No, is Yuku answered. Better to face defeat than live with the guilt of hurting an innocent. The avatar of cursed blood didn't seem upset at all that its petition had been denied. In fact, it didn't move at all. Then. Awaken. Gasping, is Yuku reeled back a momentary feeling of utter agony enveloping his entire body as if his blood had caught fire for a second. Blinking, the Verdanet quickly gathered he'd returned to the real world. What had happened while he was, oi, 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 shouldn't someone stop that thing before the mind flare bites the dust? The frantic announcing of present Mick bounced against the stadium walls and slammed into the Verdanet's ears. He could hear the crowds in the stands beginning to freak out as well. Focusing, is Yuku saw a brutal sight, the cause of the voice hero's uneasy questioning. There, over on the other side of the ring, Tei had Shinso, held high in the air with a single hand. The undead was seemingly crushing the Violet's windpipe as she held him aloft. Shinso was kicking and thrashing, looking for all the world like a man fighting for his life. In truth, the tired teen had long since shot straight past panicked and was now edging through utterly terrified. He could see black spots beginning to crawl along the edges of his vision, although he'd have been able to see more if his gaze wasn't fixated on the searing rage being glared into him by the red eyes of a zombified Ravna currently strangling him. To be clear, no matter what it looks like, is Yuku Midraya's partner, Teyamada, is not attempting to murder Hitoshi Shinso. Had that truly been her intention, the kid would have already been dead. In there, press box, present Mick turned a slack-jawed look of utter disbelief to his friend. The blonde shivered as he saw the normally unflappable underground hero rubbing one of his arms as if remembering an old war injury. Back down in the ring, Midnight had hurried forward to make sure Tay didn't go too far. Competitor Shinso, the 18-plus only heroine called out close but refusing to intervene while the match was still going on, do you yield? The uneducated civilians looked on in horrified confusion, although most of the heroes in the stands understood what it they were seeing. As terrible as the situation appeared to be, the red-eyed Ravnet was only using a submission hold. It was scary as all hell, but it shouldn't be lethal. That didn't stop Midnight's worry from intensifying as the purple-haired teen still had yet to give up. It was tearing at the Ravnet's heart to stop the match, but she just couldn't. If she did, she ran the very real risk of destroying the boy's pride. Is Yuku sighed. He should have expected something like this might happen if he was disconnected from his partners again. That brief moment back on the first day of school was still burned into his mind after all. Oh. It's okay Tae-chan, is Yuku said willing his thoughts and feelings through the bond he shared with his first partner. Tay stopped growling immediately, snapping her head around to take in the sight of her master, safe and sound. The undead Ravna did not, however, release her hold on Shinso. You can let him down now. And just like that, the brainwashing user was dropped to the ground, like a sack of potatoes. Tay instantly jogged over to his Yuku's side an adorably blank demeanor to her that the public couldn't reconcile with the image of the raging undead monster they'd witnessed only moments ago. I'm sorry for scaring you like that, is Yuku apologized softly to the zombie girl as he gave her head pats. But I'm okay now, so don't worry. While the Verdana continued, reassuring the once more vacantly gazing Tay, Midnight had rushed forward and knelt down beside Shinso flicking her hand Mick off as she did so that her words wouldn't be broadcasted to the entire world. Haito Chan, the R-rated heroine breathed, all traces of confident seductress gone from the voluptuous Ravnet, can you continue? I can call it now if you can't. Don't push. The recently, choking Violet shook his head, gasping as he tried to take in as much oxygen as possible. His heart was pounding so loud he almost couldn't hear what was being asked. I. Ak. I can. Huh. I can do it. Shinso grit out, doing his best to sound brave, like a true hero, as he forced himself to his knees. Worried eyes of sky blue looked over the struggling violet one more time before nodding, back. 
Midnight stood up and took a few steps back before flicking on her hand mic. Before she spoke, the 18-plus only heroine cast a silent plea to the now waiting Madraya still on his side of the ring. Equal parts confusion and gratitude flooded the Ravnet as she caught the infinitesimal nod the verdant necromancer gave back. For whatever reason, he was willing to give Shinso room to recover. Competitor Shinso has chosen to continue to fight. Midnight's declaration was met with supportive cries and cheers that would have shaken the rafters if the stadium had had any. It took an entire minute, but eventually, Shinso managed to muster enough energy to stand. Throughout that entire 60 seconds, the Violet heard every cheer, every whistle, every supportive cry of his name. And it all made him sick. To him, it felt like the men and women, in the stands weren't rooting for him. But against Madraya. He was going to have to apologize so hard after this fight was over. Seeing his opponent now standing at the ready, Izuku decided it was time to take action. Tei-chan, the verdant necromancer said sternly, giving Shinso the seriousness he deserved, removal. Throw him out of the ring. Shinso barely had time to understand what had just been said before the zombie girl was in front of him again. Reaching down, the Ravnet latched onto his left foot and pulled. The strength of the undead Ravnet was so great that the Violet had no choice but to follow his body's momentum and fall to the ground again. This time, however, the tired teen refused to give up. While Tei began to drag him toward the edge of the ring, Shinso, concentrated on everything he'd learned and lashed out. Horse kick. Elbow strike. Jab. Punch. Shinso unleashed every move he could think of on the undead Ravnet as she dragged him. He even used his other leg and arms to break the limb holding onto his left foot. Unfortunately, while it was a valiant effort, it was ultimately futile. Even though the Violet could hear the snapping of bones and, the thuds of his strikes landing solidly, Tay never broke her stride as she marched. Even the broken arm didn't phase her. And then, it was over. Shinso's world spun one last time as he was flung out of bounds like he weighed nothing at all. And the winner of the first round is. Midnight paused, frowning as she caught not a few expectant gazes from the general public that were clearly waiting for her to disqualify the Verdanet. Idiots. Is Yuku Madraya. The lack of cheering as he was announced victorious hardly bothered Is Yuku, he just waved to his classmates he'd caught sight of in the stands. Most of them waved back. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Class 1A Seating Box. Mashiro Ojiro glared down at the waving necromancer with disdain. The tailed teen's thoughts grew darker with each passing minute. This irresponsible idiot. Ojiro roared into the furious storm that was his mind, you almost let that thing kill a student. Do you even care about other people? The more the martial artist watched his classmate in action, the more he realized he absolutely loathed the Verdanesque work. Madraya himself might not have been such a bad guy, but he put far too much faith in his control over his undead abominations. As everyone had just witnessed, all it took was for him to be removed from the picture and the things would go feral. Healing is one thing, but there's nothing heroic in using your powers like that. Ojiro continued to rant internally as he stood up to leave the stands and head towards the ring. It looks like someone's going to have to teach you how a real hero does it, how a real hero fights. The tailed team knew how the brackets were organized, he wasn't stupid. Once he took out the one been on threat, he'd be allowed to face Madraya in a sanctioned match and go all out on the necromancer. But I might give you a little bit of a break. Ojiro mused as he entered the tunnel leading to the arena floor. You did remove the true hidden monster in the tournament. I don't know who the hell Hitoshi Shinso is supposed to be, but his quirk. That needed to be removed way before he weaseled his way this far. Ojiro cut his thoughts off before he fell into darker thoughts, shuddering memories of a lost match that cost him so much more before they could overwhelm him. It would be perfect. His fight against Madraya would be the perfect stepping stone, to avenging his master, to showing the world that the true power of martial arts could conquer even the darkest of enemies. And then, one day, one day soon, he'd be ready to hunt that bastard down and make him pay.
Roughly one and a half minutes later, UA Sports Festival Stadium, contestant arena. Uh, uh, and IT's over folks. Present Mick just couldn't help himself sometimes. Would you kindly, surrender? Pleaded the gentle voice of Ibarra Shiyazaki to the upside down martial artist she had caught in her vines, I really do not wish to further harm you. Laughter. Mockery. Burning shame. Ojiro couldn't believe it was happening again. This couldn't be happening. This shouldn't be happening. Fuck. No, Ojiro spat, the vines constricting him, tied in intricate kinbaku knots, tightened as, his captor flinched at his vulgar language. I'll never give up. The tailed teen struggled against the thorny vines, but with both of his arms and legs locked into place and bent back as far as they could go, his movements were ultimately inconsequential. Even the martial artist's tail had been restrained in the beautiful rope style. Shiyazaki turned a worried gaze toward Midnight, the religious, heroine in training hoping the proctor would reason with the blonde for her. Instead, the R-rated heroine was looking back at her with a look of shock and interest. Competitor Ojiro, Midnight called, breaking the charged staring contest to turn to the captured boy, can you continue? I can. Ojiro screamed, red-faced due to either embarrassment, anger, or all the blood rushing to his head. I, just, need a minute. Mashairao Ojiro possesses a highly developed close combat ability he naturally pairs with expert motor coordination. As a martial artist, however, his chances against this type of opponent, one with ranged abilities, were slim to none. Under different circumstances, I'm sure we could have had a much better showcase to enjoy his techniques. Hearing his own homeroom teacher, spell it out seemed to only infuriate the tied up martial artist even more. Just. Midnight paused, deciding to speak directly to Shiyazaki instead of into her mick, just throw him out. The religious teen sighed and directed her vines to carry her restrained opponent over and out of bounds. When the tailed teen was no longer over smooth cement and instead had grass tickling his nose, Shiyazaki, cut the binding vines leading to her captive, resulting in Ojiro dropping to the ground and a new hairstyle for her. And see me after the tournament is over Missy, Midnight added before Shiyazaki could walk away, causing the vine-haired girl to shiver in abject fear. I promise I won't tie you up for long. As the stadium reverberated with the laughter of the callous and inconsiderate, others, were more focused on what they just learned about a certain verdant necromancer. Damn it. Mizashi cursed under her breath, the woman nearly punching the railing she'd been resting on. If only that monster had gone just a little bit further. To an inexperienced eye, while the undead had appeared to have gone completely feral when it attacked the purple-haired kid, its level of violence had still been within acceptable levels believe it or not. Frustratingly, that meant she and her partner were still not allowed to approach it for acquisition. Don't lose faith my dear. Kojiro chirped, mopping the floor where a careless brat had dropped a mixture of soda and popcorn. That religious nut job is up next. If she tries something crazy like say, and exorcism or something. Well, who knows, maybe then we'll see something unholy enough to intervene. It might have been wishful thinking, and Kojiro might have just been trying to make her feel better, but Mizashi was more than ready to latch on to anything resembling hope at this point. That was. Nianta muttered while keeping a sharp eye on his Yuku, a lot of intelligence for a supposedly brain-dead zombie. For a moment, the diminutive, field supervisor feared his simple assignment was far more complex than he'd been led to believe. Nah. It would have been impossible right? If the Yamada girl was actually awake, and just acting, then that would mean that the Madraya boy's quirk was actually capable of bringing back the dead to such a degree that the hitherto joking moniker of Necromancer was in reality too close to the truth for comfort. Some distance away from the trio, a hero wreathed in Hellfire had ignored the second fight entirely. Instead, He'd been going over the notes he'd taken down on a specially designed fireproof notepad. Resistance to mind control. The depraved grin that parted the flames covering the hero's face a truly disturbing sight to see. Good, good. Now, 
Show me what else you can do in a real fight. Show me what you can offer to my perfect creation. Oh make, what really happened is Yuku Midraya sighed as he walked up to the office of the chief of the Mujutafu police station. I can't believe those girls actually did it. The Verdanet murmured to himself, standing awkwardly outside the office's door. But I guess it's fair that I uphold my part of the deal now. Only a week ago he and Saki had finally gone to meet her old gang, Doromi. The blonde delinquent had failed to mention that it was an all-female biker gang though, and needless to say its members hadn't been happy to see him on their turf. They'd all nearly suffered aneurysms when their old boss had called him boss. At least they'd been considerate enough not to attack him, even if it was only on the technicality that he'd done the gang a solid by bringing Saki back to them. Are you sure you can pull this off boss? Saki asked, grinning widely instead of looking at all worried, are you going to go all necromancer on their asses to get it? Originally, Izuku had wanted the girls to disband and return to their homes to repay the debt his returning of Saki had accrued, really, he'd just been thinking that he didn't want to have ties to active delinquents, you know, as a hero student. The ensuing argument that had threatened to break out had come to a shrieking halt as soon as the Verdanet had learned that many of the girls weren't just runaways, but girls who'd been discarded or disowned from their families for a variety of reasons. Thinking on the fly, Izuku, had asked Saki if her old gang was good at anything besides being a nuisance, like guarding things. The blonde's resolute yes, had him sold, and in the next breath, the young hero in training had concocted a test to see if Doromi could be coordinated to keep an eye on someone, namely his mother. After the challenge had been issued, Izuku had had his doubts, but after getting all those reports, from the gang's current leader Reiko Amabuki, who'd refused to go by her old family name of Kirishima, which was fine since it helped him keep her separate from his classmate, the Verdanet had decided to give the girls a better chance at proving themselves. No Saki, you know I don't use my quirk like that, Izuku replied, grimacing at the challenge it was now his turn to tackle, I'm merely, going to, convince the chief. I'll get him to see this as a win-win for everyone involved. Somehow. I hope. Confidence diminishing by the minute at the prospect of fabricating a real home for a group of delinquents from thin air, the verdant necromancer knocked on the door. Fifteen minutes later, Mujudafu Police Station, Chief's Office. So let me get this straight. The Chief, who hadn't gotten any younger since the last time as Yuku had been to the station, began, You want me to just give a public beach to a gang of biker girls? As Yuku knew how it sounded, and he was asking a lot, but in his eyes, it was the right thing to do. The girls deserved a chance, and the beach needed more constant, effective care. Sir you and I both know that Dagaba is no longer a beach. Again, is Yuku, retorted, trying to move around his frustration that all that hard work had been undone by careless idiots and lazy corporations. It's common knowledge that after someone, a retired hero or maybe just a concerned citizen, cleaned the beach months ago people almost immediately started using it as their own junkyard again. That's what really ticked the Verdane net off. The beach had been a slice of paradise after that mysterious someone had cleaned it. But all it took was a few tourists littering before the dumping started up again almost overnight. Look, I know you have good intentions here, and I know Tsukaki will vouch for whatever you're trying to do here, but come on, the chief gestured, as if waving away the ludicrous idea. Giving complete ownership of a public beach over to a bunch of street rats and delinquents. Isn't that a bit? You know? Oi. Saki jerked forward, the blonde unable to contain herself even as her boss face palmed. These girls aren't run-of-the-mill delinquents you hear? And they aren't rats either. Three storefront windows smashed, a private vehicle vandalized, and numerous counts of illegal graffiti, the chief countered, reading off his computer screen, your gang would cost more in paperwork than the repairs for the nuisances they've caused. It's not that they're liable to get into anything highly illegal, it's that they're more like a rowdy club of biker fans than anything. There's no way they'd be responsible enough to actually maintain the beach to code for any length of time. 
Saki abruptly turned around, hiding her, depressed face at having such a heavy truth slap her right in the ego. She died too soon, she hadn't had enough time to lead her girls into anything worth noticing. Even their street traces hadn't been mentioned. That could work, is Yuku said suddenly, snapping out of a thinking pose. Excuse me? The chief squinted in confusion, not following the verdant's internal brainstorm. What could work, what? Saki couldn't even speak properly she was so lost. Dagobah Municipal Beach Park could be given to the biker club dormy as a restoration project, is Yuku explained, sounding sure enough of his idea that he actually got the chief's attention. While Saki didn't look too happy at her gang being downgraded to a mere girly club, she held her tongue. A social club could easily be given, permission to adopt a derelict public space and turn it into their gathering hub. Keeping the zone clean would equal their continual payment for the space, and ensuring visitors no longer dumped their trash there would be their jobs. Everyone wins. The chief sat in his own thinking pose for a minute. I don't know. The older man said, eventually looking unconvinced by the whole idea. Seeing the chance for her girls to have their own turf slipping through their fingers, the blonde zombie girl decided to get mean. Just drop it boss, Saki said, a false look of defeat on her pale face. I'm sure these donut eaters are just too excited about having the beach and cleaning it themselves. They'd get to keep it clean themselves too, posting who knows how many officers as security to catch, illegal dumpers. They'd never have a dull moment again. No wonder they don't want to give that up. Neither necromancer nor zombie girl failed to notice the older man flinching slowly pale as the undead delinquent continued speaking. We. We don't have the resources for that, the chief admitted, shaking his head in denial. A public beach is everyone's responsibility. The civilians in the area, those that live here, they're the ones that use the beach the most and should, right? Saki interrupted rudely. That's why every streetwalker and their pimp call the place the Dagobah Municipal Junkyard. There was a moment of silence as the chief processed what had just been said. The man stared intently at the two youngsters, the room's temperature simultaneously dropping and skyrocketing as his face looked ready to explode. The chief was well aware of the beach's unfortunate situation. It wasn't the public's fault that a group of moderately connected businessmen were using the junkyard for their own ends and paying to keep civil services from getting near it. It wasn't the public's fault that the locals were too lazy to lift a finger to clean the place up themselves, because it wasn't their job. And with the rise in petty crimes and all the heroes running around stopping them, his officers had been spread too thin to do anything either. All right. He'd made his decision. I am not giving Dagaba to a group of small-time delinquents that should really still be in school," the chief barked hotly, a chilling glare stabbing right at Saki before he turned back to his computer and began typing away furiously. But, if it means that much to you, then you can have it Madraya. You're a promising young man, a hero in training no less. All the rights and duties of Dagobah Municipal Beach Park are now yours. What? Is Yuku had asked for the right to manage the beach, not own it. I want that place crystal clear in a month, the chief continued, sending a stack of forms to be printed by an archaic looking fax machine in a corner of his office. And if it isn't up and running by then, either as a beach or a club hub, then you can expect some heavy fines, mark my words. Now get out. Outside the Mujudafu police station, Is Yuku stood stock still reeling from what had just happened. Luckily all it had taken was some asking around in the station to learn why he'd just had an entire beach dropped on his lap. Apparently Dagobah was a bit cursed, jumping from institution to organization to institution for over a decade, outside the Mujudafu police station. Izuku stood stock still, reeling from what had just happened. Luckily all it had taken was some asking around in the station to learn why he'd just had an entire beach dropped on his lap. Apparently Dagobah was a bit cursed, jumping from institution to organization to institution for over a decade, always landing back on the police chief's doorstep in the end. Giving him ownership had been the old man's way of making the whole mess his problem now. While the time frame was a little on the short side, 
is you could guess if push came to shove, he could always ask his classmates for some help. His only real problem now was. How the truck do I explain this to my mother? Chapter 28, Sinister Special Eye Disclaimer. This first special takes place the day before the start of the sports festival. A night to remember, for Lyril to an outside observer. The fact that Gyao Kajiro and Fumikaj Tokoyami, of UA Class 1A, had recently become closer might have come as a surprise. Indeed, those who didn't know that the two had tailed their mutual emerald hued friend on his first date would be understandably flummoxed by the unexpected development of the tomboy musician deigning to spend any of her personal time with the dark, brooding edge lord. The punk rocker and the raven headed teen themselves, however, hardly cared what others thought of them any longer. And even though that totally not a date spying mission had ended with Fumikaj getting punched in the arm by, a rather deeply flushed Kyauka due to Dark Shadow's tactlessness, the kiss he'd received only two days later more than made up for the misdirected aggression, all things considered. That hadn't kept the avian teen from reprimanding the quirk entity rather heatedly once they'd returned home however. Luckily, it seemed that a few head pats from Kyauka were enough for the normally vocal shadow beast, to be willing to forget the whole ordeal. Art thou ready? Fumikaj asked, approaching the already street-dressed heroine in training that had been waiting for him at the edge of UA campus. As he got closer, the avian teen realized that staring into the musical Violet's deep eyes and basking in her mysterious semblance held a stronger lure over him than any amount of cheaply viewed flesh his old classmates poor mags could ever have hoped to achieve. Tonight we shall truly experience a revelry in the dark. Kyauka snorted, pushing down both her amusement at her more than a friend's over-the-top mannerism as well as the flutter in her stomach at the double meaning his words could be taken to have. Actually. That gave her an idea. So, you're saying we're going to have sex, tonight? The musical heroine in training asked. Smirking as the casually dressed, calm and collected Fumikaj immediately fell into a flustered state. Watching him fall apart was probably the only thing allowing Kyauka to keep her own reaction under wraps, that had sounded like such a better joke in her head. How was it fair she was feeling embarrassed now? Reaching out, the punk rocker gave the, panicking bird boy a harmless punch to the shoulder. Chill out, I was just kidding. I know that's not what you meant Fumi. Fumikaj sputtered. That pet name again. The normally broody hero in training wanted to believe that the butterflies he now felt in his stomach were just a product of Dark Shadow laughing at his embarrassment. It would be such a simpler explanation. The raven-headed teen was, no fool. He'd known that their earlier kiss, his first kiss, had just been retaliation against the idiocy of their classmates going too far. Kyauka's actions hadn't meant anything deeper than a fuck you at the time, and he'd been completely understanding, even flattered, that someone had felt the urge to defend him for once. But. The memory of it. Her soft lips against the strange paradox that, was his hard while also soft beak. It would be a lie if Fumikaj said he hadn't wanted such a thing to happen again, only with a more serious and deeper meaning. So. Kyauka trailed off blinking as she belatedly remembered to pull out her smartphone and text her parents. It had totally slipped her mind to tell them that her not-boyfriend was taking her out to a concert tonight and she wouldn't be home until late. Where are you taking me anyway? Fumikaj took a second longer to openly stare before shaking himself from his stupor. Verily. After delving through the annals of the interweb, I have succeeded in discovering a most perfect temple for a dark lady of thine own caliber. Kyauka allowed a chuckle to escape then. If Fumikaj was able to be his normally overly dramatic self, then, the shock of her joke mustn't have landed too badly. Hark, for the dark castle will be ooh, a loud snort interrupted the avian teen midway through his. Eloquent. Reveal. There's no way? Kyauka couldn't help but laugh. He had to be joking. Really? The Dark Castle? There was no way on this gorked green earth that Fumikaj Tokoyami, a high school student, got not one, but two tickets to one, of Japan's most exclusive underground musical nerve centers. 
the place was practically a mecca for rising bands of a darker tone to make their debuts and or get scouted by talent hunters. Getting access was, by default, no easy feat for anyone. If you weren't lucky or talented enough to be an invited musician, then you had to find a way to get tickets. And that, that was almost impossible. Tickets, were usually sold out before events were even announced, a testament to the Dark Castle's popularity. And even if you were lucky enough to find some still on sale, the price alone would force you to trade an arm and a leg for even the nosebleeds. So it would be beyond ridiculous if, of course, Fumikaj boasted, revealing a pair of tickets pulled from one of his jacket's inner pockets. Kyauka was, speechless at the sight of the solid black slips of stock paper. The rigors involved obtaining these trophies. The horrors I was forced to face. Kyauka found herself silently nodding along, absolutely believing the avian teen must have gone through hell. Even her mother, as low-key famous as she was in certain circles, couldn't get last-minute tickets for shows like the one tonight. It was at that, moment that Dark Shadow decided to slither out from Fumikaj's stomach, a wicked grin slicing through the roiling darkness that made up the quirk entity. Yeah, cause talking mind to parting with them was so hard. Dark Shadow teased. At least you managed to talk her down from her initial demands right? Just having as much fun as possible will be much easier than giving her grand bob, Fumikaj. Blushing so hard Kyauka swore she could see red through his feathers, pushed the quirk entity down before it could speak any more embarrassing truths. Seizing the opportunity, the now impressed Violette reached out and snatched the rare tickets up for a closer look. Holy. Shit. Kyauka swore loudly enough that anyone close by would wonder what was so amazing to elicit such a reaction. Who'd, your mom have to kill to get these bad boys? Fumikaj hadn't just gotten Dark Castle tickets. He'd gotten premium Nitonix tickets. These got you up close and personal with the stage no questions asked. Come. Fumikaj shouted, absolutely not dodging the question, let us depart. We cannot afford to miss this revelry in the dark. With that, the avian teen grabbed hold of the free hand of the Violette of his dreams and was off, fully intending to spend a memorable evening with her. And maybe, just maybe, get another kiss. Later, redacted, the dark castle. Kyauka was beyond ecstatic. The musician in her was threatening to spaz out at returning to the holy land she'd only had the privilege of entering once before when her mom had been performing for one of her old man's events. And, truthfully, she couldn't remember much of that first visit, being too young to focus on much beyond the loud noise crashing into her untrained and delicate, quirk-enhanced hearing. All she could remember was that she'd been stuck with her old man up top, watching her mom and other performances as they'd nearly brought the house down. Tonight though, she wasn't under anyone's watchful eye and she, was old enough to really enjoy the experience. Holy shit her accelerated heartbeat alone was proof enough to her that she was completely enamored. There was absolutely no way it had anything to do with the raven-headed boy she was using as a wall to lean onto. No sir. Trucking a man. This is going to be so rad. Kyauka did not ski in childish excitement, and she'd jack anyone in the throat who, said otherwise. Thanks so much for bringing me here Fumi. You rock. That pet name again. Fumikaj should have been. Annoyed by it? Embarrassed maybe? All the raven-headed teen knew was that every time his companion said it, he felt warm. Anything for you, Fumikaj said lowly, the avian hero in training only realizing he hadn't spoken softly enough when he noticed Kyauka's elongated earlobes. From where they'd risen up from behind him freeze up for a moment before returning to their energetic writhing. The owner of said jacks, face aflame, was glad that she was behind her more than a friend at that moment. Wanting a little revenge for the way her heart had just skipped a beat, the punk rocker jerked her hips forward to jokingly strike at the edgy teen. Kyauka's mischievous look, crumbled when she realized she'd basically just thrust her hips at a guy. Oh truck. Well, playfully flirting wouldn't hurt right? That's all it was. Right? Hey guys. Called out one of the dark castle's attendants suddenly. 
The gothic rock duo paused, slightly separating as if trying to hide something. The twenty-something young man, who sported tusks from his mouth and quills sprouting up and, down his arms, walked over with a pleasant grin. Before you go any further, please take these suppressants first. On the house of course. Request made. The attendant gave Fumikaj and Kyauke two plastic packets, the teens knowing that each contained a single pill. It was inevitable, of course, that in a society where the majority of people wielded what were once considered superpowers that, public events such as concerts and forums would employ a means to at least lessen the chances of an incident occurring. Quirk suppressants came in all shapes and sizes, not to mention intensities from the near-complete suppressors police used to single-use pills and patches that kept instinctual, subconscious, and or passive usage under control for a limited time, it made sense that the Dark Castle would want to ensure fans couldn't go overboard during the intense concerts they put on. And lucky for the gothic rock duo, the label on the packets showed the pills inside were of a rather light variety, so neither had a problem with taking them. There was a bit of a problem though. Do you have any beverages? Fumikaj asked, speaking like a normal person for once. It was important that he got his point across though, the dark teen knew that swallowing certain things wasn't the easiest for him with his head Zavian physiology. I'd rather not choke on this. The attendant took a moment to take in the hero in training's features before nodding and sticking a thumb over his shoulder. Sure we do dude. Fumikaj leaned over to look around the attendant. Behind the man was a table laden with cups of all sizes surrounding a large barrel with a rustic looking copper spigot. Grab a beer and have fun. The two UA students shared a look of surprise. They weren't exactly old enough to drink in public. Not to mention they were also studying to be heroes. While we aren't necessarily that young. Fumikaj trailed off hesitantly, unsure of how to get his point across. He needed to do his best to circumvent stating their real ages while also avoiding a descent into vice and villainy by giving in. They couldn't afford to be caught participating in underage drinking after all, not as hero students. And, okay, he also didn't want to make a fool of himself in front of Kyauka. I won't tell if you don't, the attendant said with a wink. The man knew. Very well that teenagers like the two before him no doubt had at least a little experience drinking alcohol already, he did at their age anyway. And besides, the beer on tap tonight was light. So don't worry about it yeah? In a rare moment of being completely out of his depth, Fumikaj turned to his companion and sought advice on what to do. Glug. 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 Kyauka hadn't hesitated and had stepped forward while Fumikaj spoke with the attendant. Grabbing a cup, she'd filled it, dropped the pill in, and chugged the whole concoction down in no time, much to the surprise of the avian teen with her. Gaha! The musically inclined heroine in training sighed in delight as she finished her drink, that was actually pretty smooth. Seeing that his violet companion had no problems, with a drink, Fumikaj decided to bite the bullet. Surely one cup wouldn't be so bad. Right? Much later, she's woke a prefecture, is the city, Jiro household. The front door to the rather nice suburban home swung open smoothly, not fast enough to make a slamming noise but also not slowly enough as if trying to avoid making a sound. No one was trying to hide their entry into the otherwise silent home, after all. Man. That was amazing. Kyauka exclaimed as she carelessly tossed her bag and jacket aside, we need to do things like that more often. Seriously dude, why the hell didn't you tell us you could actually sing? Cheeks flushed, Kyauka couldn't help the giggle that escaped her at the memory of the bird-headed boy singing along perfectly with the bands up on stage. She also hadn't missed, how his gaze would flicker back to her every so often. He had acted just like a bird showing off for a potential mate. At some points throughout the concert, Kyauka hadn't been sure what had made her heart beat faster, the music flowing from the stage or the personal show her raven-headed not boyfriend had put on right next to her. For her. I assure you, my dark lady, this humble servant is more, than just a simple bard, Fumikaj said, 
internally cursing as he slipped into his dramatics to hide how nervous he felt. Forcefully dropping the act, the avian teen was thankful his dark feathers hid most of his blushing. Give me a chance, and I promise I'll keep surprising you. Unfortunately for the raven-headed teen, said Dark Lady instantly picked up on him dropping his usual speech pattern. Oh? Kya Uki whispered, shuffling away from her companion, a sly smile curling her plump lips as she looked back at him, and how would you do that? You gonna take advantage of the fact my folks aren't home? Perhaps it was the alcohol, emboldening the normally shy at heart musician, but in that moment, the Violette wanted nothing more than to push the buttons of the boy she was now alone with, she really wanted to see what would happen. Is that... Is that a challenge? Fumika asked huskily, unable to tell what had intoxicated him enough to be so bold. The raven-headed teen stepped forward, wrapping his arms around the slightly shorter punk rocker while nibbling on the top of her earlobe. Kya Uka gasped, not only due to the unexpected move but also from the pleasure that shot through her, at the feeling of her ear being played with. She'd known her ears were sensitive, but holy shit did Fumi's beak on her skin feel like heaven. Oh and his heart on. That both shocked and ignited her too. The giggling escaped Kya Uka again, bubbling up from her fluttering stomach and sounding decidedly more expectant this time. I dare. You. Kya Uka replied, turning around in the arms that surrounded, her to lock gazes with the raven-headed teen who'd captured her in more ways than one. I double. Dare. You. Slowly, the punk rocker stepped backward trailing her fingers downward before latching on to Fumikaji's hands as she led him out of the foyer, up the stairs, and into her room. The haze of booze and lust currently enshrouding the Violette's mind drowned out all her normal hang-ups of, being called butch for her personal space's decidedly ungirly musical decorations. It felt nice not having to worry about that particular fear for once. All the same, the two heroes in training were in no way sober. They were drunk enough to lose most of their inhibitions, but not too far gone that they didn't understand what they were doing, about to do, and why they were doing it. The duo knew, there was an attraction between them. They liked each other, and now, they wanted each other. And really? Would it be so bad to fall in love with each other? Would it be so bad to give in and have each other, right then? As soon as the door to the musician's room had closed, it seemed like both teens suddenly became the clumsiest humans in the world. Removing each other's clothes felt like an eternal torture, and while eventually the two successfully undressed, Kya Uka was left grousing that Fumikaji's belt was pure evil while the raven-headed boy could only stare in wonderment at the garment in his hands, amazed that he now knew how bras worked. And then Kya Uka grabbed his dick. Fumikaj's knees buckled and fell back onto the bed behind him. Holy cheese. It felt good. So good. Shit now, too tight. Ah. Fumikaj hissed, instantly exhaling in relief when the death grip on his manhood relaxed as Kya Uka flinched back at his sudden reaction. When he found the willpower to sit up, Fumikaj was met with a look of hazy guilt staring back at him. Sore sorry, Kya Uka mumbled blinking and looking away in shame. I've... I've never... you know... do done this... before. Making a snap decision, Fumikaj launched forward and grabbed the musical Violette by her shoulders. Before she could do more than squeak in response, the raven-headed teen had twisted around and swapped places with the punk rocker. Aizawa-sensei could never know he'd just used the move they'd learned in heroics in the bedroom. Scratch that. Aizawa sensei never needed to know they were in the bedroom. Together. Huh? Fine. I will narrate the lemon scene. But first a little promo. Hello viewers, I think this is the first time we met outside of the what if female Deku. Why am I here? You ask. Well every time there is a lemon part one will take over. So if you want to skip, you are welcome to do until you don't hear my voice anymore. With that being said let's go fellas. Shaking away that random thought, Fumikaj stared deeply into the eyes of the girl now under him. 
Did it mean anything that his mind nearly went blank when he realized her eyes weren't black as he'd previously thought but a deep amethyst? No, focus bird brain. That doesn't matter to me, Fumika trembled, his plumage shifting pleasantly as he slid backward, nearly face down on the nubal body below him. After all, as they say, ladies first. Already befuddled by the alcohol and sudden position change. Kyoko had no chance to respond before her world exploded. Sitting there on her bed, the Violette could only moan as she looked down to see she'd become the target of attentions she hadn't known her body craved. Fumikaja's beak-like mouth worked wonders on the entrance to her little kitty, the strangely hard yet soft, texture sending tongues of fire shooting from her lower lips to her brain. She felt feverish as if she'd been set on fire but the coals were inside her and pooling lower and lower. Hungry flames throbbed through her veins, burning her with every warlike drumbeat of her heart. Kyoka gasped sharply as the raven-headed teen began to leave little nibbles on her bin, sparking electrical bolts that ran up and down her spine. Her toes curled, her hands gripped her sheets, and the musician's brain nearly widened out. A tightness began to stack on top of the coals, the spring condensing more and more of her into it with every breath. It was too much. Too much. A thin tongue suddenly shot out, spearing through her folds and licking her insides all the way up to her center in one fell swoop, Fuo, Kyalka buckled and shattered and melted all at the same time, her world disappearing. Fuma Iai. The punk rocker's hips thrust upward nearly dislodging the source of the pleasure that had caused the involuntary movement. A rapturous scream ripped through the air as Fumikaj reached out and gripped Kyauka firmly around the waist, continuing his assault on her womanhood. Tongue and beak, prolonged the explosions that rocked her to her core, meanwhile his hands busied themselves with caressing every inch of tantalizing flesh they could reach. Kyauka couldn't tell how much time passed, a minute. Ten? Every time she'd feel herself coming down out of the searing bliss she'd been sent into, another lick or prod would send her right back up. Each ascent left her more sensitive, and, while it was an unimaginable pleasure without end, even her senseless mind could tell that eventually her sensitivity would increase to almost painful levels soon. Struggling against the latest wave of white-hot ecstasy, Kyalka managed to rise up and shakily push against the cause of her heavenly torture. Her arms were weaker than a kitten's, but the act itself was just enough to snap Fumikaj, from his single-minded task. Realizing what he'd been doing, the raven-headed Dean instantly stopped and sat back, worriedly taking in the sight before him. Kyalka was a mess. The violet was shaking, almost catatonic from so much carnal bliss constantly shooting through her inexperienced body. Her face was flushed beyond anything Fumikaj had ever seen, the redness traveling all the way down to her perfectly sized breasts. Those beautiful eyes of hers hadn't quite rolled up, but she was definitely not seeing him as he gazed down at her. And if she hadn't grit her teeth at some point during the near painful ecstasy, he was sure her tongue would have even been lolling out. Down below, there was so much wetness spilling from between Kyalka's legs that the sheets under her were soaked through, not that she could recognize that at the moment. Fumikaj licked his beak at the sight, humming in satisfaction at the distinctly Kyalka taste he could still catch a bit of. The punk rocker meanwhile breathed deeply, taking in as much air as possible. Slowly, so slowly, she felt herself come back together as the aftershocks of so much pure pleasure so suddenly worked their way through her, Fumikaja's blush deepened as he enjoyed the unintended side effects of such an action. Bird had none withstanding, he was a decidedly mammalian creature, and the violet's breasts were a work of art, perfectly sized and firm. They looked good enough to eat. Anyone who ever dared say this woman wasn't a goddess from here on out could fight him. To the death. Time passed, but neither teen really noticed. When Kyalka finally managed to fully come back to reality, Fumikaj leaned down once more, placing a gentle kiss on her lips. Was that okay? The raven headed man asked, unsure of himself even in the face of such visible evidence. 
how it looked to him didn't matter as much as the honest opinion of the young woman under him after all. Kyoka scoffed, reaching out to wrap her arms around Fumikaja's neck, pulling him down to her level. You about killed me there, the punk rocker joked, chuckling at the speechless, wide-eyed look that greeted her in return. Maybe next time we work up to the mind-shattering climax, okay? And give a girl a little warning would you? Fumikaj sputtered, unable to accept that he'd just been explicitly told he'd rocked her world, and implicitly told, they'd be doing this again. And they weren't even done yet. At least, he hoped. Taking a deep breath, Kyalka finally relaxed completely. Nodding at the question she could see in Fumikaj's eyes, the musical heroine in training panted as the raven-headed man leaned in, kissing and licking at her bosom. Echoes of the insane bliss she'd felt earlier crackled through her as she felt her body reignite, at the simple ministrations. Paying special attention to Kyalka's nipples, Fumikaj gently nipped at the fleshy peaks before deciding to move upward to the slim neck of the undeniably stimulated woman beneath him. Biting back a mule, the punk rocker chose that moment to rejoin the action and make a move of her own. She was done sitting back and just taking. No one would ever say that Kyauka Jiro, never gave as good as she got. Kyauka reached down and, softly this time, wrapped a hand around the huge trucking weapon that had been pressing into her stomach this whole time. Holy smoke! How the truck had she not noticed Fumikaj was packing heat when he'd been laying over her for so long? He really had screwed her brains out hadn't he? And they hadn't even gotten past third base. Huffing. Kyanka shook away the flickers of embarrassment that tried to still her and began to rub the rock-hard ding-dong in her hand. Up, down, up, down. Occasionally she'd throw in a brush across his balls, delighted at the shivers and groans her actions pulled from her companion. Tensing, Fumikaj sat back, taking himself from her hand in the process. Before she could wonder if she'd done something, wrong. The raven-headed man had leaned forward again, brushing his beak across her overly sensitive earlobe. Are you ready? The whispered question sent another quake through the punk rocker. This was it. Are you? Kyalka threw back, lying back and opening herself up to Fumikaja's gaze with a heated blush. The raven-headed man swallowed thickly, but moved forward with a hungry gaze. Fumikaj, positioned himself as best he could above the violet who'd come to mean so much to him, Kyanka again wrapping her arms around his neck in silent support. The two shared a deep and meaningful kiss, working together blindly to press manhood to womanhood. Still mesmerized by their kiss, the gothic rock duo finally succeeded in pressing Fumikaja's tip to Kyanka's little kitty, the feeling, electrifying their moment even more. No words were exchanged, no attempt to define their feelings was made. The two merely pressed their foreheads together in silence and, after a moment, Fumikaj put everything he had into thrusting forward. Ahoo! Instantly Kyanka's cry of pain sobered up the raven-headed teen. Kyanka! Fumikaj stilled, utterly distressed, what happened? Are you okay? He tried to pull out, but Kyanka dug her nails into his back hissing at the sudden motion. Stop! The punk rocker grit out, biting back a curse. Don't, truck, don't move! Boobet! Fumikaj was at a loss. He had no idea what had happened, but down to his bones he felt like he should be doing something. Don't! Kyanka warned again, just. Don't move okay? Still in obvious pain, the violette, clearly regained more control of herself as the second sticked by. I knew the first time could hurt but. Kyanka mumbled to herself, memories of the talk with her mother flashing through her head. What had happened? She hadn't been ill prepared. Hell, if the puddle she only now could feel under her was any indication, she'd been so wet she should have been fine. If it hadn't been her, then it, must have been. You went in too fast you animal. Of course, Kyanka wasn't really mad at Fumikaj for his mistake no matter what the tears in her eyes said. He'd done his best to please her from the start, there was no denying that. She'd chalk it up to the both of them being inexperienced virgins. 
they'd figure it out next time and that's the end the next day as had become the usual fumikaj met kyauka on the way to school the two sharing a metro line since they both lived in the same general area of shizuoka prefecture this usually gave the gothic rock duo a chance to talk as they walked the last few blocks to the gates of ua however today was different with the clarity of the morning after the two had realized they'd done way more than they should have under the influence of the alcohol provided at the dark castle which was no excuse they'd had sex even if they hadn't gone the whole nine yards they'd still done the deed mostly neither could find it in themselves to regret what they'd done but the air between them had definitely changed kyauka fumikaj barely managed to force out the name of the girl who'd become his mate even if she hadn't exactly known what she'd signed up for at the time nor accepted the role she didn't know she'd taken quirk affected physiological psychology made things more troublesome sometimes that was for sure what the brusque cancer wasn't what Fumikaj had expected, although perhaps he should have. The Violette walking next to him at first glance acted as if last night hadn't happened. But to him, who'd become so tuned to her over the time they'd spent together, it was clear she was avoiding him for some reason. Can we talk about what? The mess? Kyauka interrupted, striking out with a terse question of her own. Fumikaj flinched. He really needed to make things clear. He wanted to be with her. Taking his silence the wrong way, Kyauka scowled darkly, rounding on the raven-headed teen. If you say you're sorry, I'll cut your balls off, the Violet deadpan, Traitorous hands clenching white knuckled onto the strap of her bag. And if you ask me to forget it ever happened, I swear I'll kill you, the Roics be damned. The fact that she could speak such threats without visible anger made the words far more fearsome than if they'd been screamed, I... I was going to ask if you were alright? Fumikaj managed to confess, gathering his courage after feeling dark shadow royal in his stomach. You were still hurting when I left. And I know I saw blood. Kyauka stopped. She blinked a few times. Her thoughts faced a hard reset as reality for one speed her pessimistic expectations in the ass. Fumi didn't want to abandon what they'd had, maybe had, what she'd feared they'd screwed up beyond repair with their inexperience. He was just worried about her. Oh. Okay. Taking a deep breath, Kyauka finally turned to lock eyes with the avian teen who'd shared such an important milestone with her. It. It doesn't hurt anymore. Thanks for asking. The way Fumikaj visibly relaxed at her words made Kyauka's chest warm. My folks threw a fit when they got home though. The heroine in training suddenly segued, shifting gears without warning as she returned to her normal persona. They sniffed out the beer almost instantly. Fumikaj grew concerned. He knew what his father would do if he was caught coming home smelling like a brewery. Were you reprimanded? The raven-headed teen asked. They were in that age range that wasn't exactly forbidden, from drinking, just highly discouraged. Every family was different though. What was minor to some was grounds for being thrown out for others. My old man started up, yeah, Kyauk admitted as the duo resumed walking, but I convinced him and mom that it was just because some asshole spilled his beer all over us. Fumikaj snapped his fingers. A puzzle finally finding its last piece. That, explains the phone call mother received earlier this morning, and why father checked my clothes right after, Fumikaj revealed. A look of apology crossed his avian face. They didn't seem interested in bringing it up with me though. As Fumikaj had learned as he'd gotten older, his parents were by and large much more agreeable to giving their son more freedoms than restrictions. All he needed to, do was always tell them the truth when asked and take responsibility for his actions. Even if they did suspect he'd been drinking at the concert, they weren't going to make a big fuss about it if nothing bad had happened because of it. Kyauka hummed as she walked along. So Fumi's parents were pretty chill then. That was a relief to the musically inclined Violette, maybe meeting them wouldn't be so bad. No, wait. The punk rocker turned away slightly to hide her blushing cheeks from her companion. 
she hadn't meant to think that. Casting about for something to get her mind off of the dangerous topic it had slipped into, Kya Uka remembered a particular moment from last night. In that moment, she decided that if she had to suffer embarrassment then her raven-headed companion had to as well. By, the way, explaining the blood on my sheets went okay enough, Kya Uka threw out, pausing a few seconds until she was sure she had Fumikaj's complete attention. I just told mom that you ravaged her virgin daughter, and she was more than happy to help me hide the evidence from my old man. Fumikaj froze, becoming petrified on the spot. Even through his black feathers it was clear to see the, raven-headed teen had turned so pale it looked as if he'd developed vitiligo. Ah ha 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 The avian teen flinched back as Kya Uka burst into riotous laughter. That's... That's not funny. Fumikaj finally shouted, realizing at least some part of the previous confession had been a hoax. I think I just lost a few years from that. Kya Uka continued laughing though, unable to stop. The look, of sheer horror he'd given her. The boy who'd only a few hours ago hearly tongue fucked her brains out and... Almost... Banged her, it was priceless. Stop it. Fumikaj growled in exasperation even as he fought a smile at the angelic sight of watching the violette beside him enjoying herself. I wanted to have a serious discussion you know. Kya Uka waved a hand, seemingly banishing her giggles as, she settled down. The occasional snort escaped, but the punk rocker had gotten herself under control within a few minutes. Fine. Fine. The violette replied, what do you want? I'll tell you now. You're gonna have to wait for another chance to fuck, my folks don't have date nights that often these days. I I. I wasn't. Fumikaj managed to stop himself this time before he fell into yet another, verbal pitfall. Stealing himself, the raven-headed teen stepped closer to the girl he wanted. What I wanted to talk about. It's about us. You and me. As a couple. I wanted to make it a fee, a war gentle hand on his beak interrupted the dark teen's heartfelt words. Fingers calloused by years of slaving away at mastering musical instruments and more recently months of hero training felt like, heavenly silk on his paradoxical mandible. Looking down, his natural vermilion gaze caught on the kind amethysts staring up at him. They were more precious than any gem in existence. No. That single word caused Fumikaj's world to stop. The raven-headed teen's heart nearly plummeted, but there was something in those glistening amethysts that told him there was something else. At least. Kya Uka, swallowed, nerves visibly rising as she shuffled in place, not yet. Why? Fumikaj asked, honest tone conveying his willingness to respect the violette's choices, while the burning in his eyes did nothing to hide how much he ached for the acceptance of their union. Kya Uka looked away. A mix of guilt, nerves, and embarrassment radiating off of her lithe form. I still have to. Let his yuku go, the, punk rocker confessed with a sigh after a moment of silence. Before her companion could say a word, she pushed on. I know, I know. I shouldn't be crushing on him at all. But it's... hard? They say you never really forget, you know, your first love and all. Another moment of silence split the duo, Kya Uka squeezing her eyes shut as she awaited Fumikaj's response. It was a moment she'd feared since, she'd realized she was getting more than a little attached and attracted to the raven-headed teen. How would he take the fact that she'd spent years pinning after a guy who'd saved her life? Would he accept it, and agree to wait until she'd freed her heart? Or would he leave her and any bonds they might have started? Thinking about it was enough to almost send her into a panic attack. Fumikaj, reached out. And hugged the tensed Violette, saying nothing and everything all at once. Kya Uka nearly slumped in relief. Swallowing thickly, the punk rocker gathered herself and made a valiant effort to return to her normal rough and blasé attitude. I just need to tell him, okay? Kya Uka reassured, returning the embrace in full. Once I can at least let him know the truth. Then I can accept you. Is that okay? Fumikaj looked down, an impulse causing the avian teen to nuzzle his beak into the punk rocker's cheek. Okay, 
The dark teen acquiesced. Deal struck, the two separated. The mood, which had swung as erratically as a seismograph's needle, shifted again, settling as the not quite a couple resumed their trek toward school. Maybe. Maybe when the sports festival is over, Kyauka, suddenly threw out, surprising the now introspective teen beside her. I think I can tell him then. So. After today. Fumikaj said slowly, making sure he was reading the intent behind those words right, you're saying. You'll be mine? And just like that, for the rest of the walk to you Akyauka kept slinging light punches into the raven-headed teen's side, grinning all the while. He wasn't exactly wrong though. Today was the day, the sports festival was here. And regardless of how the events turned out, there would never be a better time for the punk rocker to approach their mutual friend and confess to the weight that had dragged on her so ever since that night all those years back. Finally, Kyauka would find the closure she needed. Finally, she'd regain control of her own heart, Fumikaj deserved that much. And a lecture on how to be gentle with that monster he hid in his pants. Magnus, more requests will be answered in the following chapters so, look forward to them. If you want to make your own request, you know where to ask for it. Oh make, woes of a gang. Inside the now abandoned ruins of what once might have been a convenience store, the remaining twenty odd members of, the street gang Doremi could be found. The group of girls was skulking in their dismal hideaway, licking their wounds after surviving the latest skirmish they'd been forced into against a rival gang. This time, they'd lost everything. Had it not even been a week since they reported to their badass boss, Saki Nika Ido, that scouts had found the perfect new turf for them? The warehouse had been a score, even if it had been abandoned, large inside and out, far away from any stray donut eater's known route, and best of all, with a little elbow grease would be easy to defend. The girls had gotten to work with gusto cleaning up the grunge of neglect within hours and chasing off all of the vermin infestations they could find. The boss had personally had words with the creepy lowlife they, had discovered holed up in the far corner, running him out in under thirty seconds flat. But then, just as they'd begun seriously rebuilding, the boss's old man had called her up, saying he needed a hand at the shop. Unlike most of the girl's shitty or dead parents, the boss's old man was pretty all right in Dorimi's book. He'd welcomed each and every one of them into his tiny home at least once, usually when they wouldn't have had a roof over their heads otherwise. On top of that, he'd also slipped them money multiple times when their own coffers got too low, and pride demanded they starve before asking for help. The old man had even sat them all down and given them lessons on bike mechanics on top of all around basic education something they'd never foreseen themselves accepting from an adult. But when your teach was the same guy who'd publicly crack open the skull of any asshole who'd openly catcall and or prey on your sisters, who wouldn't shut their traps and learn everything they could. So really, the boss couldn't have said no. And anyway, the gang wouldn't have been able to pry her away from her old man's shop even if they'd tried. We. We should have said something. Reiko, Amabuki. The current de facto leader of Doremi growled. The violette, now with red and blue highlights, was barely able to contain her rage as she looked around at her demoralized sisters. At the very least. I. I should have been there. With her. It was a fact that Reiko hated herself these days. It was all her fault. She'd been the boss's girl for fuck's sake. They'd even shared boyfriends, whenever they could enjoying the occasional spice to their already hot and heavy chemistry. Damn it they'd even had one such threesome planned for a weekend of bliss before all of this shit had happened. She hadn't even had a chance to say goodbye. We all should have, Reiko Ain, whispered one brunette, Makoto Nijima, in a quiet, haunted voice. We all should have gone together. One last ride to hell, now their boss and her old man were dead gunned down while the rest of them had been gone, playing around in their new abandoned warehouse. Riji Nika Ido had died relatively quickly as far as the official report said, at least according to Kuroko Shirai, one of Doremi's enforcers and resident spy. It might have taken a hailstorm of bullets to do it, 
but the one man who the girls had actually respected hadn't had to suffer. Their boss on the other hand. The same report had said that the boss had struggled on for nearly a day after the assault, left to be found under collapsed shelves and already far gone into a coma. Hearing that their badass boss had been hanging on for dear life by the skin of her teeth had been bad enough. But being told by everyone who'd speak to them that there was nothing they could do. That. That had broken them. Reiko had eventually worked up the courage to march into the hospital and demand that the damn doc suckers tell her what was going on with her girlfriend. One, an older lady that barely came up to her shoulders, had believed her about her relationship with the patient and, after pulling her away from her cowering co-workers, had told her the straight truth she'd never cried in public before that moment. The damn hospital hadn't had the tools to keep Saki alive long enough to find a quirk that could bring her out of the coma she'd slipped into. Reiko had offered money of course, to find, hire, coerce, you name it, someone that could help, but it was all for naught. The kind of money she'd been quoted in return could only have been found, hidden away in her girlfriend's home, stashed away in her old man's hidden safe. She'd have taken it too without hesitation or remorse. It wouldn't even have been stealing, Saki had given her a key to the Nika Ido home as a one-month anniversary present ages ago. Unfortunately, the place had been cordoned off due to the donut eaters and their useless investigating. That same night, Saki had died, maybe. Maybe we should all go. Together, Makoto breathed, trembling voice wavering not out of fear, but of sadness. She couldn't bear to slowly lose another family. One last race. Go out in a blaze of glory? All around, hums and low murmurs of agreement rose up. Why not? The proposal had its merits, they'd lost everything already anyway hadn't they? The same night official word of the bosses, death had come down, a new gang had launched an assault on the warehouse. While the girls had successfully defended their turf, Several of their number had been injured and a few of the reinforcements to the walls they'd built up had been torn to shreds by the invaders. Reiko had taken stock of the situation and accepted the general belief that the place was no longer defensible as Doremi was at the time. And without a doubt, the new gang would surely attack again the next night to capitalize on their weakened state. It was the coward's way, but they'd all agreed to abandon the place in favor of returning to one of their older hangouts. Too bad for them each and every one had already been retaken by low-life criminals in their absence. The old convenience store, if it had once been one, was their last option for a hideout. And it was scheduled to be demolished in four days. Not without the boss. Reiko suddenly shouted, earning the attention of the downtrodden girls around her. We'll wait for the boss. Get her ashes. Eat them. Only then can we say we'll all go together on one last. Bam! The shoddily reinforced double doors of the hideout burst inward, a pale leg sticking out, of the darkness obviously having kicked it in. Was up beach. Twenty sets of eyes zeroed in on the intruder like lasers. Long blonde hair. Orange and green highlights. A manic grin capable of intimidating even the most fearsome of demons. Doremi's boss had returned. From the depths of hell itself she had returned to them. But were the trio, a cute green boy, a blue pipsqueak, and a raven-haired beanstalk, behind her? Oh make, zombie problems. The zombified trio of Tay, Lily, and Saki weren't merely highly attached to Izuku Midraya, their master, as many believed. In fact, they were highly dependent on the emerald necromancer. That is to say, it wasn't as if they couldn't function without the young hero in training around or felt their cognizance fade away the farther they were from him. It was just being within arm's reach of the Verde that filled the undead girls with peace. That was why, when Azuku had all but ordered his partners to stay seated in the stands reserved for Class 1A, the three had found the arrangement barely tolerable at best. At least having eyes on their master had made things easier on them. And then, when the first two events had finished, and as Yuku's orders were rendered null and void, the undead trio had wasted no time in happily darting out of their seats and immediately glomping onto the emerald necromancer. 
But then the bicolored whiny boy had demanded a word with their master. To make matters worse, when that bother had been dealt with, Izuku had said he would needed to go to the restroom before the matches began, and had ordered them not to follow him in. Tay had had enough. Gra. The loud groan filled the otherwise empty hallway, cluing anyone listening that the oldest of Izuku's partners was more than a little upset. Jeez. Calm down Wonder Girl. Saki shouted as she lunged forward and wrapped her arms around her elder undead sister in a full Nelson. The Ravnet had just about shoved the door to the men's room, wide open. You can't go in there. It was a badly kept secret that Tay had always had a bad habit of following Izuku everywhere. Even into the restroom. While on new a normal campus, this wasn't much of a problem, as the young hero in training usually avoided the more crowded public restrooms anyway. To be safe, he'd also make an announcement before entering any secluded ones he'd find that he was, going in with company. The sports festival stadium, however, was a public space, and loath as Izuku was to use its facilities, he'd accepted his fate due to his limited time. Unfortunately, because it was a public restroom, he'd foregone his normal considerations and hadn't said anything about the three zombies he'd left outside. Guwa. Lily is pretty sure that Izuna doesn't really need you, in there. Lily did her best, but the smallest zombie girl could only wrap her arms around one of her eldest sister's legs. Her attempt at helping provided absolutely no leverage in keeping Tay in check. He won't take long, promise. What's going on? Caro. The two more vocal of the trio turned their heads and realized that their master's girlfriend had appeared from around the corner. Great. Why are you two all over Tay Chan? Tsa asked, a large finger poking at one corner of her mouth in confusion. While it was true that the amphibian girl was getting used to the zombie girl's antics, seeing the trio desperately wrestling outside of a men's restroom was weirder than she'd been expecting. Tay Nay won't wait for Izuni. Lily squeaked, still wrapped around the Ravnet's leg her voice showing how much the smallest zombie girl was straining against the unstoppable force that was her eldest sister. She really wants to go in there with Unyai Chan. For an instant, Su failed to understand why that was a bad thing. And then she remembered where they were. Tai Chan. Su croaked loudly as she marched up to Izuku's first partner, you know you can't go in there. Just, think what people would say about Izukun, Karo. Garga. Abruptly, Tay stopped struggling against her sisters and groaned in confusion. If only that were the end of the issue. What do you mean what would people say? Saki barked in outrage, you know what those shitheads would say. Tay flopped her head to the side, blinking slowly at the fuming blonde. There was no need for a translator, for that particular question. Look, Tay chan Izukun doesn't need people calling him A. Tsa trailed off not wanting to even say the word in association with her boyfriend. A pervert, Caro. Oh God. Saying that accursed word in the same sentence as her cinnamon roll felt even worse than she'd feared. The frog girl felt her insides twist. She felt. Wrong. Gua. Of course Izun isn't a, pervert. Lily chirped, flailing her little arms about in defense of her big brother. Lily knows in her heart that Izun is as pure as pure can be. Yeah. Saki agreed, although the undead delinquent had gained a sullen look, unfortunately. Tsu and Lily froze, before flinching back in shock. The two snapped around and stared wide-eyed at the rebellious blonde. Caro? Tsu croaked, taken, aback by the very idea that after all this time, she might have had competition for Izuku's heart right beside her and hadn't even known. Although, should a zombie biker even be able to experience emotions like that? When what? Lily was even more surprised. Little as she was, the Bluenet knew very well what her troublemaker of a sister was suggesting. How could the blonde even be having such feelings? I'm just saying. Saki sulked, refusing to look at her two interrogators. With all the pussy surrounding the boss, there's no reason he should still be a virgin. Tsa frowned, both at the implication and coarse language. You better not make a move on Izukun, Saki-chan, Tsa warned lowly, he's my 
boyfriend. But it's so hard. Saki moaned, fidgeting in place. I mean, hell. Even Shrimpy here would love to, LA LA LA. Lily doesn't hear. Lily doesn't know. The littlest zombie girl slapped her hands over her ears and began to chant her new mantra. Dark images of her past fought against her mental image of her pure Yai Chan as she slammed her eyes closed for good measure. Tsai took a heavy step into the undead delinquent's personal space, murder in her normally blank, amphibian eyes. Stop, the frog girl warned, her glare at once frigid cold and searing hot. Now. Caro. Unfortunately, Saki had never been one to listen to what she was told. And seeing the boss's normally unflappable girl so tied into knots was just making the moment all the better. And really? The boss is kind of. Resilient, Saki continued, now visibly taking pleasure in seeing Tsu's shoulders shaking, his stamina is as undying as he is you know? It may be too much for you to handle alone. Have you ever thought about getting some help? Tsu felt her cheeks begin to inflate as the glands in her mouth began to secrete her natural neurotoxin. Seriously, the frog girl mumbled, as much due to her rage as her tongue being gooped in sticky fluid. Stop. I'm not saying bring, the mushroom head in or the googly eyes, Saki playfully waved her hands in front of her, shifting into swaying her hips as if to show off her own sexiness, I'm just saying that if you end up having trouble, you know I'd be more than happy to help you handle. It. Handle what, exactly? Instantly, Saki froze, shoulders shooting up as she hunched away from the deadly calm voice behind her, turning. The delinquent would have paled if she'd had enough blood in her veins to do so. Izuku had finally rejoined the group. The emerald necromancer was being embraced from the side by Tay, Lily hiding behind his legs. All three were glaring at the undead blonde. At that moment, Saki realized she'd done screwing up. You couldn't even keep Tay from entering the restroom, Izuku added, almost as, if to drive the nail home. The v instantly. Saki froze, shoulders shooting up as she hunched away from the deadly calm voice behind her, turning. The delinquent would have paled if she'd had enough blood in her veins to do so. Izuku had finally rejoined the group. The emerald necromancer was being embraced from the side by Tay, Lily hiding behind his legs. All three were glaring at the undead blonde. At that moment, Saki realized she'd done screwing up. You couldn't even keep Day from entering the restroom, Izuku added, almost as, if to drive the nail home. The Verde net crossed his arms, an adorable parody of an angry badass. Yeah. Saki had doubly screw up. Chapter 29, Sinister Influence. As had become the norm esque works became the central focus of humanity's interest, all around the world, every man, woman, and child Abel had tuned into the spectacle of UA Sports Festival. It didn't matter if a country had its own internationally ranked hero school, it didn't matter how an individual even felt about pro heroes, from the humblest worker to the wealthiest tycoon, for the next three days everyone would be glued to the nearest screen. UA had the market cornered, and for one reason or another, no one wanted to miss what was next on the chopping block. This year in particular, Many would agree later on that the first day of the event had become something of a paradigm shift. From the start, no prior iteration of the festival had developed, quite like it. Never before had a dark mutant featured so prominently. Sure, in the past a mutant type could shine with an untamable determination powering their changed physique, or a dark quirk user could overshadow the competition through sheer power. But those examples were exceptions and none could have ever have been said to have been so thoroughly dominant in their festivals. Not like this, is Yuku Madraya. As the festival had progressed, it had been no secret to the world at large that the Verde Net was a mutant-type quirk user whose powers had what many would consider darker connotations. Not only were brochures filled with basic competitor information handed out to the audience who'd managed to make the pilgrimage to the stadium, but on the live broadcast up-to-date BIOS of each, student would show up whenever they were on the screen for more than a few seconds. Names, quirks, a general overview of skill, 
these and more were openly shared with anyone and everyone who cared to watch. While cursed blood had become somewhat public knowledge thanks to the illegal recording of the incident involving the final judge, that same public wouldn't be able to truthfully say the work in question had been seen in action. Judicious and perhaps overbearing damage control had all but erased the video from the Internet, with worm programs left behind to delete any copies the instant they were posted. As such, witnessing for themselves the might of the quirk that was growing to become a whispered legend was a treat many would remember as either a high or low point of the festival's first day, depending on who was asked. The fact that resistance to mental quirks was an unregistered quality of cursed blood would only come up later. That F. Ing monster. While not quite cursed, the sentiment behind Godsuki Bakugo's growled words was clear to any who'd listen. Fortunately for the explosive blonde, in the middle of the Sairi Aitai's mess hall, full as it was with patient sand, visitors all packed together to watch UA Sports Festival on the institution's three large screens. His grumbling didn't carry too far over their own commenting. Even as pissed as he was, he knew he couldn't afford to trip up now. Rikugo was almost free. After an exhaustive battery of tests and therapy sessions that had lasted however the fuck long, he'd proven that he could be reintroduced to society and not be a danger. He was close to finishing this extended stay in purgatory. And he'd even take the constant monitoring and restricted movement if it meant getting out. He was so close. And so was his. Friend. Calm down you oaf. Kano hissed lowly, quickly glancing around to check and see if Bo had caught the explosive blonde slip. He was getting restless. Even if it's hard to, watch, keep it down. If she were to be honest with herself, and Bakugo. Junko Kano truly had no reason for still remaining at Sairiite. The Arachnator could have signed herself out of the Institute the day after she'd shown signs of life again. If she'd had a place to go. But that was the problem, wasn't it? Kano didn't exactly know how long it had been since she was left behind at Sairiite, but, what she did know was that all that she owned was the white garments on her back that had been provided to her by the director free of charge. She had nothing. She had no one. And in the back of her mind, the Sylvette was sure that if she left the Institute alone, she'd surely fall back into her catatonia and be brought right back. Her only realistic ticket out, out of her room, out of Cyriite, out of her condition, was contingent on the barbarian. Friend. She'd made. She was stuck with him. Absolutely none of that had anything to do with the fact that the Ashen Blonde was still incredibly vocal about seeing her as a girl. Nor did his mother incorrectly assuming they were in a relationship color her opinions at all. And the warmth she felt by being accepted so openly by other human beings, after being ostracized by everyone she'd ever known? It was nice, but that's all. This was all about getting out and keeping it together long enough to have a chance to get her life back. That was. It. The Sylvette did have to admit that the prospect of attending a hero school was intriguing though. While she believed the professions of idols and heroines were ultimately incompatible, there were many successful pro-heroes who were basically celebrities in everything but name. Perhaps. Perhaps her dream wasn't as completely lost as she'd thought. Were you even watching Legs? Bakugo continued waving a still-cuffed arm haphazardly toward one of the mess hall screens. Each wave visibly built up the blonde steam. That was a fucking mental quirk, a goddamn controller type. And that, freak not only trucking resisted it but it did shit to that brain-dead monster. Well that was certainly loud enough to draw unwanted attention. Having become partially arachnid in nature after that fateful dose of Springfield trigger, Kano had come to realize that with her abominable form came certain benefits. They in no way outweighed or even came close to balancing the ruining of her life. But even the Sylvette had to admit that wielding senses so acute that she could feel. Well, everything was amazing. The Arachnator could have closed her eyes and still followed the oaf's wildly flailing hand, or counted out how many times his jittery foot tapped the floor beneath his feet. She could have described the fly 50 meters away on the wall was rubbing its legs together, and that it only had five and a half. 
and she could without a doubt feel the heavy gaze of the living mountain that was their handler looking their way. I know. Kano hissed again, a few of her own legs beginning to skitter as her nerves began to frazzle. But you need to, trucking Romero. Bakugo loudly interrupted with a roar, tensing as if to stand, I bet he drained some extra DRY too, feeling the, quakes of the steadfast bow coming from behind the staff room door, and a little pissed at being ignored. Kano decided in that instant to take action. Faster than even what now constituted as a normal human could react to, the Arachnator shot out one of her legs and pressed what would pass as her thigh against the open mouth of her violent companion. At the same time, another of her legs, as, discreetly as possible, arched down and pressed itself between the explosive blonde's own legs, a warning against moving. While on paper having a woman's legs all pressed up against you might sound sexy beyond belief, Kano was well aware that her spider limbs were perhaps the most repulsive things any human could ever suffer to have touching them. That belief was quickly reinforced when the, Sylvette felt the vulgar oaf immediately still at her actions. Something wrong here? Bo rumbled as the giant reached the most fearsome duo the Sireite had ever seen since that tall carrot top and his icy midget had been released decades ago. Why did I hear screaming? Having seen how things worked at Sireite over the years, Kano knew that there was no point in trying to blame someone else, even if they hadn't been sitting together, separated from the rest of the mess hall by at least one empty table on all sides. There were enough cameras and mix bugging the place that nothing got by the eagle eyes of the staff. It was kind of funny, thinking about it, for the first time since she'd arrived. The Sylvette couldn't decide if the distance others gave her was because she was a horrifying freak of nature, or because her barbarian of a friend always looked ready to kill something. Maybe a little of both. But, like she'd said, it ultimately didn't matter. We were just arguing over something dumb. Again, Kano replied earnestly, only to receive a raised brow from their joint handler. Honest. I just had to silence the oaf's stupidity for a moment. See? For a moment, the, Sylvette panicked. Even as she held Bo's gaze with all the innocence she could muster, she felt as Bakugo opened his mouth against her thigh. The explosive blonde was going to bite her in retaliation for what she'd done or try to scream through her in a mindless rage. Either option would sink them. Truck, and then a whole different kind of panic flooded the fallen idol's veins. For as rigid and, tough as her lower exoskeleton appeared, the arachnid appendages were actually extremely sensitive to certain stimuli. So when she felt what could only be the blonde oaf's tongue poke out from between his chat lips and lick a small bit of her thigh, she nearly yelped in flustered surprise. It was only by the grace of her idol training that Kano was able to maintain her innocuous mask in front, of their hulking caretaker. But every millisecond she could feel it slipping. Then, she felt it. The leg between the oaf's legs picked up the feeling of something. Something going from soft and ignorable to really hot, hard, and demanding attention. Well, try to keep it quiet would you? Bo replied with a cheeky grin after a moment. The handler had caught the hot flush that had erupted across the arachnator's cheeks after she'd spoken, and he could imagine the look on his other charge's face, if he could have seen it. It's kind of hard to pay attention to the tournament when you two are having the day's lovers quarrel at the same time. I it's not like that. Kano sputtered out, full on blushing now. However, the fire, Blistering the Silevet's cheeks had next to nothing to do with being accused of being in a relationship with the vulgar oak, oaf. It's not. The mountainous bow merely rolled his eyes, chuckling. Teasing his two charges had become one of the highlights of his job, alongside being an eyewitness to their improvements. In fact, Bakugo had been getting more tolerant as of late. And Kano had been, much more expressive not to mention less afraid of what others might say about her body. Still, was it too much to ask for the Pomeranian to get over his resentment of a certain Verdana from his past? Of course it's not, the handler agreed, sarcasm dripping from his words. Just. Keep it down. The third match is about to start. Confusion washed away much of the red color in Kano's face. The third match? 
The Arachnator asked as the living mountain walked away, what happened to the second one? When no answer came, Kano huffed and turned to look at her still trapped companion. Freeing Bakugo. Oddly enough, the thought of freeing the explosive blonde felt more difficult a task than she'd imagined it to be. All she had to do was lift and retract her legs, easy right? But. It, wasn't that the Sylvette found her companion attractive or anything. Not hardly. It was just. From the day she'd woken up and found herself with the body of a monster, she'd accepted that no one, anywhere, would find her new form attractive. Ever. Finally finding the will to pull back her limbs with a sigh, Kano instantly latched on to the fact that the normally loud-mouthed blonde immediately, turned away and remained silent. From her very core, the Sylvette felt a heat wash over her as long dormant hunting instincts lit into existence. Era era oh she was going to have fun with this. Oh yes. She was going to tease the blonde hard once they returned to their room. It would be a fitting punishment for the vulgar oak, oaf's misbehavior. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. Meanwhile, the third match of the first year tournament had kicked off without a hitch. The muscular red-headed Ajiro Kirishima and the exotic all-pink Mina Ashido had walked out from their tunnels to questionable introductions from present Mick, posed for the audience a handful of times, and had even shaken hands in a public display of friendship and sportsmanship that had almost had a voice, hero so excitably loud he'd almost shattered glass. Honest cheering and positivity filled the air. And it was a welcome sight for the two battling friends. Remember the deal Mina? Ijiro shouted as the hardening user launched himself forward. Powered by quirk and enhanced musculature, the redhead's flying haymaker swung down toward the acid user like a living sledgehammer. Oh or ah uh, ah. Uh. Boom, Ijiro's fist slammed into the arena floor, debris spraying everywhere as a cloud of dust billowed into existence. The crowd went wild, not put off at all at having to wait to see the results of an attack packed with so much raw power. In fact, the suspense only made it better. Yahoo! Mina's cheer was met with a resounding applause as the rosette slid away out of the results of her best, friend's attack, completely unharmed. Ijiro's strike had missed by a fraction of an inch. But the horn girl's counter didn't. Belatedly, Ijiro realized the lower front of his gym uniform was smoking. And then it was gone. Rehardening his entire upper body. The spiked red-headed teen smirked as he waited a second. But felt nothing. He just confirmed something he'd long tried to convince Mina, of. His quirk completely protected his body from her acid. She couldn't hurt him physically, even by accident. Straightening into a front double bicep pose with a sharp grin to match, Ijiro made sure the rosette, and the world at large, caught enough of a knife full to get the message across. Judging by how the horned girl nearly slipped out of her own acid slide at the sight, the redhead was, pretty sure he'd been successful. And he had been. Mina, knocked out of her battle headspace, could only think of one thing at that moment. ABS. Oh my folks. Just look at that. Such strength, such agility. These two are dancing around each other in the deadiest case of flirting I've ever seen. And I'm friends with Midnight. Present mix commentary whipped the public up into even more of a frenzy. The match had become the long-awaited spectacle that a sports festival was supposed to showcase. After witnessing a truly terrifying first round, and a lackluster comedy act of the second, the general audience was overly enthusiastic that they'd finally gotten what they'd been waiting for. Look at her go. She's so flexible and energetic. Fat a boy red. Show us what those arms can, do. Those two would look great together on the front of a magazine. In the heat of the battle, with their blood up and dust and acid flying through the air, the majority of the crowd became enraptured by Mina Ashido's fighting prowess, the derisive opinions of a few hardliner quirkists were drowned out in the face of her fierceness. In the moment, it didn't matter to them that she looked, quintessentially non-human with her pink skin, black eyes and curled horns. She was a compact Amazon, a nascent femme fatale, an alien warrior. There was no denying she was an incredibly attractive young woman. But Ijiro gave as good as he got. 
as more and more of Mina's acid struck glancing blows, bits and strips of his literally rock-hard body became exposed. The redhead's basic workout, routine would put pre-quirk bodybuilding champions to shame, and his physique showed as much. Every dip and cut of his muscles bulged and rippled for all to see as he did his best to catch the giggling pixie that remained just out of his reach. Activating his quirk only gave the hardening user's body even more definition too. He was like a living Greek statue, a conquering barbarian, an immovable, object on the hunt. The crowd loved it. The duo's sensei, however, hardly appreciated the fact that he could tell his two students were just playing around. Ijiro Kirishima is, as he's shown this entire match, a close quarters combat specialist. He uses his quirk derived high resistance to maximum effect in both defense and offense. Mina Ashido, in contrast, is currently a mid range fighter. She uses the increased mobility her quirk grants her to maintain the optimum distance from opponents while attacking at her leisure. While he knew he would never be one for all this showboating and blood sport, Eraserhead still did his best to keep from ruining the spectacle. As much as he hated to admit it, this was something his students, and the school, needed. He just have to lecture the two on, taking things seriously when classes resumed next week. Joy. It's entirely likely that this battle will be decided by whoever makes the first mistake. Down below, in the best seat in the house, Midnight could barely contain the squeal of delight that threatened to escape her. She loved these younglings, their passion in showcasing their skills their earlier determination to keep their friendship intact. The sexual tension she could smell wafting off of them any time they got too close. Oh, they couldn't fool her trained eyes, even if they'd tried. And even if the rosy duo didn't fully understand what they were doing themselves, the 18-plus only heroine could see clear as day the sexy delicacy unfolding before her. Each attack, each counter, each dodge, or step back, or roll. The two were slowly peeling away each other's clothes, be it by acid, hardened skin, or flying debris. There could be only one outcome. Come on Kiri. Don't you want to catch me? Mina taunted in a sing-song voice as she circled her best friend on another strafing run, splashing the redhead with more of her acid. Get serious and try to grapple me already. The horn girl would admit, to herself, that she was enjoying this fight. Maybe a bit too much. Yeah, they'd agreed to let the match play out so that they'd both get exposure and have a good time. But, at some point, their fun had evolved into something. Else. Mina slipped away again, enjoying the sight of even more of Ajiro's bare skin being exposed as her acid melted away his shirt and pants, even as she felt herself get closer to her, limit. She'd never used her quirk for this long moved this much, without a break in between before. Her tolerance, not to mention endurance, was running low. And that was totally the only reason the Rosette was feeling so hot as she raced around her best friend, why her skin itched whenever she got close during a strike, and why her insides burned whenever Ajiro scored another near miss and part, of her own uniform to wore off, exposing her to him. She was just getting tired. Jeez. You're so impatient. Ijiro laughed as he turned to face the now heavily breathing figure of his best friend. His tactic was working. While he could weather the storm, Mina would tire herself out with all her moving around. Suddenly, the redhead noticed a new development in regards to the rosette's uniform. A blushing grin spread across his face. Hey Mina. Love the birthmark by the way. Was that always on your tummy? The loudly asked question immediately froze the rosette in her tracks, utter mortification chilling her to the core as she belatedly realized she could feel a breeze against her left side and stomach area. Oh shit her quirk had melted her own uniform while she'd been distracted with, picking away Jiro's. What birthmark? Dot, Mina shrieked, wrapping her arms around her belly instinctively. You're mine now. Ijiro instantly reacted lunging forward with the power of a freight train. Two hardened hands snapped out, intent on capturing their target and forcing the redhead's best friend into a grapple. Once the two were on the ground, the match would be his. 
unable to decide if she'd been tricked or not, mine nearly, floundered as she barely had any time to react. Muscle memory won the day, and years of dance lessons kicked in. The panicking horn girl sidestepped at the last possible nanosecond, twisting to the side as gracefully as her tired body would allow. Rip. It wasn't quite enough. Mina had avoided the grasping hands headed her way, but her clothes, nearly in tatters at this point, had not. Ijiro missed his target, but the redhead had grabbed a hold of his best friend's purple and white spotted undershirt. The momentum he'd had due to his reckless charge combined with Mina's desperate move to evade. The abused garment was trapped between them, and as it had been locked in his death grip as he'd sailed by. E.A. Ijiro was flummoxed. He'd expected to have a handful of a squirming, and pink best friend. Instead, he was holding a piece of clo, Kaya'a. Flashing back to the nightmare that had been their USJ experience, Ijiro dropped the rag in his hands and immediately turned to check on Mina, her scream setting ice in his veins. Slap. A sizzling red mark in the shape of a hand on his hardened cheek, the manliest member of Class 1A could only watch in utter shock as, his best friend fled the stadium with her arms wrapped around her chest. Half naked. Way too much of her perfectly toned back was exposed, Ijiro's brain restarted with a jolt. Mina. The frantic redhead screamed as he fumbled after his escaping best friend, wait. I'm sorry. Hey. Midnight shouted after the scrambling competitors. Cheers, laughter and not a few cat calls all combined to nearly overpower even her speaker-enhanced voice. What about the match? The victor? The R-rated heroine was conflicted. On one hand, she really wanted to reprimand the red-headed blockhead for what he'd done. Exposing a girl like that in public? The truck? But on the other hand, she'd been watching too closely to know the move had been nothing more than an unfortunate accident. Could she really tan? His hide when he already looked so ashamed and horrified. Mina wins. Victory's hers. Ijiro shouted so loudly his voice could be heard even over the riled public. Not wasting any more time, the redhead jumped off the raised arena flooring and took off toward the exit tunnel his pink hued best friend had fled down as soon as his feet touched grass. Mina. I'm sorry. Ye. For a moment, Midnight stood there, clearly lost on what to do. Ashido had left the arena first, but Kirishima had forfeited. What to do? What to do? Suddenly, the domineering heroine Zermik crackled. All right. The domineering Ravnet murmured, nodding once before whipping her hand away from her ear. Well there you have it folks. Ashido wins by forfeit. The daredevil in pink will move on to the next stage of the tournament. Cheers and laughter in equal measure filled the air and shook the walls of the stadium. The match had been a success. Most viewers felt as if the playfulness and joy they'd witnessed during the round had lifted their own spirits. The rest? Well, they were happy to have gotten such a flashy fight. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Class 1A Seating Box. Hagakure. Mezo Shoji asked to the now wriggling UA gym uniform that appeared to be floating in its seat next to him, what exactly was that meant to accomplish? The gentle giant was not, in fact, referring to the last move of their red-headed classmate prior to the end of the third match. Instead, the multi-armed teen was directing his question to the knee-jerk reaction of the invisible girl sitting beside him, when Nashido's shirts had torn and her breasts had been exposed for the world to see for less than a split second, Hagakure had launched herself at Mezzo. The frantic girl had slapped her hands over the giant's eyes, only to realize right after that her efforts would be absolutely futile. I. I was, I didn't. Tar squirmed in place, conflicted on whether or not to tell her. Friend the truth. The. Last thing the unseen member of Class 1A wanted to do was get on his bad side, and she honestly didn't know how he'd react to the truth. It's just that, you. You shouldn't toggle a girl's boobies without permission. At the last second, Taru bailed, spouting something embarrassing instead of what she truly felt, her shaky confidence folding like a house of cards before the gentle gaze of the duplium user. 
there'd be time to reveal how she really felt. Later. I wasn't looking, Mezzo revealed calmly, keeping three eyes on the arena while the ones attached to his face stared down at Taru. I looked away the moment I realized Kirishima-san was going too fast to stop after grabbing Ashido-san's clothes. That fabric was barely holding together due to all of her acid, there could only be one outcome. Taru hunched in her seat, now feeling embarrassment and mortification for entirely different reasons. Oh! The invisible girl sighed, relief visibly sagging her shoulders. She was beyond grateful that no one else could see her massive blush. Sorry for overreacting. Witnessing such a scene unfolding beside him, Mezzo did something that, only a few weeks ago, he'd never have, considered doing. The gentle giant reached out. And gave his dejected classmate a head pat. Wisely, the multi-armed teen decided to ignore what sounded like a purr coming from the girl. Just as wisely, he chose not mention that the two were nothing more than friends, and that Hagakure shouldn't act like a jealous girlfriend. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Class 1B Seating Box, Next Partition Over, i.e. Bachan. Shishida stammered, the beastly teen absolutely frightened at the terrifying sight unfolding next to him, I saw nothing. At all. I swear. Beside the quivering intellectual, Shiyazaki's hair had gone wild, vines writhing through the air like thorny snakes. Even as her face remained impassive, the religious girl gave off an aura that promised pain. You shouldn't swear she kun the, plant-based heroine in training admonished flatly, refusing to break her thousand-yard stare. The complete juxtaposition of her calm tone against her violent hair was made all the more eerie when added to the fact that Shiyazaki hadn't blinked in over four minutes. The Lord doesn't like it. And neither did she of course. But at the moment the vine-haired teen was more focused on the fact that no, matter what he said, she knew she'd seen Shishida blushing when she turned to look at him after that 1A girl's accident. And really, Shiyazaki wouldn't have been so upset if the pink devil girl hadn't turned out to be so much more gifted than her. Lord give her strength. UA Sports Festival Stadium commentator press box. I'm so glad this year's flasher wasn't one of my kids. Hizashi, crowed, grinning widely at his friend and co-worker as the gruff man banged his head against their shared desk. I sure hope you're planning on getting that little listener prepared for what's coming. All those perverts who watch this thing just hoping for a wardrobe malfunction? She's just made their night. And I doubt they're planning on being quiet about it either. The two pros had turned off, their mix as soon as they'd seen what had happened, more to prevent any stray comments from leaking to the stadium at large than protocol, but that had only given Hisashi license to laugh all the harder. The blonde couldn't wait to see what unfolded over the next few weeks, his buddy might have tried to hide it, but he was one of the most overprotective teachers Yue had. To Aizawa, there was no such thing as overkill when it came to keeping his students safe from anything. Even internet trolls and perverts. While his longtime friend got his kicks off to his misery, Aizawa was mentally going over the lecture he knew he was now going to have to give those two idiots. Even if no one had been hurt, lack of situational awareness had led to both of them suffering, and it would be better to correct them now than later on down the line when it would be too late to keep a certain mistake from happening and one, or both of them would be forced to drop out of heroics. That being said, he was totally going to make it exceptionally agonizing this time, maybe break out some of the sex ed charts Nimri used to teach the second years? Choices, choices. Back in UA Sports Festival Stadium, contestant arena. After letting them wind down a little, Midnight eventually managed to wrangle the crowd back under an acceptable level of control. The festival had to continue. And really, it'd be best for Aizawa's kid if they moved on and everyone got distracted from what they'd seen of her wonderfully gifted young body. Ahem. The next fight was important in another way as well. A fan favorite, was taking the stage, and the R-rated heroine couldn't wait to pinpoint the imbecilic piece of shit that dared tamper with her tournament. A vicious grin carved a beautifully wicked track against the domineering Revnet's face. If Nezu Dearest didn't skin that dipshit alive, 
She sure as hell would. Maybe bring Hitoshi a souvenir? Could he even use a lyrinx if it was ripped out of someone's throat? Oh well, they'd find out. And now. From the northeast gate, hailing from the heroics course class 1B. He's big. He's strong. He's hard and can get even harder. IT's Tetsu 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 Tetsu. Stepping out of the tunnel and walking to the arena, the literal man of steel of class 1B couldn't help but scowl a bit, he wasn't against humor, hell, he was more than willing to serve as the butt of any joke if it made his friends laugh and feel happier. And he normally loved the energy of the voice hero, as a teacher and a hero, but... Really? Tetsu Tetsu growled, more to himself than anyone else. You're gonna use the exact same opening you used for that 1A look-alike? If it weren't for the cheering he was, receiving as he stepped onto the raised arena floor, the steely teen would have had to consider taking the joke as more of an insult. And from the southwest gate, IT's another class 1A contender. With a pedigree so prestigious he's almost royalty and a countenance already at the level of some pros. IT's Tenya Ida. As the stadium shook with wild applause and cheer, Tanya couldn't help but wince, at the over-the-top greeting. The speedster had learned long ago that he had to tune out the empty praise and expectations of glory that weighed upon his family name. His older brother had made it very clear to him, back when he'd first gotten his first engine blowout at four and a half, that he, Tanya Ida, was his own man. He was the only one who could decide how he would tackle his life. If, he wanted to be a hero, that was great, but his victories and defeats, especially today, would never impact his family's love for him. And look at that. The speedster of 1A has his OWN cheerleaders. Wait. Cheerleaders. Sure enough, as Tenya whipped his head to the side, the bespectacled team could see clustered together in the student section designated for business? Or was that support, regardless? A bunch of non-hero course girls were holding up signs with his name colored brightly upon them. Whipping back around, the thoroughly mortified speedster hoped that your Araka-san wouldn't take such a sight the wrong way. Needless to say, if the son of the Ida clan could see his class's seating section, he would have seen the rest of his classmates inching away from a now furiously, blank-faced brunette. They were smart enough to not let their eyes deceive them. The aura bleeding off of the gravity manipulator was deadly. All right gentlemen. Midnight called out, graciously receiving both competitors' attention, you know the rules by now. Begin. As expected, Tetsuya Tetsu immediately activated his quirk the second he was allowed. His skin rapidly turned to steel, and in no time, the manliest man of 1B was ready to give it his all in the fight. But the steely teen had learned his lesson since the last time he'd fought anyone. A Sawik and Seal had beaten it into even his metal head what his weaknesses had been, and the price he'd one day pay if he didn't work to correct them. Giving an opponent the chance to think, learn, and or adapt was a deadly mistake, and, underestimating anyone was just asking for pain or death. It was all well and good to be manly. But the manliest thing of all was making sure everyone came home at the end of the day. Perhaps a bit dark and macabre compared to how he'd been before, but Tetsuya Tetsu's therapist had said during their last meeting that he was progressing as well as could be expected through the trauma from the training. And if he'd had a few at-home study nights with Pony since everything went down? The doc hadn't disapproved. But back to business. To honor the two brutal teachers who'd taught him, Tetsuya Tetsu swore he was going to win. He'd learned his lesson, it was time to compare notes with 1A. The youngest son of Ida knew every well that he'd need to treat his opponent seriously. As a fellow, heroic student, the steel teen deserved nothing less of course. More than that, such a defensive quirk would put him at a supreme disadvantage right from the start. He'd have to give it his all if he wanted a chance to win. Just like that. The battle kicked into gear. Tenya accelerated forward in a blaze of speed, clearing the distance between the two opponents in a single second. But Tetsu Tetsu, had been ready for just that sort of attack. Boom. The Navy Speedster's enhanced sidekick crashed into the metal man's chest with an explosion of power and displaced hair. The monstrous collision stole the breath from many a spectator, 
but after the dust had cleared, Tetsutatsu was revealed to have not moved more than half an inch backward. What the? Tanya was understandably surprised. He'd been capable of kicking through a solid wood log 45 centimeters thick since he'd been a child, and while he hadn't expected one strike to be enough to be stopped like that? Aura. Tetsu Tetsu's shout jarred the speedster from his shock, but it was too late. The steely teen grabbed the offending limb lodged against his specs and yanked his opponent with all his might. Letting go immediately. The bespectacled teen was sent rolling behind him before he slowed enough to even attempt to stand back up. And what a start ladies and gentlemen. Ida's attempt at a surprise attack only left him as the one left in shock. Present mix on the ball commentary earned many positive reactions from the crowd. If the last match had gotten everyone excited and laughing, this match proved to be the battle of body and spirit they'd been waiting for. After all, who didn't love an underdog? What incredible strength! Tenya huffed, unable to keep from praising his opponent as he flipped onto his back prepared to spring back up to his feet as his brother had taught him. Perhaps he'd have to take a more intellectual approach. It seems I need to, grow up. There was barely any time to, react. In the blink of an eye, Tetsutetsu had counterattacked, unwilling to allow Tenya even the chance of getting back up. The speedster instead had to roll to the left to narrowly avoid a steel-covered elbow drop, courtesy of one B's manliest man. Boom. The arena's concrete flooring fractured, small pebbles scattering under the savage force of the metal man's impact. In a moment of complete, Randomosity, a stray piece of gravel shot out and managed to crash against the youngest Ida's glasses. Rolling again to get clear of ground zero, Tenya quickly jumped to his feet and put some real distance between himself and the metal monster he'd unexpectedly found himself facing. Since midnight hadn't stopped the fight, it was clear to the bespectacled teen that apparently destroying the arena wasn't against the rules. Quite an interesting fighting style. But then, it had been the height of arrogance and foolishness to believe his own style would have dictated the entire match. Once upon a time I would have labeled Tetsu Tetsu as brash and boastful and thoroughly dependent on his quirk's toughness. Now, however, I see that certain rigorous training methods have allowed him to grow as a hero, and discard much of his uneducated baggage. It seems he's learned a lot under Khan's tutelage. Eraserhead's rough words only worried the navy speedster down below. It seemed as if he wouldn't be able to keep enough room to breathe then. Pushing himself off the divot in the concrete he'd made, Tetsu Tetsu felt the monotonous words of praise fan the flames of his determination. You're not getting away. The metal man's roar almost sounded pained. Tenya didn't have time to think. The steely teen was on him, pressing forward blocking any chance for maneuverability. The speedster couldn't find a proper line for acceleration. Dodging was all he could do. To say he never felt so powerless before would have been an understatement for Tenya. He may have more speed than others, and a certain type of strength derived from that speed, but against this relentlessly offensive defense? His power would mean nothing if he couldn't get a chance to use it. In the stands, at home, at bars, in the streets, everywhere, the public was going crazy. It was a spectacle. The youngest Ida had been expected to win the fight hands down, but the tenacious Transformers' brutality was bringing around the odds with each passing second. Cries of support for both competitors rang through the air, and with every strike blocked or evaded, every blow that landed or glanced aside, civilians and pros alike got even more hyped up. UA Sports Festival Stadium Class 1A seating box. In his seat, Izuku could only silently seethe as he took in all the mindless bloodlust around him. What, sheep? Reaping pleasure on the backs of the suffering of children. Cheering for their pain. How, sinful. Coins traded hands and filled pockets freely. The greed of man unleashed to show their deprived, decadence. The pressure inside had built to a boiling point. Just as Izuka was about to erupt. Tenyakun. Okako Uraraka jumped to her feet and screamed so loudly that those of Class 1A feared the brunette would collapse her own lungs. 
The cry had not been unexpected, but what surprised those who listened was that the young woman had not bellowed so loudly with despair, but. You can FLY. Hope. Back in UA Sports Festival Stadium, contestant arena. Against all odds, Tanya managed to hear that one scream, that one shout of encouragement from the young lady on his mind. It should have been impossible. A cute and bubbly voice such as hers shouldn't have had the power to overcome the noise of thousands. But judging the speedster's suddenly stiffened posture, he had. You are going down. Tetya Tetsu roared, lunging into attack once again. Nothing about the match had changed for him, allowing his opponent any room at all would cost him dearly. Not today. Tanya shouted right back, making a lunge, of his own even though he had no room to accelerate, because, instead of the expected kick, the youngest he'd made a half-step and hopped, landing on Tetsuya Tetsu's chest. The speedster used the metal man's moment of confusion to push his engines, which had never stopped accelerating, into the next gear. Kicking downward with everything he had, Tanya launched himself into the air like a rocket. I can FLY, it wasn't his secret special move, Recipro burst, not by a long shot, but maybe it was best to keep his trump card for later anyway. And this move was close enough regardless, special in its own way as it reminded the speedster of the time he'd spent with the girl he was training with slash dating. Reaching the top of his arc, the youngest Ida gave it all he had, one of his engines shrieking with, the effort of gaining just a meter more. Doing this naturally caused his body to begin rotating, and when he finally heeded gravity's call and fell back to Earth, Tenya took all of that force and put it into accelerating even faster into a spiraling kick. The attack was too quick for Tetsuya Tetsu's inexperienced ties to follow, aerial combat something he'd never handled before. The spinning kick, found its mark, his head, and the force of impact alone was powerful enough to leave the metal man disoriented on top of being driven into the concrete like a railroad spike up to his waist. Tanya landed in a crouch, instinctively switching gears. Now pushing his other leg's engine to its limit, the speedster leaned forward to put every ounce of energy he had into this last attack. When something, went wrong. Crack. With a sinking feeling even amidst all the adrenaline, Tanya recognized the sound of his glasses breaking. The hairline fracture caused by the seemingly innocuous piece of gravel that had kicked up at the beginning of the fight, combined with the deadly g-forces of his new move, had proven too much for the athletic eyewear. Losing his eyesight, Tenya hesitated. He knew where his target was, but he just couldn't make himself move as smoothly now that he couldn't see. In turn, that threw off the youngest Ida's aim, missing Tetsuya Tetsu's head by barely a millimeter. The steely team, however, seized his chance. All it took was a stray to the face. Wham! Tenya skidded back onto the ground, face to the sky. He didn't get back up. And I tease lights out for the stiff speedster. The manly man of metal takes the clear win. The voice hero's words earned more than few groans, but mostly the audience had been too enthralled with the fight to notice. Many had been rooting for Ida either due to his pedigree or generally believing in the boy, while others had seen the young Transformer with the repetitive name and taken a liking to his impenetrable defense. Actually, normally only speaking as minimally as possible, the addition of a racer had caught everyone's attention. A massive screen on the jumbo screen flickered to life, and a rerun of the fight's last few seconds began to play. A slow effect was added as the camera zoomed in on Ida's glasses. It's entirely possible that this match could have ended differently if not for one single factor. Gear malfunction, is a very real hazard we, as heroes, deal without in the field. Both students did well, and I'm sure from now on they'll always remember to correct any defects in their hero personas, be they physical, psychological, or material. Loud applause answered the spur of the moment lesson and the stadium soaked in the wise words shared to them by one of the most mysterious underground pros in the world. Down in the ring, Tetsuya Tetsu pulled himself out of the ground with a heave of effort, scrambling to his feet as the cheering only got louder. Realizing his opponent was beginning to stir, the manliest man of 1B hobbled over and stuck out a hand to the downed Ida. 
Truly, the steely teen might have been ready to take on a behemoth at a moment's notice, but he was likewise always ready to be a real man and show proper sportsmanship. Midnight cooing at the action kicking off in front of her somewhat reduced the impact of the nascent moment however. Generally, the post-match vibes were positive, the fight had been intense and both students had shown their all. However, a certain pink-haired woman of middling age was not feeling too keen about how the third round had gone. UA Sports, Festival Stadium, 4th Level Balcony Room, Authorized Personnel Only. This. This isn't how it was supposed to go. Haruno growled from her hidden away vantage point, biting at her nails. How could a child of Ida lose to some no-name upstart? Tenya Ida had been meant to win that match. He'd had the quirk, the pedigree, and a carefully selected opponent. There was no way the son of some, random small-time transportation business could have hoped to compare to the blood of heroes. Steel was impressive, for what it was, but no commoner should have been able to develop such combat potential before they'd even finished their first year at UA perhaps. The quirk and the pedigree have less to do with a person's true potential than you think, me? The calm and eloquent voice, coming from, right behind the hidden security advisor, caused the woman to yelp in surprise. Whipping around, Haruno saw the thin woman from before, the one who'd been with Nezu. That smile, those oddly pitch black sunglasses, that mug of coffee. Why did such innocuous sights send a wave of dread crashing through her? Haruno felt as if her heart was beats away from freezing up at any moment. Well now, you did, exactly as I knew you would. Smith chirped, light-hearted snickering contrasting with the growing weight of malevolence the pinkette could feel crushing her every second. I guess it's time for us to get to know each other a little better. What do you say? Had Haruno been able to move? The middle-aged woman would have run as far away from the younger Ravnet as fast as her body would have allowed, but her legs refused to move. Creak. And the door to her room had just closed. There was no escaping now. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. With the damage to the ring having been more spot-specific than widespread, Cementos took his time to refill Tetsu Tetsu's divots individually deciding to leave the few piles of debris that had managed to accumulate for later, after the entire, first set of matches had been completed. Meanwhile, the next two competitors were making their way from the waiting room to their entrance tunnels. At her spot, Midnight stood and surveyed the stadium, for once at ease. The order of the tournament might have been obviously fixed beyond acceptable levels, There'd now been a fight that proved students would still be able to showcase their skills and power just fine. The Ravnet had to wonder though, what was the thinking for putting these two against one another? And now, from the northeast gate, rising up from humble beginnings and wielding strong discipline and determination as skillfully as she does her fists, IT's the class president and big sister of the heroics course 1B. Itsuka Kendo. From the tunnel stepped the muscular ginger, herself, Itsuka Kendo sprinting those last few meters to the arena. Nervous as she was, and as embarrassed as the intro had made her feel, the martial artist still managed to wave to the cheering public and the flashing cameras. A big smile and clear eyes reflected the young woman's heart, easily understood by her family and friends back home, she was here to do her best for the world to see. The crowd quieted and from the southeast gate, sporting a pedigree worth a country-sized diamond, an educated mind fit for a queen, and a body that makes even PRO heroines green with envy, IT's the president of the heroics course 1A. Momo Yerazu. As the mature young woman gracefully glided out from the shadow of her tunnel, the raucous cheering that met her could not have contrasted her more. It, wasn't that the heiress was nervous or even embarrassed by being announced in such a way and had clammed up. In actuality, Momo had just been raised and trained from a young age to never let mentions of her wealth affect her, at least on the outside. And that left her walking up to the arena with all the regal stiffness of a monarch. Of course, when the cheering began to take on a more lewd tone, the young Ravnet was happy she'd taken such lessons in her childhood. I will remind all of you right now that these young heroines in training, 
regardless of their development in any way, are still legally considered minors. They're protected by laws their seniors aren't, especially those regarding inappropriate attentions. So don't try it. The cold, gravelly words of the erasure, hero caused a ripple of nervous chuckling to roll through the stadium. Luckily, it also managed to successfully quiet the looter cheers that both girls had begun to pick out from the general noise. And as another reminder, as their teachers, misbehavior of any sort from us will also be swiftly punished, Aizawa growled to his friend, flicking his mick off before anyone could hear the venom in his voice. By Nezu. Jeez. Chill out. Hizashi warbled, a nervous tick flaring up as he moved his hands in a placating gesture. Since when were you Mr. Sensitive when it comes to your students? The other UA faculty member presiding over the tournament, meanwhile, was sure as hell not glancing at the young Yerazu with envy, hell no. She was the definition of sensuality and provocation, she, plagued the dreams and nightmares of youngsters and adults alike, she changed the very laws with her daring. Oh who was she kidding? She envied that girl her metabolism something fierce. It just wasn't fair. As soon as the heiress had realized that she didn't have to follow her parents' restrictive dietary rules when in lunch Russia's domain, Momo had quickly indulged in the one habit she loved, with a passion that her mother and father absolutely detested. Eating like a goddamn pig. Or, now she could say, is Yuku after heavy quirk use. For a normal person, Gorging as much as the air Aussie girl would in one sitting was unhealthy at best and dangerous at worst. Not to mention regular people could hardly stomach watching her when she really got going, in fact many of the boys who'd come sniffing around the princess those first weeks of the semester had been immediately put off by witnessing their goddess scarf down three double burgers in as many minutes, as her appetizer. And through all that eating, the heiress hadn't appeared to have gained a single pound. A quick study in recovery girl's office, not that midnight had been eavesdropping, had, revealed that the air Aussie girl had actually been underweight this entire time. She needed to eat at least three times as much as the everyday Joe, or her quirked physiology began to wither. Privately, Momo had been utterly over the moon at the news. While she loved them dearly, watching her parents get officially scolded for enforcing a diet detrimental to the growth of one of Japan's future heroes had been a treat. And if she had in fact gained some weight over the past few months, well, it had all gone to places she was sure no one would complain about. No one but her and her back that is. All right ladies. Midnight called out, shaking herself back to reality, remember the rules, no dirty fighting but otherwise anything goes. Begin. Years of training her body to react instantly, snapped Tsuka into motion hurtling toward Momo like a fiery missile. The martial artist knew that the creation user was more dangerous the longer she was given time to think and use her quirk, so the only chance she had was to go on the offensive and never stop. Just like Tetsuya Tetsu had. She too had learned her lesson. What was the difference between 1A and 1B? What did it take to be, selected for that other, seemingly more prestigious class? The only difference Itsuka could find was their lack of hesitance. They leapt to fight, to defend, while others stayed back. She was guilty of it. Even as the president and big sister of Class 1B, she'd hesitated against Nevsta. The villainess had been an unknown, and that had been enough for her to not go all in. She'd been unsure, would her opponent play fair? What was her combat style? Those questions had been nothing more than the excuses of a girl afraid to put her life on the line to save others. And she didn't want to be that little girl anymore. Already, her opposite in 1A had faced down an entire gang of rapists and murderers, knowing full well the fate that awaited her should she have lost to such scum. Yerazu had tackled the threat head on, with no hesitation, all to protect her friends. Itsuko had sworn, first to herself, then her dad, her friends, her therapist, anyone who'd listen. She was going to change herself. She was going to become that hero who'd never hesitate. And this would be her first step. Hi. The war cry resonated through the air as Itsuka swung a gigantified hand at Yerazu in, a classic cross chop. 
The creation user pulled a rudimentary kite shield from her stomach, slinging the sheet of iron up at the last second. Thwack! The impact shook both combatants, but Itsuka noticed something. Off! Yerazu had almost sailed to the side, as if she'd been hit with far more force than she knew she'd put into the strike. What was she up to? Huddled behind her shield, Momo skid. Over the concrete a fair distance from her opponent. Standing tall, the Ravnet lowered her creation and showed off a rather playful smirk. Clever. Itsuka murmured, finally realizing what had happened. You jumped in the direction of my attack, reducing the impact and getting you more distance. Instead of answering, Momo began to strafe to the side, a move that she could see her fiery opponent recognized as her bidding her time. As long as she didn't, oh ah ooh ah ah ah. Itsuka roared as she dashed toward Yerazu again, covering the distance in an instant once again due to her rigorous training. It was time to unleash her assault. Bam! A powerful jab, but this time there was no quirk use. If the heiress was just going to use her own force against her, then she'd just keep it hold, school to keep the pressure up. Bam! The jab flowed into a kick, forcing the creation user to take a step back or take a foot to the gut. It was moments like these that made Itsuka glad she'd followed her dad's bush at o in regards to martial arts, as goofy as the man could be sometimes. While most practitioners nowadays couldn't separate themselves from their quirks, becoming dependent on them to perform the moves they'd learned, she'd been taught the original way of doing things. That was to say, quirklessly. Itsuka didn't make a point to bring it up, but she'd gone through her own kind of hell to make sure she'd mastered her family's style without ever having to activate Big Fist if she needed to. Now that perseverance was paying off in spades as she dominated an opponent who'd been meant to be her superior. Bam! A second, lightning-fast roundhouse kick. The power behind the strike was enough to rip the desperately held shield from Class 1A's princess, leaving Yerazu defenseless. Victory at hand, Itsuka decided she wasn't going to leave anything to chance. Normally she'd never consider being so brutal to a friend, and Yerazu was a friend, but her counterpart needed to learn this lesson apparently. Over-reliance on one's quirk, complacency with one's abilities, those were ingredients for one's downfall. Just as they'd proven to be the Ravnets today. Spinning as she came down from her kick, Itsuka activated her quirk as her body rotated around, gathering momentum to deliver an overwhelmingly powerful chop with the back of her hand to Yerazu. This was going to be the end. Crack. Gah. Itsuka's cry of agony caused many who were watching the beat down to wince in sympathetic pain. Stumbling back, the red-headed president of 1BD activated her quirk, shocks pulsing through her hand. Already a bruise was forming along the side, and her pinky and ring fingers were bent at odd angles. On top of that, the rest of the entire limb wouldn't respond, either. Itsuka's hand was entirely broken. Lifting watering tea lies up. The martial artist zeroed in on her opponent, quickly understanding exactly what had happened. Yerazu had created a pair of tonfas from her forearms, probably when she'd been in mid-spin, and had raised the solid weapons together to aggressively block her attack. And now the Ravnet was charging at her. I'm sorry, Momo shouted, beginning her counter-assault. The heiress mightn't have been an official martial artist per se but she did have years of weapons training under her belt that may or may not have been done in secret from her parents. The tonfas flew with grace and precision, targeting non-lethal zones that would nonetheless incapacitate any recipient with enough repetition. To Momo's surprise, her strikes managed to land true more often than not. Each swing, each successful attack caused her opponent to cry out in pain. And take a step back. Already they were almost to the edge of the arena. Whoa. 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 This battle just got entirely one-sided folks. What happened? Present mix commentary almost didn't overcome the sheer volume of the loudly cheering stadium audience, but just, barely did. If she weren't trying to keep from getting the ever-loving shit beaten out of her, Kendo's pride would have been hurt at such a blatant description of the fight's turnaround. While Kendo had the right idea in the beginning, 
Her initial analysis is what ultimately failed her. She perceived Yerazu's shield as the largest obstacle between her attacks and her opponent, and with anyone, else it might have been. But against someone with near limitless potential when it comes to creating objects on the fly, a single shield is nothing. Instead, Kendo should have gone for something that would have actually affected Yerazu regardless of what she schemed, like her balance. That would have assured she couldn't utilize her intellect and come up with this plan. Hearing her homeroom teachers, words caused Momo to wince. There was no great scheme or multi-step plan. She'd only used a shield to hold Kendo off because it was one of the most basic things she knew how to create. After she'd stayed in the game long enough, she'd been able to create her tonfas. Those in turn were really only tools to buy time while she slowly recounted how to build a taser. Itsuka used that split second Momo wasted to wince and did the only thing she could think of, she tackled her fellow class president to the ground, erasing the Ravnet's range advantage. She wouldn't be able to use the tonfa effectively if she couldn't build up a little momentum behind them. The suddenness of the move threw Momo off balance, but as she fell, she managed to twist, toss her creations away, and grab hold of the now, shocked martial artist. Shifting into a half judo throw, the Ravnet ensured that at the very least her red-headed rival wouldn't come out of their encounter with the upper hand. Ah! Itsuka bit down on her pain as she fell on her broken hand, the hot wave of prickling agony washing over her and leaving her stunned for three whole seconds. That was more than enough time for Momo to grab her opponent's legs, step over her, and put her into a full Boston Crab hold. Gah. Hearing their class president and big sis cry out in such gut-wrenching agony tore at the hearts of class 1B, but none made any attempt to stop the fight. Not only would it have been a fruitless endeavor, but they knew better than to interfere in the battle between warriors. Midnight, having watched the entire match, from the best seat in the house, decided at that moment that the criteria for win by submission had been fulfilled and stepped closer to the two girls to ask if Kendo wished to yield. Seeing the heroine, an inspiration for young Japanese girls everywhere, walking toward her sparked the redhead's flickering spirit into full blaze. Itsuka Kendo made her last stand, pushing ever bit of wool she had had left into her quirk, Itsuka managed one last activation in her good hand. With the momentary enhanced strength of the enlarged limb, the martial artist pounded the ground under her. Thump. The desperate strength was just enough and Momo was unseated, this time leaving the Ravnet as the one stunned on the ground for a couple of seconds. Scrambling, the martial artist used that scant time as best she could. Jumping on top of Momo, Itsuka positioned herself over the heiress and grabbed for her shirt so she could use her elbow and smack her into submission. Then things went. Weird. Kyle. Instead of the expected cry of pain, a delightful sound escaped Momo's lips. The pitch gave Itsuka pause, and that was enough for the redhead to notice her hand, had grabbed something more than just the collar of the heiress shirt. Looking down, the martial artist realized she'd gotten a fierce grip on Momo's breast. I. Itsuka failed to formulate any sentence whatsoever. What did one say in this kind of situation? Instead of immediately letting go, as she didn't want to give her opponent the chance to attack her in turn. The president of 1B shifted, slightly, causing Momo to lift her knee instinctively. Right between her opponent's legs. Nerves of an entirely different sort lit up in Itsuka's brain as a certain sensitive area was stimulated. The feeling. Didn't feel bad. Like, at all. Unfortunately for some unfathomable reason, possibly the unexpectedly addictive sensation of lightning coursing through her brain, Itsuka found herself squeezing the large breast captured in her good hand in return. There was no moan this time. Looking down at Momo with teal eyes beginning to haze over, Itsuka found the Ravnet glowering back at her with a cold glare. BZZZT. The nice feeling electricity that had been scrambling Itsuka's brain was immediately replaced by agonizing bolts of actual electricity as a taser was jabbed into her side. Right under her own cloth-bound chest and between two ribs, the device's discharge sent the martial artist into a muscular seizure, and Momo quickly stood up as soon as her opponent collapsed off of her. 
Then she tastes the martial artist again. Bzzzzt. And then a third time for good measure. Bzzzzt. And that's the match. Midnight cut in before Momo could go for a fourth jab, a stiff grin on the dominatrix cum heroine's face. Itsuka Kendo is unable to continue, victory goes to Momo Yerazu. The stadium erupted in cheers, the outcome finally lining up with what had been expected. Immediately civilians and pros alike began discussing the fight they'd just seen with their neighbors, points and counterpoints whizzing through the air like bullets. Here and there, a quick-winded soul or two, even managed to save and back up clips of the soon-to-be-famous groping moment for later study. Redacted, underground facility, redacted, redacted. From amongst the refurbished machines whirring away around him, a man wearing an accented plague mask scowled as he read another output of data from the generation's old computer that took up a majority of his desk. The racket from the TV placed. On the table beside him was grating on his nerves, his itch to cleanse the world of the infection that had engulfed it flaring uselessly. Such decadence and corruption. Each and every one of them. Are sick and putrid on the inside, the man said to himself as he watched a recap of the first event. The flickering screen landed on a still image of the event's winner, the monster wearing the skin of, a boy. But I'll bring them all the medicine you so desperately need. But you. For you there will only be death. Strapped to an old hospital gurney behind the masked man, a small girl laid as quietly as possible, hoping her closed eyes and slowed breathing would pass for sleeping and she'd be left alone. Her old rags had apparently ended up dirtied beyond saving during the last operation, so now, a large shirt almost engulfed her, but that was fine. Its size covered the slight flinches she couldn't help as her father began to quietly rage at the picture box next to him. Time had taught the girl that it was better to be as non-existent as possible when her father got like that, otherwise she'd be punished severely. And those were worse than even the punishments she'd get for not eating, all the yucky paste she was given to eat on a daily basis. Even though it was gone now, she could still feel the phantom pain of the hole they'd cut into her throat and the tube they jammed into, it when she last refused the paste. At least now she got an apple along with the paste. But that didn't make up for what came after. Needles still really hurt, and being conscious while she was, ripped apart whenever her father needed something else deeper inside her always made the day a nightmare that never ended. Today though, had been special. Unlike anything else had ever been to her. Her father had always called her a monster worth only what was inside her, the key to wiping out all the sick people outside. But she'd never seen another monster before. Until earlier today, the monster of UA the moniker resonated inside the little girl's heart far stronger than she'd believed possible, I want to meet him, that monster. Maybe we could be happy together, away from people we could hurt. Oh make blood and science for Chio Shuzenji, her birthday might have well have come early. The day she was able to properly study cursed blood had finally come. And she was ecstatic. Recovery girl had been nearly frantic over the past weeks, gathering over 20 presentations for why certain procedures should be allowed, and had given them all to Nezu for review. While many she desired to carry out had been denied, many more of the most needed ones had still been approved. Will that be all? Is Yuku asked eyeing the two adults that had taken over the testing lab as he sat, in the padded chair. His arm was still turned up and had an four-line lodged in its biggest vein. When the young necromancer had heard that Lily's father, the infamous Takeo Go, had basically moved into UA medical wing, he'd been understandably nervous. Fortunately, or unfortunately, just as Lily had prophesied, the massive scientist had barely bothered them at all after that first day. Apparently, studying the data coming in from his quirk consumed a lot of the bald man's time. It better have, he'd only checked on Lily once a week since finding her again. And while Izuku wouldn't say anything yet, he could clearly see, and feel, how that fact affected the littlest zombie's mood. Not yet, Go replied sternly, not quite glaring at him with no little animosity, you still must, verbally commander. Quirk to cooperate with the tests. It seemed that neglectful as he was, 
and as absorbed in his work as he was, Takeogo would remain a resentful father. Well shit. Here, recovery girl said, handing Izuku a sheet of paper, read this to the test tubes, then you can go. The Verdana pulled out the four before either scientist could and got to his feet, grabbing the paper, from the elderly nurse. Giving the words a once over, the necromancer almost failed to hold in a snort. To my blood, quirk of mine, hear me. Is you could dutifully recited, almost cringing at how bad the words spilling from his mouth were. It was clear to him that whoever had written these lines had had no idea what they were doing to rhythm and rhyme at the time. It was atrocious. But he read on. The, tests to come are yours to heed. Their aid is mine, your master, as your limitations I seek to know. Your power is mine and it is for the people these trials you'll undergo. Obey and remain, time your foe, until no longer your strength you can sustain. When he was finished, his Yuku did end up giving a small snort, followed immediately by a small apology. He couldn't help but think it was kind of, hilarious though. These agents of science had just assumed his stylistic approach to giving his quirk verbal commands was the only way to make his blood obey him. Was he being too dramatic? That's it, you can go now, recovery girl said, motioning toward the exit, only to change gears at the last second. Remember to come back for the results after the festival. I might have to be on call as usual but the tests will still be going on for the duration. I'm sure our findings will be as beneficial to you." Izuku nodded, giving a warm, sincere smile to the elderly nurse. He was grateful to her. For finally letting him leave this claustrophia-inducing place. Just as the Verdana turned around to face the door to freedom, he was met with a wall of muscle. You tell Miss Sal that Pappy will, be taking her to the movies this Saturday, Go said, his tone low enough that it was clear he was in no way asking. The menacing glare helped too. And I do not want to be hearing you have been making her cry when we go. The young necromancer gave a firm nod before fleeing the area. Would it kill the guy to be less aggressive with even the simplest of things? A moment of silence filled the lab, all right, let's begin tack kun. Chio cried with a cheerful voice, nearly hopping in place if her old bones had let her. It's time to see what makes this quirk really tick. A stoic nod from her giant of a co-worker, one she'd acquired. Sometime in the past. Was all the elderly nurse needed. Faster than one would expect from one her age, Chio moved about and had set up cameras to properly record. Their research before Tak Kun had even looked away from the door he'd been glaring at. Test number one, reanimation activation limit. Several rats had been laid upon a table the lot ranging from two days dead to six hours fresh. Each and every one had met their end at the hands of recovery girl's scalpel, or had been subjects in other tests focused samples of other rat students with flesh and or blood related quirks. The results, they made Joe clench her teeth. 24 hours. The elderly nurse grumbled, on the goddamn dot. There went her dream of reviving the greatest heroes of old and ushering in the second golden age of heroics. It's at least consistent with what has been previously observed, Tack Gun said, going over old notes and writing down extensive new ones. In the Nika Ido case, the father was unable to be raised, while the daughter faced no issues. The only difference was time and cause of death. The latter had already been ruled out as a contributing variable. It was still disheartening to the elderly nurse as she prodded one of the dead rats fruitlessly. It had been dead for only 24 hours and 5 minutes but gave as little response as one of the ones that had been dead for 2 days, now. Meanwhile, one that had been prepared only 23 hours and 55 minutes ago sat within arm's reach, staring at her as if waiting for a command. Its glowing scarlet gaze was disturbing. Well, as disappointing as this was. Chiu eventually said, causing Tak Kun to look up from his work. Let's continue with the next test. Go personally found nothing bad at all in regards to the test's results. 24 hours to reanimate a corpse was an extraordinarily large window. There was the easily considered limitation that a clever villain could just hide away the bodies of victims to render the ability null, but still. 
Even then, the brat could just use his blood as a truth serum if they captured said villain. But he didn't have enough data to determine which was a worse fate. Test number 2 Response and Connection to Immunology Izuku Midrayo was not the first regenerator that Recovery Girl had studied in her long and storied career in the medical field, but he was the first to apparently wield absolute immunity. As a given, regenerators healed quickly, so much so that in some cases there were reports of illness and diseases passing without notice entirely until routine. Blood work was done and the resultant antibodies were found. However, not every regenerator was so lucky and using their natural abilities as a treatment for others had been outlawed by the UN decades ago anyway after a scientist in some America city with a nice cork had gone mad when he'd diagnosed his ill wife as terminal. He'd frozen her solid and then had proceeded to kidnap every man, woman, and child he could find with quirks even remotely related to healing blood and cut them to pieces, all to test and see if those quirks could act like rudimentary vaccines. It was for those reasons that diseases that attacked the immune system were still a huge problem today. That also didn't factor in that those with quirks that granted them some degree of personal immunity or advanced regeneration could still be carriers for said viruses and risked infecting others while feeling fine themselves. In the face of all of that medical history, Midraya seemed to be the exception. Finally being granted Tayyamada's file, after citing its use for the tests, had brought to light some rather disturbing revelations. According to the document, the undead young woman had been afflicted by no less than a dozen severely insidious sexually transmitted diseases, some of which had only even come into existence thanks to the quirk era. Two of those dozen, one in old hanger on from the past and the other one of the newer strains, were viruses that relentlessly attacked immune systems and were effectively incurable by the natural body, even quirk. And yet, the last test done on Miss Yamada showed that every trace of those dozen of diseases was now gone. All thanks to Madraya's quirk. But this is impossible. Tak Kun shouted from one of the printers as he read the data gathered from the antibodies test. According to this, Madraya Sen has never been sick. Chio felt a shot of adrenaline light up her creaking joints as she bolted over and snatched the papers from Tak Kun's large hands. Perhaps her other dream, of developing a true panacea from the Verde Nets super antibodies, could still come true? I knew the quirk was strong, the elderly nurse tittered as she began to scan the readouts, but never. He was in direct contact with a disease-ridden corpse, a bleeding corpse, four hours a while back. Imagine the antibodies from that experience. That's not what I meant, Tack Gunn said, shaking his head. The mountainous man pointed to a few key lines on the paper. See, there's nothing. It's as if Madraya-san has never been exposed to. To anything at all. Ever. Like he lives in a sealed box. A thorough once over, clear of preemptive excitement, had Chio biting back a sailor's curse. All the results. Every one. Was negative. There were no signs of the antibodies that should have been produced from the last seasonal outbreak of the flu. There were no overactive allergy markers, no hereditary inheritances. There wasn't even a single antibody from the universal rhinovirus group that the general populace received. Nothing. Did you run a blank by mistake? The question was given with no little amount of despair and grasping at straws. The results in their hands, should not have been possible. Even the most powerful regenerator on record had antibodies from the mutation quirk fighting off infections. Hell, the fever Madraya Sand had reported had during the USJ incident was proof enough that he had some kind of immunological response. Right? I ran the test five times. Tak Kun reported, scarred face grim. There's something. Else. Going on here. Let's run, another test. Separate this time. Chio could only nod. This required immediate investigation, and if they hadn't cleared the coming test with Nezu then they'd have to beg for forgiveness later. Minutes later. Through a special attachment that projected a certain finely tuned microscope sight onto a monitor, both Chio and Tak Kun were able to closely examine the hastily put together petri dish, currently under scrutiny. The dish contained a small amount of Madraya's blood, 
untainted from the rat tests. Surprisingly, and perhaps thanks to the Verdanet's orders, not only were the boy's red blood cells visible, but so too were translucent microorganisms. Cursed blood itself. While they did their best to hide it, neither scientist could completely hide their unease at the sight of the insectoids? Mollusks? Crustaceans? Ready? Chiu asked with as much calm as she could muster. Ready, Tak Kun replied, syringe in hand. The experiment would be simple in principle. Midraya's blood would be exposed to a shot of blood infected with AIDS. Could it be considered unethical? Perhaps, but they needed to know how it was possible that as healthiest student had no observable, immunological history. With the skill and care of a career scientist, Go injected the infected blood into the dish and immediately looked at the monitor. On the screen, the powerful microscope recorded what could only be considered the bloodiest and most gruesome wholesale slaughter ever recorded. On the microscale at least. As soon as the AIDS virus had touched a single red blood cell that had a microorganism attached to it, the quirk entities as a whole had gone into a frenzy akin to starving piranha. Every piece of biological matter the microorganisms could find they ripped apart and rendered down into base components. The deadly virus, so effective at entering the cells meant to hunt them, was torn asunder with extreme prejudice. Infected white blood cells, normally the Trojan horse, the virus used to enter new hosts, were butchered with gleeful violence. Even the few remaining foreign red blood cells that had been healthy were dismantled without pause or hint of mercy. And then, when there were only fragments and chains of proteins left, the quirk entities feasted, devouring their haul like gluttons. Meanwhile, Midrayo's own white blood cells? They hadn't even had a chance, to react. A few had managed to wade into the feeding frenzy, but instead of ending up food for the microorganisms, the quirk entities had herded the stray cells to safety as if they were misbehaving children the answer had turned out to be more simple and yet far more horrifying than expected midrayo was immune to diseases not because he developed super soldier antibodies thanks to his quirk or had quirk produced resistances nor because his body could differentiate friend from foe but because anything that wasn't a part of him was seen as food by his quirk Anything not all natural Midrayo was marked for immediate death and dismantling, storage or consumption. And there went her dream of making the world's only true panacea. Sensei, Tak Kun whispered, I think it's time we bring out the special toys. Chio nodded, it was all she could do. Test hash X, redacted, Go held a larger syringe now, intently glaring at a zombified rat. All cameras, save one had been turned off. The incinerator in the corner of the room, meant for biologically hazardous waste, had been fired up and its door was already open and waiting. There was no way to know what would happen as a result of, this unsanctioned experiment, but being able to quickly and quietly destroy evidence of its existence was a must. And anyway, they'd report it if it was successful. If not, well no one needed to know it ever happened. Especially the brat. There you go. Go rumbled as he injected the staring rat with his nano machines. Now your secrets will be ours and we'll see how you really work. The intent, behind this experiment was simple and straightforward, they needed to know how Madrayo's microorganisms actually operated. Go's nanites would latch onto the samples in the test rat and record every speck of data they could. There was so much they didn't know. How did they replicate? How did they repair tissue, or replace cells? Did they communicate? Go's true purpose in proposing this experiment was for the hope that he could find a way to program his nanites to act like the brat's quirk. If he succeeded, he'd be able to free Miss Sal from the brat's quirk, and return his baby boy to his waiting arms. In the blink of an eye, something went wrong. Screech! The rat Go had injected suddenly went berserk, its muscles bulging too unnatural proportions as the glow of its eyes became brighter and harsher. Just as suddenly, the rest of the zombified rats began to screech as well. As one, the undead vermin jumped at the two scientists. Ow! Both Jill and Go screamed in sheer terror, 
the pain of bites and scratches hardly registering in the moment as their fight or flight responses dials over completely to flight. As they panicked, the rats ran all over the bodies of the two scientists, rampaging the entire time. With one last collective screech, the rats left the duo to their fear and pain and jumped away. Before either Chiu or Go could think to stop them, the undead vermin made a break for the incinerator and without pause committed mass suicide. Silence fell upon the lab immediately after, the roar of the incinerator's flames the only sound audible. Snapping back to herself thanks to years of walking into the world's worst disasters as a part of relief efforts, Chiu managed to scramble over to the blood samples that hadn't been injected into the rats. Maybe they still had a chance, Black. Every test tube, petri dish, and slab they'd kept samples in now showed the blood inside had blacked, as if it had already coagulated and rotted away. Chiu managed to scramble over to the blood samples that hadn't been injected into the rats. Maybe they still had a chance, Black. Every test tube, petri dish, and slab they'd kept samples in now showed the blood inside had blacked, as if it had already coagulated and rotted away. Any further experimentation was no physically impossible. At least we learned something, Chiu muttered, so, not a total loss. No sooner had the elderly nurse spoken than the speakers set into her lab ceiling crackled to life. Chiu san, Da Kyo kun. Please report to my office. Now. Nezu. Didn't sound pleased. At all. Chapter 30, Sinister Retaliation. Magnus, time to finish the first round of matches. I'll attempt to get the next stage into just one chapter, but I make no promises. Also, thank you for your continued support. It is true and valuable to us. Disclaimer, for those that think that the tone of the story has shifted, just remember that these few chapters haven't been seen from Izuku's perspective. Just, because he sees the world as bleak and unforgiving, it doesn't mean that his classmates see the same. Inside an oddly clean bar of seedy disposition, more so due to its stingy outward facade than the fact it was hidden away from public and heroic eye alike, mad scribbling and giggles could be heard if one were to listen closely. Yes. Yes. Shigaraki's nearly sang, his rasping voice dangerously, close to cracking. The blanchette was hunched over his spot at the bar, working over an old notebook, a healer that's not a trucking glass cannon. What a rare NPC. Scribble. Scrib B L E. Scribble. Comes with his own minions too. The handsy villain's grin, covered by the one hand he almost never removed, would have chilled the blood of any normal person who witnessed it. It had crossed the line, beyond creepy long ago. That means I don't have to waste high level fodder on escorting him around. Scribble. Scribble scribble. Leadership's a bit high though. Shigaraki mused pausing in his writing as he flicked his wild gaze to the misty bartender patiently cleaning a pristine glass across from him. Oi, Kiragiri. Should I nerf the healer's charisma before putting him in the party? The dapperly dressed villain gave a low sigh at the question. Between his charges antics and those of the thoughtless children being paraded about on the television, the misty bartender had long ago crossed from simply irritated and had landed in flat out annoyed. Thankfully he was distracted from the latest cause of his ire before he could give a knee-jerk reaction. Another of his annoyances, the, sports festival's too loud announce a present Mick, rather obnoxiously remarked about one of his own students losing their clothes. What an idiot. Before considering lowering another's charisma. Kuragiri trailed off, considering how to word his opinion without inciting another childish tantrum from his charge. Wouldn't it behoove you to attempt to raise your own first? There was a pregnant pause, and Kuragi re-wondered if he'll be wiping up piles of dust again after closing for his words. The child sitting at his bar frowned, as if actually considering his words. Or more likely, whether or not to make his death a messy one or a brutal one. Why would I need more charisma? Shigaraki eventually replied, tilting his head in honest confusion. Last I checked, that stat looked high, enough to me. Compared to whom? Kuragiri asked, completely out of reflex without a stitch of thought beforehand. 
At that moment, the monitor stuck in the wall of the bar flickered to life, the words audio only glowing on the screen. I see you've taken my suggestion to heart young Tamora. Good. Instantly, both Shigaraki and Kuragiri stood at attention, neither making a sound. It went without, saying that it was not their turn to speak. Your study of this boy will be imperative for the future, make no mistake. When the time comes, his quirk, and all its power, will ultimately serve you better as a willing ally rather than a forced servant. So take your time young Tamura, and do all you can to understand him. The handsy villain grinned, wide and sick. This side quest had just been, revealed to be way more important to the main story than he'd previously thought and his proactive approach had caught his teacher's attention. Not only had he gotten the green light to continue, but also what sounded like permission to put a lot more focus into it than he'd been willing to before. This was going to be so much fun. He'd have to put together his own walkthrough though first. For, once a potential ally was squarely on the enemy's side from the start, and he'd never dealt with that particular mechanic before. There's something else you could learn from this boy as well young Tamora. The remark caused Shigaraki to stiffen slightly, wondering what he missed. The Blanchette hoped he hadn't disappointed his teacher somehow. That was never... pleasant. Sensei. The handsy, villain asked lowly, noting how his mentor's tone had changed ever so slightly. There was a pause. This. Madraya. Whether he knows it or not is able to deeply influence those around him. Watch him, and observe this. Discern the patterns of speech and interaction that give him this skill. And endeavor to make it your own. If you do, it will be you who influences him in the end. Shigaraki, nodded silently, taking his teacher's words to heart. To the side, Kuragiri scoffed in his head. Hadn't he just told his charge basically the same thing? Yes sensei. Shigaraki said, the response heartfelt and full of purpose. The Blanchette had made up his mind, it was time to raise his charisma. He wished he'd have thought of that sooner. Without another word, the wall monitor cut out, redacted. Cutting his communication to the bar, a sinister figure growled into the dark as he returned a specialized breathing apparatus to its place over his mouth and nose. He'd finally received all the information he'd been able to acquire about the boy, and he'd been left with more questions than answers. It turned out he hadn't been kept in the dark about the nascent necromancer by some new player after all, he'd just been misinformed from the start. The doctor who'd scouted a four-year-old Madraya had chalked his quirk's potential up to minor at best and useless at worst, both because it was a mutant type, and because, at the time, its observable characteristics had seemed laughable. That doctor would no longer be giving such inaccurate reports. Then, the QRA, in all its standard, incompetence, had decided to neglect all aspects of its job in keeping a vigilant eye on the boy over the years. Even when red flag after red flag had popped up, they'd done nothing but sweep the paperwork under the rug. By the time the boy had created his first enthralled zombie, it had been too late. Too many eyes had been the boy to attempt a kidnapping. And at the time, even he himself, in all, his knowledge and wisdom, hadn't seen the boy as anything more than a fascination, a distraction. Never a real priority. Then his successor had played his little game at the USJ. Interpol had come onto the scene, and he'd been forced to keep his involvement even further removed for the time being. Not that he feared the spooks, oh no. Dealing with such monsters wasn't a problem when even nastier, ones lurked in your own shadows. However, without the advantage of being able to strike without notice, any action he'd have been able to take in his current state would have led to unacceptable delays to his master plan. And now. This. Just when he'd found a mutant that was actually useful and wielded powerful abilities, ones that would change the game entirely. It turned out its quirk was, sentient or at least, quasi-sentient? Regardless, quirks of any level of sentience were the worst. They always refused to cooperate with him, even if he managed to rip them from their original hosts. So, he'd adapted his strategy. A few words, 
and his successor was twisted just enough in the right direction to serve his purposes. Cursed blood may have been out of his reach, or maybe not, but, either way the boy himself was a different matter entirely. Corrupting him was the key to achieving the optimal outcome. His return. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. The festival was still amped up and running on all cylinders. After two fights that had ended on low notes, the following three had been wildly successful with the public. People were happy and excited, and looked forward to the finals, many making bets and predictions on who would make it there. But for the UA staff watching over the tournament, things appeared far bleaker. In particular, Midnight herself felt bad about what could happen in the next fight. All right folks are you ready? From the southwest gate, hailing from the support course, I tease the girl WHO's managed the impossible and thought through, the naturally gifted to earn her chance to prove just how dangerous her intellect can be. I tease my hot soon. Entering the ring at a light trot, waving at the cameras the entire time, came the pink-haired inventor. Mai couldn't help her manic grin as she stepped onto the arena's raised flooring. S.H. she'd made I.T. Now those big shots from the support companies would have to look at her and her babies, the pinkette was certain that after this match, everyone would be falling all over themselves to get their hands on her tech. All she needed to do was ensure that all her babies got a turn to really shine. It was too bad that the bird-headed kid she was about to face off against hadn't wanted to be her test dumb, spokesman. Oh well. And from the northeast gate, rising up from the shadows of his, classmates, I tease the boy so intimidating he already haunts the nightmares of some real-life villains. Give IT up for Fumikaj Tokoyami. Fumikaj stepped out of the tunnel and calmly walked to the ring to little cheer from the general public. While it was true his quirk was technically a mitter type, his more visible hereditary mutation all but eclipsed that fact to many. Not to mention Dark Shadow, as usually automatically classified as dark purely based on appearances alone. And if that wasn't enough, the quirk entity was officially labeled as a summoned creature, bound to his body and forced to serve his will. That meant on paper he had a type of enslavement quirk and nobody but the sick and twisted showed any love for those. But in reality, even as theatrical as he sometimes was, Fumikaj was actually close friends with his quirk, the two shared opposing personalities, which meshed surprisingly well, and both enjoyed scaring other people. For years, outside of his parents, they'd been the only one the other could count on. And then Fumikaj had befriended one as Yuku Madraya. Such a simple event had at first seemed fairly straightforward, the Verdanet was the only one he felt he could relate to in a class full of, strangers, and it would make his life more pleasant to have at least one friend that didn't live in his stomach. But it just hadn't stopped there. Fumikaj had found himself with more friends than he'd ever thought he'd have, and above that, a girlfriend. And he'd gotten drunk and had intercourse, well, kind of. Since his first day at UA his life had irrevocably changed, and the raven-headed boy, knew he'd never regret offering his support to his green friend. All the same, Fumikaj felt like a part of him was now out of reach, the smiling pink head across from him more than proof enough at that. Where he'd have once swallowed in his edginess and seen only a self-centered airhead, someone to just ride off. Now he saw a friend, even if only by proxy for now. When Hatsumi had approached him, before their match, Fumikaj knew the old him would have been immediately suspicious of the cheerful support student. His experience with strangers had never been good, and he'd have immediately gone on the defensive. Now, instead, he'd politely asked what she'd wanted, honestly curious. He'd listened to Hatsumi's babbled request to use her tech during the match to promote her genius to the world, and truthfully thought it over before refusing her counter-refusal, and bargained to forfeit the match after showcasing her babies had admittedly annoyed him though. Begin. Midnight's shout broke the dark teen from his thoughts, and not a moment too soon. Mai quickly activated her utility belt in combat harness with two flicks of her wrist and a few taps of her deft fingers. Whirring sounds, could barely be heard coming from the support student as unseen motion sensors and finely tuned gyros slid, clicked 
and locked into place. The hidden machines were ready to respond and adapt the moment their mother made her move. This was it, Mai was ready to begin her first real-life sales pitch. It was time to put on a show. Then, Dark Shadow leapt from its home in Tokoyami's stomach, and was, on her. Bam! Instinctively Mai lifted her arms up in self-defense, the motion activating the sensors in her combat harness. The multiple devices shared programming correctly assumed their user was under attack, and reacted accordingly. Plasteel bars, reinforced with carbon fibers, sprung from the pouch on her back, unfolding into bars far larger than their previously compact existence would have, implied. The bars mirrored Mai's raised arms, blocking Dark Shadow's talons at the last second. Neither competitor budged. Hey! The pink head snapped more upset than anything at the sudden attack, let me advertise my babies first. Pushing with all her not inconsiderable might, and assisted by the strength of her baby, Mai managed to slowly press Dark Shadow back and off of her. Then Fumikaj, charged forward and joined the fray. Bam! This time, Mai and her mechanical limbs had less trouble blocking the avian teen's attack, a kick to her knee. However, the glare she received from her opponent made the mad inventor flinch all the same. Then do so. Fumikaj grit out, struggling to overcome the hydraulics of the plasteel limbs. Leaning in, the raven-headed teen spoken at a level only, the two combatants could hear. Show, don't tell. Message given, Dark Shadow disengaged and covered the duo's retreat, leaving a slightly confused inventor behind. Show. My murmured mind unable to help itself but ponder over the cryptic words. In the split second it took for the pink head to realize what she'd been told, Fumikaj wordlessly set about recreating the imposing form he'd last, used during the USJ, knowing that combining with his quirkier would give the two of them a better chance of overcoming whatever the support student would be able to cook up. Unfortunately, he was only partially successful. At his current skill, it appeared to Fumikaj that he could only manage to partially cover himself with dark shadow when the sun's rays beat down directly on the duo. The bright light made it difficult for the quirk entity to function at full capacity, but even so, the avian teen did eventually succeed in coating his upper back, forearms, hands, and lower legs in writhing darkness. Meanwhile, Mai looked on and examined the challenge before her with rarely felt trepidation. The Pinkette finally understood that there would be no room for her to give a sales pitch in, this match. Not if she wanted a chance to advertise her babies before she was thrown out of the ring. Demonstration it is then. Mai said, more to herself than anyone in particular. Raising her hands to her combat harness, the mad inventor gave a sharp tug and activated the battle-ready babies that had been hiding away. The plasteel bars that had bracketed the Pinkette's arms shifted plates, rotated, unfolded, reformed, and ultimately relocked into the unmistakable shape of thick, gauntlet-like bracers. This newest form of Mai's baby covered her hands as well, sonic projectors layering over her knuckles just in time to take the brunt of another attack courtesy of her opponent. Bam! A massive claw of living shadow collided against one of Mai's now reinforced arms, the other pulled back, in anticipation. Putting her muscles into it, the pink hit countered, striking out with a metal encased fist. Boom. Sheer force sent Fumikaj skidding back, his own reinforced arms now crossed to absorb as much damage as possible. It was a good thing he didn't feel anything through Dark Shadow's eldritch form. That would have hurt otherwise. Blinking Y died at the power her baby had given her, simple punch. Mai felt a shock of concern chewed through her stomach even as it fought with the thrill of witnessing a successful test run. Had she just damaged one of the few friends she had? Even if he was one more by proxy at the moment? What would Mandraya say? Before she could overthink, the pink hit saw through her opponent's crossed arms for a second. Was that what a smiling beak looked, like? The odd sight vanished abruptly, however. As Fumikaj gathered himself and charged forward once again. Bam! The raven headed teen's next assault struck like a meteor, raised nubs on his shadow fists completely tearing into and trashing one of Mai's bracers. Boboom! 
Fumikaj's follow-up hit only concrete, shattering the arena's flooring with ease. Mai had been no fool, easily understanding, that her gear, cobbled together with the only materials first years were given access to for personal projects, wouldn't last long if she just stood there and took damage. Luckily, her sensor babies had come through. From the pouch on her back, the pinkettes machines had erupted into view, grappling hooks shooting out and gouging themselves into the ground a distance away from the aggressive, variable attacking. The launching of the hooks had triggered Mai's hover boots, and the clunky metal footwear had roared to life to enable their creator to effortlessly slide to safety. With a hiss, the damaged bracer fell to the ground and another plasteel limb took its place, this one mecha shifting into what was clearly a launcher of some sort. Fumikaj pulled back to prepare just as Mai, pointed the new armament in his direction. Fumph! A weighted net shot at the raven-headed teen, unfurled in midair, and was promptly torn asunder by Fumikaj's dark and shadowy claws. Holy moly folks! That support girl is some kind of crazy right? But Tokoyami proves he's the real predator by taking his opponent's inventions in stride. Seriously Eraser, what the heck are you teaching your kids? Present mix energetic commentary wiped the stadium crowd into a frenzy. Some seemed to agree with the voice hero, feeling that the dark kid with a bird's head was clearly going to come out on top. Others, mostly those who were glaring at said teen, still argued that a proper competitor like the support student would eventually take the day. Of course, both sides argued vigorously, citing, their preferred combatant's potential and the incredible skill they'd already shown. As this was happening, representatives from various support companies looked on with scrutiny. If the girl's toys managed to function after taking the abuse her foe was clearly able to dish out, then maybe she would be worth something. Maybe. H.N. What Tokoyami is doing, is showing his opponent respect. Hatsum is, a part of the support course, a non-combatant, but he's treating her as a real threat regardless. Never judge a book by its cover. The underground hero's dull words rippled through the audience, looks of understanding and approval quickly outnumbering those of disgust and derision. Boom. The launcher was reduced to scrap by a well-executed fake-out. Instantly. Another limb of plasteel unfolded and, replaced it with a large tower shield. Boom. A jab with her remaining sonic projector gave Maya a temporary respite and she gained just enough ground to take a moment to breathe. This fight is proof positive that the potential to be a hero can be found even in those without combat-oriented quirks. Eraserhead's follow-up left a sour taste in the mouths of many pro heroes watching the match. Those being individuals who were a little too proud of the natural advantages their specific quirks gave them in combat. The representatives from the support companies, however, began in earnest to examine the little pinkette striving as the living shadow stood against her. Perhaps there was profit to be found in after all? As this was happening up in the stands, Fumikaj and Mai hadn't stopped one bit, Gah, the pinkette screamed, tumbling back after a particularly powerful side swipe struck home. The mad inventor knew she was in trouble. Most of her babies had fallen by now, broken beyond serviceability, or were simply unfit for the situation at hand. It looked like her only option now was bringing out the latest addition to her loadout. Clink. 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 The four mechanical spider-like, limbs from the cavalry battle came back online, breaking Mai's fall and making her stand upright with ease. Straightening. The pinkette gave a fierce grin as she challenged her sort of friend once more. This. This was her last stand. My babies are all broken or useless. My mumbled to herself, watching Fumikaj for the slightest twitch even as the avian team likewise sized her and her new limbs, up with sharp eyes. If I can't make this work. The mad inventor didn't dare finish that line of thinking. As much as she'd like to believe otherwise, Mai knew that passion and talent weren't enough in the cutthroat world of hero support, not by a long shot. If you couldn't prove to the major players that your creations weren't just frail toys, then at best they'd just brush you aside, blacklist, you at worst for wasting their time. In the Pinkette's mind, every baby she'd shown so far hadn't been good enough. 
they'd gone up against a powerful opponent, and while normally she'd see failure as just another opportunity to grow, that wasn't an option here. Not to say she saw herself as a failure, but she'd be lying if she said she didn't feel a little disappointment at her inventions, lackluster performance. So much for her great sales pitch. Come on. My screamed suddenly, fed up with her spiraling thoughts. The mad inventor rushed Fumikage and took a swipe with one of her mechanized spider legs. Boom. I know you were born on the fly. Mai continued, her attack blocked by Fumikage's dark shadow enhanced leg. In return, the avian teen swiped at her head with talons of hardened darkness. Bam. But you're still my baby. Mai was nearly in tears as she used two spider limbs to block and push Fumikage back. A step at a time, the pinket forced the raven-headed teen closer and closer to the edge of the arena. Crash. And that means you're better than anyone else's. Mai pushed harder, straining with everything she had. Concrete shattered under the battling, students, each step more powerful than the last. She couldn't hear it, but at that moment the stadium was shaking with the cheers the public was giving for her. She couldn't see them but the support company representatives were beginning to loudly bicker amongst themselves over who would have the first chance to negotiate with her. She couldn't feel it, but her muscles were screaming louder than, she was, her natural arms and legs quivering with fatigue and battle damage. None of that registered. My only had eyes for her opponent, she only had ears for the pained whirring of her last baby as it fought for her. Hi. Boom. A final overhead strike using two spider limbs together, swung down, and shattered only concrete. Utilizing Dark Shadow's power in his legs, Fumikage had expertly, evaded the attack by launching himself up and over Mai, positioning himself behind the pinkette. Before she had a chance to turn and face him, the raven-headed teen countered, a single swipe ripping the mechanical spider limbs from her combat harness. Mai was on her own. Bam! The mad inventor just barely reacted fast enough to block one final punch, but it wasn't enough. And Hatsum is out of bounds. Midnight's sudden declaration caused both Fumikage and Mai to pause, the two looking at each other in confusion. Then they looked down to see, yes, the Pinket's large and clunky hover boots were touching grass. Tokoyami wins the match. The applause and cheering that was already shaking the stadium exploded. Coming back to reality, Mai realized that the positive reception wasn't just, for her victorious maybe friend, but also for her. They were praising her effort. That was amazing. Don't give up. You'll get him next time. Please make my gear. W what? What is happening? Mai asked, feeling funny all of a sudden. And why was her voice all watery and quivering like that? They celebrate. Fumikage said, squaring up as the mad inventor turned her full attention to him, they rejoice that you, one who is not a fighter, could withstand my darkness for so long, and so bravely. There could be no greater advertisement for your craft than that. You a sports festival stadium, class 1A seating box. I knew it, Izuka whispered, nonetheless drawing the attention of those closest to him, he was giving her the chance to show off. The emerald necromancer's chuckling was, soon seconded by his girlfriends, soon joined by the Saki and Lily. Tay merely cocked her head to the side in blank question. Oh so the lug can be soft when he wants to be. Kyauka quipped, uncaring who heard her while she was too focused on watching her newly minted boyfriend and lover help Hatsum leave the arena. The pinkhead looked about ready to collapse. Well, he's got no excuse for next, time then. Fortunately for the raven-headed teen, no one sitting in the 1A seats understood what their musically inclined classmate was implying by her odd choice of words. I'm leaving now, Caro, so announced, standing up. The frog girl would have made her way down to the field, but was pulled back. By her caring boyfriend, who was too reticent to let go of her hand. She gave him a flat look, I'll be fine Izukun. Of course you will be. Izuku said, shyly letting go of the hand he'd instinctively grabbed when he'd felt some moving away from him. Jeez. Calm down boss. Saki grinned, quick.
quick to latch on to her master. The thrum of the bond sang through the blonde as she wrapped her arms around the verde net. She's tougher than she looks. It was only by the grace of having helped, raise two younger siblings that Su was able to just barely contain the burning desire to pry the undead delinquent off of her boyfriend. Luckily for the former gang leader, the festival demanded she leave right at that moment. That didn't stop Su from sending Tai a meaningful look. The Ravnet wordlessly reached out and grabbed Saki by the back of the head, single-handed. The amphibian teen, didn't stick around to see what her boyfriend's first partner was going to do to his third, but she trusted the blank zombie girl to get the job done. Let's go Tsu Chan. The bubbly cheer came from a smiling Okako, who'd stood up with Tsu and now began to walk beside the frog girl. Let's treat this just like a battle trial, the anti-gravity girl offered. No hard feelings and may the best, girl win, right? Tsu croaked in agreement, but as the two walked through the stadium's halls heading to the point where they'd have to separate, she frowned. Something told the frog girl that regardless of what she said, the cherubic brunette wasn't going to see their match in such a carefree way. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena, later. Midnight had, with a few obvious, exceptions, been enjoying this year's sports festival so far. Honestly, the first year's portion being rigged far beyond what was acceptable had been one of the only dark spots. And of course, there was the fact that a few of the competitors had gotten a little too rough earlier. But for the most part, it had been a blast. There'd been erotic tension, manliness and bravado, heroic levels of determination, and top-tier sportsmanship. What more could you ask for in an event like this? Apparently, the answer to that turned out to be two teenage girls radiating unhealthy levels of hostility at each other. From the southwest gate, I tease the cherubic beauty WHO literally send you to heaven with a single touch. Mick. Oh calm down Killjoy, I tease Okoko Uraraka. Okoko stepped up to the arena with a face set stiffly in complete concentration the brunette's determination to win bleeding off of her. Losing the chance to be with Izuku before she'd even hit it had been a painful experience, and while Okako would say that she'd let the Verde net go by now, that didn't mean she didn't still have a score to settle with the frog girl waiting for her introduction on the opposite side, of the field. Really, it was her pride as a woman at this point which demanded she seek retribution from her classmate. Being beaten out by mere minutes as she later found out, was the kind of thing that required a special reconciliation before it could truly be called even. Winning at the sports festival would also prove her worth to the Ida family. Or at least, Okako hoped it would to the point where she'd feel less guilty about getting stuck with the label of being an Ida's girlfriend. She wasn't dumb enough, nor was she deaf, to miss what was being said about them when others thought they weren't listening. And from the northeast gate comes her opponent. Don't let her looks fool you folks, this girl can kick some serious butt, and is brave enough to date you a resident, necromancer to boot. I teased Su as we. With that, Su ran hopped her way to the arena. Even through the cacophony of a packed stadium, the frog girl thought she could hear stray giggling directed at her. The firstborn daughter of Buru Asui was in no way naive. What Izuku had revealed to her and her friends was completely true. They'd been set up to fail from the start. This matchup was just another example of someone cherry picking the matches to fit their worldview of emitter supremacy. Or at least, that's what she bet the bigoted Gorkists were thinking. Defeating Totoraki was a no go, full stop. If she went up against her two toned classmate, Sun knew she'd be putting herself in serious danger. His eyes could, and would, put her into a hibernation so deep she was afraid she'd. Never wake up, a shiver shot through the amphibian teen at the thought. It was a daunting future to consider. But Okako? Really? Were the idiots even thinking? Or were they really that blind? Tsu wasn't one to underestimate her opponents, she wasn't an idiot and personal experience had proven to her that anyone, no matter how innocent looking, could hurt you if you weren't careful. But there was still a remarkable difference between them that couldn't be ignored. 
It had been clear from the very first day that the brunette had never really trained before coming to UA not like she had. But that didn't mean she was going to go easy on her. Okako still had to pay for attempting to seduce her boyfriend, regardless of whether or not she knew the cinnamon roll was taken at the time. And Saki. That, blonde troublemaker needed to learn what would happen if she kept pushing buttons better left alone. There was only so much of the rebellious zombie girls leering at Izuku that she would take before she did something about it. Lowering her guard and taking things for granted was inviting disaster, and Tsuru wasn't about to let anything destroy her happiness. Just because she was usually a nice, person didn't mean she didn't feel the need to mark her territory every now and then. All right ladies, Midnight said, raising a hand into the air, remember the rules. And don't forget that you're both heroines in training. Begin. Here I go. Okako's sudden shout nearly left her stumbling as she took off toward Asui, a jolting stomp with her right leg the only thing keeping her from face, planting. No. This was her moment. She was going to prove her worth. To herself, to Tenya, to the world. Tsu was already on her. Ga- oof. Okako hit the ground with a grunt of pain and surprise. She hadn't even seen Asui move. What had just happened? What had happened was that Tsu had crouched and launched herself at the brunette with all the strength her mutated legs could muster. The frog girl had reached her opponent nearly instantly and, with a quick leg sweep, sent the other girl to the ground without hesitation. Not even attempting to stand back up, Okako reacted as quickly as she could, reaching out a hand to grab at Tsu's legs. If she could just use her quirk, the match would be over. But the brunette only managed to swipe some loose gravel. The frog girl had already, leapt out of reach in the time it took her to hit the ground and attempt a counter. At least the ring was still a mess from the last match. Between Mai's machines breaking and both competitors smashing the concrete flooring to pieces, there were definitely enough chunks of debris for. That could work. You'll have to try a lot harder than that if you want to catch me, you're Araka chan so stated, the comment not even coming across as a taunt due to the frog girl's flat tone. Unfortunately I'm not going to give you the time to get better, Karo. Okako hauled herself to her feet in response, surreptitiously trailing her fingers across more broken concrete as she did. She glared back at her stoic opponent. I'm not giving up. The brunette shouted, taking a rather sloppy stance that, might have been combat worthy if Tsu were drunk and blindfolded. In the time it took the anti-gravity girl to blink, Tsu was on her again. There was another attempt to grab the frog girl, and another, and another, but Okako's target seemed to disappear each time she came close. To make matters worse, each time Tsu evaded, she would lash out with her own counter, landing bruising strikes on, the anti-gravity girl's abdomen, back, arms, and legs. Okako was certain she'd be feeling this fight for days after this. She just had to make sure the pain was worth it then. Would you look at that folks? Another underdog comes out and trashes the competition. I tease another shock in a day full of incredible sights. The voice hero's rather opinionated words resonated with a sizable amount of the public, both in the stadium in person and watching from televisions at home, work, and beyond. While the cute brunette might have been a nobody, her opponent was just a girl with a simple mutation that gave her frog features. Frog. Surely an emitter, of any strength, should have been able to handle mutant of such low caliber. Right? Right? This shouldn't come as such a surprise people. While, Okako Uraraka has an admittedly powerful quirk, she's only a first year, and like many of them lacks experience using it in actual combat. On the other hand, Sasui actually has some of that experience her opponent is missing. Eraserhead's cold, calculated explanation came as the gruff man reminisced over his amphibious student's file. The girl's grades had been high, but her record had been, spotted. There'd been several reports of physical altercations throughout her earlier education, always against other students. It was an unfortunate commonality that most mutant-type students shared and also unfortunately common, was having the blame completely laid on said students. 
The staff at the Asawi Girls' Schools had, by and large, attempted to frame the events as nothing more than a girl with an inferiority complex lashing out against her peers. But Shouta wasn't an idiot, and he knew the truth was much different than what was reported. Tsasui being a victim of bullying wasn't a theory, it was a fact. Her quirk and the physical mutations it gave her were more than enough reason for some people to direct their ire at her. Naturally, she developed instincts and behaviors, to avoid or minimize harm, and when those hadn't worked, she'd fallen back on the last viable option, defend herself. Luckily for the poor girl, Bean Buru Asui's daughter gave her the unique ability to never face too much backlash from putting a stop to these aggressions. Of course, Shouta was sure that hadn't stopped them from being a common occurrence in her life. In stark contrast, Shouta's other student in the arena had reportedly lived a much more peaceful life. Her parents, while poorer than many, had led calm lives and had emphatically refused to allow their daughter to use her quirk to their own benefit. It was a nice thought, but that refusal had cost Yuraraka the opportunity to train her abilities at all before attending UA. Everyone knows that quirks are like muscles. If you, don't use them, you lose them, potential be damned. And in this match it boils down to a complete greenhorn facing off against a girl who's basically lived with her quirk constantly on. Every. Single. Day. As the words of the underground hero sunk in for the everyday civilian, many of the pros listening found themselves nodding. Many of them had had to learn that lesson the hard way, and many, others still knew of co-workers who'd never get a chance to learn it. Of course, there were still die-hard quirkists who disagreed with Eraserhead's impromptu lesson. Experience was all well and good, but in the end it was the power that came from pedigree that would ultimately win the day. Surely. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Class 1A Seating Box. So, Kya Uka pondered in an exaggerated fashion, not caring if her classmates were listening, according to Aizawa Sensei, that would make you two bodybuilders. Right? The not so innocent question had been directed at the two boys sitting beside the punk rocker girl, her boyfriend Fumakaj, and her now former crush and current best friend, Izuku. Behind the verdant necromancer, a playful scoff cut through the background noise of the cheering, crowd. More like pro wrestlers, Saki countered, her crimson eyes taking on a playful glint. The boss has got real muscle with real power, none of that empty mass caused by shooting up hormones. Beside the smirking delinquent, Lily frowned at her sister and the way she was eyeing her big brother. Lily thinks Blondie really needs to stop before Tsune finds out she was having weird thoughts, again, the littlest zombie girl interjected. She really didn't want to deal with the blonde's antics right now. We don't need more weird thoughts. The former gang leader spun and glared heatedly at the twerp next to her. Shut it shrimpy. Saki groused, quick to retaliate, go be childish elsewhere and let the adults do. Adult things in peace. Leaning over from her own seat behind the group, Momo looked back and forth between the two undead now locked in a staring match. Weird thoughts? The heiress asked, a mix of confusion and concern, what do you mean weird? What are you trying to teach my Lily Chan? Another scoff ripped through the air from the blonde zombie girl. Probably nothing as bad as that smut you read princess, Saki threw out, still holding Lily's narrowed gaze, smut? Kya Uka choked out in surprise. The musically inclined heroine in training whipped around to stare at her mature classmate in shock. She wasn't the only one. Saki-chan. But Izuku didn't react more than a long blink and a sigh. The verdant necromancer didn't want this kind of argument to explode right now, not while he was trying to focus on Tsu-chan's match. At least he'd managed to, cover Lily's ears in time. Oh come on boss. The delinquent moaned, foreseeing the end of her fun. It's not hard to tell those books the princess sneaks are more truck-focused than educational. That might have been. True. But the members of Izuku's friend group had tacitly agreed to avoid the subject for their own good. Let us. Return our attention to the battle? Fumikaj quickly offered. 
hoping to interrupt with one of the only distractions that was sure to put a pin in the discussion no one wanted to have. It was easier said than done, however, as watching the brunette below be overwhelmed by their froggy friend wasn't a pretty sight. Not in the least. UA, Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. Okako rolled across the arena floor after a particularly nasty kick to her side, feeling no less than three ribs shift from the attack. Her quirk, zero gravity, looked on paper as if it would have been more than enough to win a close quarters combat scenario like this match. Too bad for her that Asui turned out to be way too agile of an opponent. If she, took her eyes off the frog girl for even a second, even to blink, then she'd end up being circled and inevitably suffer another kick or strike soon after. She'd blinked eight times so far. Blink. Kick. Tumble. Touch. Stand. Repeat. The brunette hated to admit it, but she was out of her league here. She'd started her training to be a heroine, sure, but her body just wasn't ready for this level of confrontation. Her stamina was crap and this fight was like trying to catch a frog with her bare hands. It was too early for her last resort too. Keeping her guard up, Okako took a moment to take stock of the situation. She was battered and on her last legs. Asui didn't even look winded. There was still a ton of rubble and debris cluttering the field, even though she'd been implementing her backup plan the entire time. Maybe if close range wasn't an option, long range would work better, Directing one final glare at Asui, who still held her flat gaze and quasi-pleasant smile intact, Okako decided to work with what she had on hand. Literally. Do you want to continue this year, Araka chan Tsa asked, tilting her head to the side. The frog girl watched as her opponent eyed the arena, before glaring at her. Karo? Was it something I said? I'm far from done. And then Yuraraka threw a head-sized piece of concrete at her. For its size, the now flying piece of rubble shot through the air with much more force and speed than one would have expected. Tsu managed to dodge the projectile, but it was a near thing. Looking over her shoulder, the frog girl risked a moment to see where the debris landed. But it didn't. Oi. No one told me Yuraraka san had such strength. Present mixed shrill exclamation echoed how many in the stadium's audience felt in that moment. She doesn't. Your Araka Sand's quirk has a wide range of possible applications. Due to low usage until now, even she doesn't know its limits. Twin K. An unexpectedly weak sound of something hitting glass came from the window of the announcer's booth. Looking away from each other and back down to the field, the two pro heroes in the room saw that the piece of rubble had hit the transparent divider, but had done no damage. Such speed and mass should have had no problems breaking through solid concrete, let alone glass. But there the debris was, floating innocently in front of them. It looked like while something was under the effects of Uraraka's quirk, there was no relative mass to accompany its impact if she threw it at something else, nor any inertial energy to transfer. Ultimately, she could throw a building and it'd bounce like a balloon if she was able to keep her quirk activated. Aizawa realized all of this nearly instantly and decided not to voice his thoughts over the intercom. Your Araka had to, know her ranged capabilities came with such a caveat, and if she didn't, she needed to learn. Additionally, Asui needed to figure out the bluff on her own. Analysis during combat was a valuable skill after all. Back down in the arena, Tsu didn't appreciate her opponent's change in tactics. Oh sure, she could understand Uraraka's reasoning for it. She'd proven herself the better melee fighter, so, all that was left to the brunette was ranged combat. It was her bad luck that such a move brought back ugly memories. It turned out children could be exceedingly cruel and nasty beasts, especially when they believed their cruelty was right. Gorkasum had been a reality for Tsu since elementary school, where every day was an exercise in facing harsh insults and snide comments about her amphibious, features and animalistic mannerisms. And as bad as it had been for developing her younger self-esteem, middle school had been a much worse hell. The blatant insults. The laughter. The brutal pranks. It had been bad enough in public, 
But if she'd allowed herself to be caught by the other students away from watching eyes? Fwoosh. Tsa evaded another flying piece of concrete with practice tees, compared to back when she'd been younger, your Araka's assault was nothing. What are you aiming for your Araka-chan? Tsa asked, not breaking stride and evading the flying debris. A trace of concern flickered across her face as she realized her opponent looked different than when they'd started the match. Are you okay? You're not looking so good, Caro. The frog girl wasn't wrong. Anyone with eyes could tell that the zero gravity user was getting progressively sicklier the longer she extended her quirk usage. As it was, the brunette was obviously beginning to struggle to breathe, and her movements and aiming were getting worse. I'm all right, Okako replied, grunting through pants and gasps for air. I only need to last a bit longer. Tsa shook her head, there was really no more need to fight, neither of them had anything else to prove. Your Araka was on her last legs, and kicking her anymore would definitely be seen as overkill. But she couldn't just drag her out of bounds, that'd look even worse for the brunette. Nodding to herself after a bit of thought, the frog girl decided she'd put her opponent in a submission hold, giving her classmate one last chance to show her resistance before the inevitable end. Wait. Okako shouted suddenly, just as Tsa took a step forward. The sudden demand took the frog girl by surprise, so much so she actually stopped. Don't come any closer. Shaking off her surprise at the brunette's determination to keep fighting, Tsa took another step forward. She did, however, allow herself to become a bit more wary though. If her opponent seemed to have one last bit of fighting spirit left in her, then she could do anything. It honestly wouldn't surprise the frog girl if her opponent pulled out some sort of final stand move right now. But that still wouldn't prevent her victory. Another step. Okako gave a wicked grin, a look Tsa had never seen on the brunette's face before. It was oddly disconcerting. Don't say I, didn't warn you. The brunette said, bringing her hands together. Release. Years of facing bullies both as their victim and detractor had honed Tsu's fighting instincts to a fine edge. She felt the attack coming the moment her opponent had put her fingertips together. Looking up, the frog girl barely had a moment to react as a veritable landslide began to fall on her head. Having gambled her very health and safety on that this tactic, Okako hoped it worked, nothing else had seemed to. She'd been gathering the debris since the beginning. After that first time she'd been struck down, all because she'd had the passing thought it might be useful later. Maintaining the cluster of concrete trouble had been extremely taxing, but the trap had been a last resort anyway. There hadn't been enough, left over from the previous matches to make a proper weapon. It would have taken a much more destructive battle for that to have happened, but it had been enough. Throwing the debris earlier had been both a distraction and a test. She'd needed to buy time and see if her quirk affected the objects under it when they collided with other things. It was lucky she had, or she wouldn't have known that, she had to turn her quirk off for flying objects to be effective projectile weapons. Even as she basked in her impending victory, Okako knew there wouldn't be any more battles for her that day. She could feel a twinge in her stomach that told her another attempt at using her quirk any time soon would result in her stomach saying hello to the world. You are going to need to try harder than that, Okako paled, watching as her opponent almost nonchalantly dodged the falling rubble. If you want to hit me with all this. So, her instincts honed over the years on top of being affected by her mutation, had almost inhuman reflexes at this point. She could tell where each piece of rubble was going to fall, and in what order. She could judge which she needed to prioritize avoiding, and which ones she could take a hit from and take minimal damage. Having forced herself to develop the ability to suppress the knee-jerk reaction to shield her eyes from incoming attacks, she was also able to never lose track of what was happening around her. However, this talent also worked against her. While she was busy avoiding Uraraka's final attack, the brunette herself had thrown her last shred of self-preservation out the window, charging into the fray herself. She knew she wasn't capable of standing against Totoraki, even at full strength. 
This had always been her last fight, her last chance to prove that she deserved to be in Nui Heroics course. She just needed to use her quirk one more time, and she'd have proven her worth. You're done. Okako screamed, pushing into Tsun right as, the frog girl avoided a large piece of rubble. A pink glow flashed into existence as she activated her quirk. Bye bye. Tsun yelped in surprise as she began to float into the air, the sound ringing like victory bells to the zero gravity user's ears. Now that her opponent was helpless and drifting in the direction of the nearest edge of the arena. Look at that. What a reversal. Your Araka comes, from behind and now Asui is helpless in the air. Feeling emboldened by present mix words, Okako almost cheered. She felt ready to claim her place as the better girl, and win this match. WHO's the better girl now Tsu chan Okay, so the brunette couldn't help herself. But it felt good to release all that built-up bitterness and disappointment from earlier in the year, she'd settled her defeat in the love department by taking the field of combat, and now she could go back to being the happy girl she'd been before. Of course, she didn't expect Midraya to suddenly drop the frog girl and pursue her, that ship had sailed, but at least she could now say that Ida Kun hadn't settled for second best and taken in a worthless girl. Clever usage of terrain is an important skill for a hero to have. From finding cover to weaponizing even the most random of objects, anything should be considered while in the middle of a battle. I would say your Araka did a good job, but unfortunately, she forgot another vital piece of combat protocol. Okako still, feeling herself shiver as the words of her homeroom teacher. Why did she have a feeling something bad was about, to happen? Never turn your back on an enemy when you don't know their full capabilities. Suddenly, something long, sticky, and pink shot into view and wrapped around the brunette's hand. Eh? Okako didn't even have a chance to react. Tsu had not only captured one of her opponent's hands, but she'd also managed to anchor herself from floating farther away. And thanks to the muscles in her, tongue being extraordinarily strong, far stronger than any normal humans, she could use it as a whip. Or a grappling hook. Wham! UGH! Okako grunted loudly in pain as a double-footed kick slammed into her with the force of a truck, throwing her backward. The brunette rolled a few times before losing enough momentum to finally stop. To the surprise of all watching, the Asui girl had managed to put force behind her attack by retracting her tongue at full throttle. Even effectively massless she'd moved at a speed that had delivered a punishing amount of force. Managing to raise her head up, Okako saw that Asui was no longer floating away. In fact, the frog girl was crouched down firmly latched onto the ground by her hands and feet. And her quirk was still active. Asui's quirk, Frog, gives her more than enough tools to counteract the effects of Uraraka's zero gravity. To note a few, her tongue can extend quite a distance, her hands and feet can excrete a sticky substance to keep her stuck to most surfaces, and then there's her superior leg strength of course. Uraraka's plan was admittedly a good one, but ultimately it matched up poorly against an opponent armed with, effective countermeasures. Struggling to keep her head up, Okako quietly seethed as Aizawa sensei went over her oversight. How had she forgotten what her classmate's quirk could do? I I'm not. Okako stuttered, forcing the word out. Her body quivered as she fruitlessly pushed against the ground, but her legs wouldn't move, and the aches and pains nearly overwhelmed her. It felt like moving through lead. I'm not, wham. A solid piece of concrete about the size of a silver American dollar struck the side of the brunette's head, knocking her out cold. Tsu slowly raised herself up to her full height, feeling her gravity return. She'd been done with playing around and risking her victory any further. And the victory goes to Tsasui. Midnight declared, amazed at the tenacity of, these two young girls. The provocative heroine then growled as instead of raucous cheers the victorious frog girl only received a mixed response from the stadium's crowd. Huffing, the ravnet decided to just keep the ball rolling. Now let's get ready for the next fight. Awesome and toss? I think we can't put off cleaning duty any longer. Tsu didn't bother glaring at the lukewarm public, there, 
mixed disappointment and shock at her win wasn't her concern. Still, being a good sport, the frog girl waved. And if she directed most of her waving to the area in the stands she knew her boyfriend and friends to be sitting? Well, that was her business. Just thinking of his Yuku impatiently awaiting her return to his side made Sa feel warm inside. Meanwhile, you a redacted, redacted. And, you're certain of this? Nezu's normally measured voice trembled in suppressed outrage and fear as he spoke to the shadowed figure across from him. A single nod was the only response for a number of minutes. Eventually, the silence became too much, even for the denizen of the shadows. I am, replied the darkened figure, voice still as sweet as ever, even though now it held a serious edge sharp, enough to kill a lesser man. As much as I wish I wasn't. Agent Smith, at least the only one that Nezu had ever dealt with personally, had always been a rather fond friend of Yue and its principal. She hadn't attended herself of course, but it had been the alma mater of a long list of heroes worthy of the name that had aided Interpol over the years. Case and point, her own darling had been a graduate himself. He was the first pro-hero with an empathy quirk to successfully graduate from UA in fact. And Smith was so proud of him for that, especially since he also became the youngest pro to retire with no debilitating wounds as the cause. She knew the others felt the same way too. And now, the spook knew that her soft spot for the institution had been irreparably tarnished. All thanks, to the greed of the pathetic piece of gutter trash cowering before her. You you can't. Can't do this. Whimpered the pink-haired security advisor weakly. The middle-aged woman was bloodied, and most definitely in need of immediate medical attention. I I I have our rights. Nezu turned to what was left of Haruno, his beady eyes showing exactly zero warmth or concern. I apologize, Haruno-san, the quirked animal said, clearly not sorry at all about what had happened to the rosette, but I'm afraid human rights no longer apply to those in your situation. Agent Smith tossed a bank sheet onto the table between herself and the disgraced security advisor, the document recently printed. To those who could follow the mass of numbers clearly, the figures were quite damning. Money had been, transferred in large amounts to the Rosette's account, sure, but that didn't matter so much when stacked against the account that had actually been doing the paying. You accepted money from an account linked to a known terrorist, the spook explained, sweetness almost completely draining from her voice. Dread could viscerally be felt filling the room. One that's considered an enemy to the entire world, who's to be stopped at all costs. The disgraced woman visibly paled at the revelation. I I. I didn't know. Haruno cried, tears leaking down her quivering cheeks. Everything appeared legal. It just seemed like a new sponsor. Please, my lawyer can explain. The rosette's voice trailed off as the room's temperature took an abruptly steep dive. Haruno could feel her heart struggling to beat her instincts screaming at her to run away from the dreadful monster standing over her. Even Nezu found himself inching away from his associate. Lawyer? Agent Smith asked, chuckling darkly. The spook reached up and placed her slim fingers on her sunglasses, worn even in the darkened room. Oh my dear, by mere association, the only thing you deserve is, Smith San, Nezu cut in, interrupting the predator who'd been about to devour its prey. Deep down, Haruno knew that her death had somehow just been delayed. Could you perhaps wait until a thorough, and above board, interrogation is performed? It'd be a shame if we lost a potential link to the terrorist. Out of turn. The spook looked as if she went through a vicious internal struggle, but in the end, she smiled. It wasn't a nice smile by any means. All right, Agent Smith said, acquiescing to the simple request. The Ravnet left her sunglasses where they were. But only if I get to watch the kid at work this time. Instantly, Haruno understood that she was beyond well and truly trucked. It wasn't fair. The sponsor had been ultra rich, and willing to give the school so much. Of course she'd accept it, immediately. Sure he'd been tad eccentric, but the rich usually were. And really, signing checks in English? Why would that have set off any kind of alarm with her? Just what the hell did a f? 
Oh even mean anyway. UA Sports Festival Stadium, Contestant Arena. Shoto Totoraki walked into the arena's raised platform, but he didn't hear much of anything as he did. Present Mick had thrown him in, extremely flamboyant and outrageously extravagant introduction, and the public had dutifully cheered wildly, but he'd already tuned everything out by then. Really, he didn't even want to hear the words, the titles people placed upon him. All they did was hurt him anyway. The son of Endeavor. As he brooded, the heterochromatic ignored his opponent's shout, the girl yelling at their teacher over, some joke regarding her androgynous appearance. Scratch that, hearing her voice definitely brought back his rage. Are you an idiot? Get over yourself already. You're not the only one whose life has been hard. Your stigma now is completely self-manufactured. You want to hear what a really horrible childhood sounds like? They didn't understand. None of them did. Even so, for some reason, the words pierced him, flying like arrows straight into his heart. He'd only meant to confront the obstacle that had arisen, the only one who'd managed to get in his way, but instead he'd been attacked. They'd treated him like a pretender, as if his sick joke of a life, years of torture and abuse, meant nothing. Totoraki didn't notice when Midnight called the match to start. He only knew that he, hated. Kyao Kanushi was screwed. Hard. Even if she'd had her gear, even if she'd had the tools as Yuku had literally invented just for her, like the sonic gun he'd shown her a diagram of, or the sonic hover boots he'd added last minute to the sketches of her hero suit, there was no realistic way for her to win this fight. Well screw it. She might as well go out with a bang. Hiaaa. The punk rocker screamed as loudly as she could, sticking her ear jacks into the newly remade concrete flooring. She went for maximum power, pushing everything she had into this one shot, because it would be her only chance. Broom. The ground didn't shatter before Kyauka. It detonated. The powerful shockwave she'd created surged forth with all the power of desperation, heading straight for Totoraki. When Azuku had helped the group with quirk training, he'd come to her and devised a handful of tactics and skills that used her powers in ways she never considered. This plan called for using a weak pulse to first produce a tunnel, and then follow it up by producing a larger pulse. The second was guided via the tunnel and thus focused at the target for a better overall attack. The first vestiges of the sonic attack surged against Totoraki, gravel and small bits of concrete peppering him. It was enough to rouse him from his spiraling introspection. The heterochromatic found himself surrounded by a thin cloud of dust. What had happened? As far as he knew, his opponent wasn't capable of anything more than directing her heartbeat and hearing well. That was all she could do, without gear. Right? Ultimately, it didn't matter, because once again, he was being challenged. Him. The, all I see right now is the spiteful second coming of Endeavor. The memory struck Totoraki at the exact same moment Kyauk burst from the dust cloud right in front of him. The punk rocker was ready to throw a punch, amazed she'd gotten this far and prepared to go down swinging. And then, Totoraki's body finally reacted, his mind still tripping itself up. It was just a wave of his hand, nothing more. But for such a small action, the effect was instantaneous. The air around the two combatants chilled, the massive drop in temperature so quick and so great there was no chance to react. That didn't stop the dual color team's anger though. For a split second, he forgot to keep himself, in moderation. And from that second to the next, suddenly massive peaks of ice towered over the stands, thankfully jutting out of the stadium's circular opening in the roof. The public at large was left speechless, even pros gobsmicked at the outrageous display of power. Aizawa and Yamada couldn't even comment, what was there to even say? At the side of the combatant's arena, Midnight shivered, violently as half her body suffered under a layer of frost. Cementos could barely move his head. Then there was a scream. Kyauka. Jarred out of his stupor. Totoraki looked around and found himself standing in the front row of a horror show. His opponent had been encased in ice, swallowed up by the newborn glacier. Completely. 
before he'd always trapped enemies in walls of ice, leaving their heads exposed to the open air so they could at least breathe, if not move. But this, this was a situation right out of one of the bastards' excessive force lawsuits. I, Totoraki didn't know what to say. What could he say? The heterochromatic stepped forward, raising his right hand as he did so. He could fix this. He hated using the bastard's quirk, but he didn't have a choice now. Get the truck away from her you monster. Suddenly, another of Totoraki's classmates landed in front of him, the one with a raven's head he'd seen with Midraya earlier throughout the festival. While the interloper stood and glared at him, a beast of writhing shadow phased into existence from the avian teen's stomach and wasted no time before diving at the glacier behind them. To Totoraki's surprise, the dark entity was able to slither through the cracks in the ice he hadn't even known were there, reaching his entombed opponent with ease. In no time at all, his raven-headed classmate's quirk, because that's what it had to be, had created a cocoon of darkness around their trapped classmate. Te. Totoraki snapped to attention, the sound of Midraya's voice setting his nerves on fire. The dual-haired teen nearly forgot about the situation he'd just caused as he whipped his head around to see his verdant target braced against a railing, pointing intently at him. Break the obstacle. Now. Totoraki felt his heart stop. Boom. Leaping from its place in the stands, Midraya's black-haired tail flew through the air, arm pulled back in preparation for a haymaker. The son of Endeavor, flinched back at the blank-faced fury that was the undead thing coming at him faster than he could react. Trying to gather his wits, the heterochromatic prepared to use his ice again, the prior use slowing him as Frost had already shot up his left leg and over his chest. Closer. Closer. Right as Totoraki was about to unleash a lance of ice to intercept the threat to his life. The black-haired tool, flew over him. C.R.A. Kaboom. The earth itself shook with the force of the undead's fist colliding with the glacier. The resulting explosion nearly pushed Totoraki off his feet, but instinct took over and a boot of ice kept him locked in place. Twisting around. The dual-haired teen could only watch in place as the now-freed shadow beast rose from the remains of the mountain of ice. Together, the undead and quirk entity marched over to Totoraki's raven-headed classmate. The avian teen gently took his opponent, who he now saw was beginning to turn blue, into his arms. With one last baleful glare from the only human of the trio, the three left the arena. As he stood there. On the field of battle with only the ruins of his mistake for company, Totoraki failed to understand what had just happened. How had everything gone so wrong? He'd been attacked. He'd reacted. He'd overreacted. Why the hell hadn't Midnight Sensei or Samantha Sensei stopped him? And then. And then. UA Sports Festival Stadium, seating area A as one Totoraki stood silently in the middle of the stadium's arena. Looking lost and alone, another Totoraki merely scoffed at what he'd just witnessed. A Chen, Endeavor, groused, the number two hero unable to hide his utter loathing at the scene. Typical weaklings. What did they expect to happen when they dared to stand against to the strong? The flaming man hated it. There was always someone like that goddamn little chit. Fools who threw themselves against power they never had a chance of matching and then complained when they got hurt. Sparring? Arrests? If it wasn't some upstart pro unable to recognize when they were outclassed it was a pissant villain who refused to accept their place as the scum of society. But it wasn't like he really cared about what had just happened, none of it really mattered in the end after all. The girl should have just forfeited the moment she discovered her opponent had been his current masterpiece. The strength of his Target tool had surprised him though. Endeavor knew he'd faced pros and villains alike who'd boasted quirks of super strength or ones able to shut off their wielder's natural limiters for the same result. Somehow, the tool, that undead creature. Somehow it seemed closer to the former than the latter. And if his suspicions were correct, that meant his target would be capable of similar feats, perfect? Omake, Gear Wars, thus my fault there. In all the ways that mattered to my Hatsune, the sports festival was over. 
The cheers from before still echoed in her ears and heart though. All that praise, the recognition, it had been intoxicating. It had filled a hole inside her that normally only making more of her babies had before. Honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that the rosette had, been nearly drowning in fear the entire time she'd been facing Birdie, she might have even considered applying for a transfer to the hero course. They got that kind of attention all the freaking time. Oh you. Mai groaned, allowing herself to slump against the cool wall of the exit tunnel. This was supposed to start taking tomorrow. The aches and pains were another reason Mai kept away from the front lines. It wasn't so much she feared getting hurt as it was she was terrified of the possibility of getting hurt to the point of no longer being able to make her precious babies. Ring. 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 The classic, piercing tone of Mai's ancient, pre-quirk telephone ringtone cut through the air. The rosette pulled herself out of her musings to see who'd bothered to call her. She could count on one, hand how many people actually had her number. He Lu you. As was her habit. Mai greeted the mystery person in, poor, English. Mai. Me e e e e e. Even shrieking in absolute distress as it was, the voice on the other end of the phone call was undeniably cute and feminine. That meant it could only be one person. Geez. What's the problem Kachan? Mai asked, holding her phone away from her ear, and rubbing the abused sensor organ with her other hand. I know the stand didn't catch fire. I would have been able to see it from the field before I left. But it is on fire. Could shout it back, causing the mad inventor's face to deadpan at the news. No no no. Not that kind of fire. What? Mai was at a loss. What could that mean? If there was a fire at a UA sports festival, then there'd be, smoke in the air, alarms blaring, panicking people. T explain. They're fighting over your guns. That information caused the Rosette to sit back and blink. She. She hadn't brought her blasting babies to her festival exposition. Look, there's a funny looking guy here surrounded by a bunch of weird girls, and he's asking a lot of questions. I didn't even know you made a bulletproof, raincoat. I need you here. Now. To say my was stunned was an understatement. That was another baby she left in the lab. What the hell was going on? The only guns she'd made recently, that worked, were those that she had given her the schematics for. Since she'd only built them and given them some minor tweaks, she hadn't felt like she could claim them as hers. The code sounded. Familiar as well, oh. She remembered now, she kit bashed a bunch of failed babies together that had matched Touchy's needs for the test he'd been helping with. The baby she'd been left with had performed so well it had served as the base for the new hero costume she'd been making for him. But that still didn't explain how either of those two got to her stand. Both should have been secured in a marked box in her corner of power. Loader Sensei's workshop. She'd even put it in the opposite corner from the box's marked exposition so that none of her babies that weren't ready for their debut would accidentally get mixed in. She'd even written on the box in big. Red marker, do not move in. English. Did could pay attention in English class? T Mai shouted, popping up abruptly. The mad inventor was suddenly filled with, a frantic energy, not even able to feel her aches anymore. Don't move. And don't let anyone walk away with any of my babies. The rosette wasn't sure what was pumping her with more adrenaline, Nezu demanding her head on a stick for the slip up. Orochi looking at her with disappointment as he ended their friendship over her marketing his babies as her own. Soon after, UA Sports Festival, Stadium Exterior, Pop-Up Support Fair. When she reached her stand, Mai found the little booth crowded with people. It was chaos. Get your hands off my soon-to-be tech! Shouted a grossly obese man decked out in a clearly expensive business suit. Back away sir! These are too useful to be allowed into the hands of a greedy bastard. Shouted back a tall and muscular man, his receding hairline doing, nothing to diminish his intimidating figure. If the badge on his chest was any indication, he was a member of the police force. Both of you back OFF. These exquisite pieces belong to those the heroes that can pay for them. Countered a man dressed smartly in a fashionable vest, 
undershirt, and dress pants. His appearance screamed suave representative of a major support company. These belong to, the officers that can actually make the arrest. The badged man shouted back. Maybe he was a higher rank then? Oh you simply must have one of these. IT could even stop one of my arrows. That particular scream of delight came from a rather tall, blonde with point ears. The young woman was pulling excitedly on the sleeve of. Oh there was the funny looking guy could was talking about. But IT, needs to be in black. Everything's better in black. The odd support came loudly from a petite girl dressed in gothic Lolita who was pulling on the funny looking guy's other sleeve. How does this work? Or this? And that? Do you have a manual for this? A younger girl, about my age, with blue hair, was poking around at. Well, pretty much everything. Collapsed against the stand, eyes nearly, swirling from all the action, was a petite girl with short, black hair. The poor thing had been unable to keep up with all the people who'd gathered. This had certainly not been what she'd been expecting when she'd offered to help Mai with her stand. She said offered, but really, she would have been saddled with it anyway. No one else in their class wanted to work with a pink-haired demon after, all. Slowing to a walk, Mai had already had enough. Alright, that's IT. Back OFF. The mad inventor roared. The sudden appearance of the woman of the hour stopping the mob cold. These babies aren't for sale. They're too important to me. And my friend. Sliding to the ground, could shed tears of happiness. Mai had called her a friend. In reality, the Rosette hadn't been speaking about the, short-haired Ravnet at all. Her thoughts had been on someone a bit more. Green. Nonsense. If it's here, it's for sale. The obese man chortled moving far quicker than one of his girth should have been able to. Suddenly he was right in front of Mai, looming over her like a fat cat drooling at a cup of cream. I'll take the lot, and their patents, for fifty thousand. His eyes bulged at the, amount. That was a lot of money for what amounted to mere school projects. Mai, however, took the offer as an insult. She'd never sell a single one of her babies for so low much less one's birthed from a union with Echi. No. Deal. The flat declaration caused a collective gasp from all around, even those not directly involved who'd been eavesdropping. W what? The fat man was bewildered by, this turn of events. He'd expected the usual game, not flat out denial. Where was the haggling over price? Where was the opportunity to downplay the girl's tech so that she felt like his offers were the only good ones she'd ever get? Sensing his competition getting close to making their own moves, the man acted fast. Fine. One hundred thousand. Could nearly swooned. The short-haired Ravnet, was sure anyone else would have sold the rights then and there. But my. The answer's no. Just turned around and began putting everything that had been strewn about the stand back into the marked box. Mai's orders had been clear, both from Nezu and Echi himself. The principal had said her friend's ideas needed to be studied inside UA walls where they were safe, and they could be archived under, the school's legal protocols. The Verdanet had been even clearer, he didn't want his babies to fall into the hands of anyone not dedicated to peacekeeping. The risk of them being reverse engineered for lethality was too great. Excuse me, young lady? The funny looking man approached the now fuming inventor calmly, as if her reactions were an everyday occurrence. He pulled out some sort of, identification card. I would like to make you an offer. In the name of our country. That managed to stop Mai in her tracks. The way the man had worded that. That had been strange to say the least. Locking onto the card the funny-looking man held out with Zoom, the Rosette frows. She wasn't dealing with any old fish in the pond anymore. L. Lieutenant. Giatami. Mai mumbled the words as she, read over the card. Her quirk zeroed in on every letter, every condecoration. The seal. Your? Your JSDF. Down on the ground, its jaw didn't have far to drop as it fell open in shock. This was way too much for her. She was a first year damn it. How the hell had Mai caught the attention of the JSDF? Oh she was going to need a whole day in her game to get over this, 
she just knew it. That's right, Lieutenant Atami replied with a slight smile and nod. Honestly, I came here today because I was on leave. But after seeing all this, I would like to take a sample of the raincoat if you don't mind. And of a nutrition bar if you had one to spare? My blinked. Indecision flooded the mad inventor as she was presented a choice she'd never expected to have to make. She stood by what, she'd said before, these babies weren't just hers to make decisions on. But at the same time, the JSDF wasn't just any buyer. Would she mind if she agreed? The JSDF was more into relief operations and self-defense right? But then, weren't these babies a bit extreme for the work they did? I. Um. I guess that's. Okay. Sir, my stuttered out, unsure if she was supposed to be overly respectful, here or not. B but why would you need, of course, I wouldn't dream of taking these for free, the lieutenant interrupted, I'll talk to my superiors immediately, and propose you receive a lifetime contract. If they see this tech as suitable to our uses, which I know they will, you should be good to go. Mai could only nod in response. She wasn't following. Had she just made a sale? That, quickly? Was that how it worked? Perfect? The lieutenant cheered, clapping his hands once in approval. Keep those sealed away for me would you? I'll have some of my men come along for them shortly. They'll bring the contract with them for you to sign as well. Oh okay. Mai was lost. Had she just signed herself and she to the JSDF? The lieutenant turned around business done. Let's go, girls. At the command, the three weird girls he'd come with flocked to the man's side. We've got a lot more to see today. Let's enjoy ourselves before we have to return to base yeah? As the quartet left to the cheers of the three girls, the ensuing silence sat heavily on those who remained. Well if that's the case. The large man wearing their badge said, courageously breaking the silence. He took out his phone and began to dial, I'll just have to get the Prime Minister on the line and have him sign for those guns of yours. Rubber bullets are shit against villains today. I'll buy everything else. The obese man cried suddenly, everything. At that point, Mai shut down all non-essential functions. She was pretty sure she was going to get quite an earful for this, if not from Nezu, then from Michi. And honestly, the rosette wasn't sure what she dreaded facing more. Oh make, undying love what I feel. Is no crush? Inside a dark room, a young teen was sleeping the night away. A slight smile on his freckled face denoted just how much the young man had healed from his previously broken state. After all the twists and turns, the low points he'd survived, things were finally, starting to look up for him. He'd gotten himself a girlfriend. His mother was healthier than ever. Most of his classmates were decent and treated him like a human being. His principal was emphatically on his side. What I feel. Is love. Is Yuku Madriya had not been the only one whose life had recently taken a turn for the better, however. Those he touched, with his heart, and his cursed blood, were also experiencing change. And it was all for the better. Saki had recovered her gang. The girls who were a large part of the delinquent's life finding new hope in the return of their boss. The blonde had driven the girls to properly take care of their new home and respect their new job, and all seemed well there. She'd even gotten justice for her father, the moment cathartic for all involved, Lily, by all accounts, had finally gotten a family that loved her without reservation. She'd finally had her choices about her life recognized and respected and anyone with eyes could see the littlest zombie was beyond happy with her current situation. And te, what you gave me, was a purpose. In the darkness of the room, a single figure was standing, pressed up against the edge of his yuku's bed. While Lily cuddled her fluffy unicorn plushie in adorable silence by the window, and Saki lazed in the corner blissfully listening to obscene music through a pair of headphones, Te simply stood there lovingly watching her savior. Her master. And after all the love you've given me. This is the least I can do. Normally dead, dull eyes watched on, full of life. Determination and purpose shone, brightly as the twin orbs of red shone with a fierce love. Tay wanted, above all else, 
to see is Yuku, her master, happy. She didn't want to take Tsu's place, is Yuku loved her, but neither did she wish to pose as merely a loving sister. She never wanted to impose on the one who'd given her what everyone else in her old life had refused her. Click. The sound, as infinitesimal as it was, caused the ravnet to glide over to the window, steps sure and smooth. That noise would have been so quiet most people would have never had a hope to hear it. But she had. And there, lodged into the windowsill, was a grappling hook. Opening the window as stealthily as possible, Tay looked down. Clinging to the rope, already halfway to their destination, two figures garbed in black looked up in surprise. Dead, eyes stared down, and two widened pairs stared back. The undead Ravnet gripped the grappling hook with one hand, and dislodged the multi pronged piece of metal from its resting place. Lifting the hook, the rope, and the hangers on away from the window, the zombie girl carried the load as if it weren't any heavier than a trash bag. Dead eyes stared down, and two covered heads rapidly shook in a desperate plea. Without a hint of remorse, with no hesitation, Tay let go of the hook. There were yelps, and the hangers on away from the window, the zombie girl carried the load as if it weren't any heavier than a trash bag. Dead eyes stared down, and two covered heads rapidly shook in a desperate plea. Without a hint of remorse, with no hesitation, Tay let go of the hook. There were yelps, a shrill scream, and then the sound of a car being crunched under the weight of an object, or objects, hitting it from above. None of the sounds were loud enough to awaken Tay's master. Gracefully, Tay closed the window and returned to her rightful place, keeping vigil over her master. I will, protect you, care for you as you did for me. Because I love you, my Izuku.